Watching the skeptic's guide to the universe, your escape to reality. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the six hour SGU live stream. Uh, we're going to be coming to you from SGU Studios for the next six hours. Uh, we're going to actually record two separate SGU episodes uh, at, at, out of the content that we're going to be bringing you. Um, so in just a moment, I am going to do the regular introduction for the first show. Uh, we're going to do, again, a regular format. We'll end the show at three hours. Don't go anywhere because I'm just going to start the next show with a new introduction and then a new closing at the end. So just to orient you to what is going to be happening. Um, Steve, are we going to be able to pee? Yeah, so the bio breaks are <laughs> allowed. I decided. I, I thought about this very carefully, <laughs> consulted with everyone. And, yeah, we will allow bio breaks. Um, it's also just not healthy to sit for six hours straight, so we, we don't want to model unhealthy behavior oh, to our point. listeners. Uh, so at some point, we'll be getting up. Okay, we're going to start the first of two podcasts. Wait, before we do that, let's just <coughs> ask the audience, guys, can you hear us okay? Everything looking and sounding good on your end before we start? I'm going to apologize ahead of time. I am at the tail end of my post-COVID cough. I am... Um, negative and you know it's totally over but this cough has a half-life so i will try to remember not to cough directly into the microphone or on me <laughs> all good More importantly. getting thumbs up from people let's see here yep all right sounds good here. good fantastic okay. thanks guys all right here we go everyone ready hello and welcome to the skeptics guide to the universe today is saturday september 24th 2022 and this is your host steven novella Joining me this week are Bob Novella. Hey, everybody. Kara Santa Maria. Howdy. Jay Novella. Hey, guys. And Evan Bernstein. Good evening, everyone. So, we are recording this episode live in SGU Studios. Kara is joining us remotely from Florida, away, battening down the hatches while a, a hurricane is bearing down on her. How are you doing down there, Kara? Well, it's not here yet, but I'm. I, I'm supposed to go home to LA next Thursday, and then I just found out right after I booked the tickets that we're quite probably going to be hit with a Category 3 hurricane on Wednesday. It'll be my first ever. So yeah. I did um, tornadoes in Texas, uh, earthquakes in California, hurricanes now in Florida. I just need to move on to an active volcano. Yeah, there you set. go. Now, Kara, you know, according to Florida rules, you need to be mowing your lawn when that hurricane hits, right? <laughs> <laughs> you need to be outside I, doing something as if there's no danger. Because, right, and, and my cow needs to be untethered. Right. Because <laughs> the low pressure of the system raises the grass a little straighter, makes it easier to cut. So, I mean, it's kind of an obvious <laughs> move. Now, NASA is still planning on launching Artemis on Tuesday. Yeah. They're, hmm. they're, did they yeah. finally That's scrub so it? That's so not oh, going to happen. happen. Yeah. <laughs> well, they, they like to wait till the last minute because sometimes these things zig instead of zag and they don't want to miss their window. But I guess, but yeah, the, the latest update is they just scrubbed it. Not surprising. I thought yeah. there was a little bit of wishful thinking. Uh, we, we do make a, should make a couple of quick announcements. Yes. Like we'll just edit this out of the show. So, Ian, can you show <coughs> them uh, the links? Uh, you know, we decided to do this live stream because Steve... Well, we're going to be talking about that as part of Well, no, show. but I want people, you know, I want to get the links out there right. right now. So we're doing this because, of, you know, our book is coming out in three days. Three days. Um, 
and this is you know our, our final you know push to see if people would be interested in pre-ordering this fine book in front of Steve Novella right there. Um, so we have a couple of links. So um, first of all, if you are in the United States, our publisher is doing a sticker. Or Canada. Or Canada, sorry. Canada and the United States. Basically, um, anything above Mexico. How about that? Uh, the <laughs> sticker giveaway. So Ian will show that link on the screen. Well, I'm going to post it in the chat. And he'll post it in the chat even better. And, and then, we're going to get updates on how many people... Uh, register for the sticker during the show, right? Yeah, and we'll be able to track how many people, <coughs> like Steve said, successfully got that, and then we'll be able to see our numbers and everything. But please do... Con Sorry? There's a link. All right, the There's link the is in the chat right, right, right now. So, guys, please do consider uh, pre-ordering the book. If you're if you're thinking about getting it, then pre-order it because it helps us get on bestseller lists, which apparently is very important, and we would very much appreciate <laughs> it. And if you have any questions for us about anything that we're talking about during the show, go ahead and put it in the chat. Maybe Ian, they'll just put like question hyphen in front of it so Ian could scan for a little bit easier. He will be curating the best questions. And then, you know, we will, if we have time, which we probably will, three hours for each show, we'll have a Q&A segment. But those will be for curated questions that you've already put into the chat. Mm -hmm. Before we keep going, let me just do a quick Okay. Okay, we're going to do a quick reset of OBS before we continue. Okay. All right, we're, going to, we're doing a technical uh, reboot real quick. So right, while we're, we're doing that, um, yeah. you can buy the book if you're in Europe. You just got to go to the UK Amazon. Yeah, UK Amazon has it. For also, if you go to uh, the Skeptics Guide to the Future .com, you'll see a whole bunch of links on there for different places to order the book depending on where you are. Can you guys hear me during the reset? Yes, yes. we can. Yes. Okay, Steve, I have a quick uh, technical question. I didn't realize, so I started. I just went ahead and started recording after you did the intro. Do you want me to be recording on yeah, my end? Yeah, that's fine. You might as well. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, cool. You can also get a copy of the book, uh, a signed copy of the book as well. So look for those links on our website mm -hmm. as well. Um, and, you know, I'm sorry uh, for anyone that's outside of the U.S. with this sticker promotion. Our, it's our publisher. I mean, they're just... You know they're great, but they you know they couldn't manage getting the shipment. The shipment cost to everywhere around the planet was too much. I, I'm I, you know that's basically always the problem, right? I'm sure you guys get well, and, sick of that. And book publications are are country specific. Mm -hmm. Like all the deals that we make mm -hmm. are also country yeah. specific. So this is a U.S. U uh, U.S. Canada release right now, right? Yeah. So yeah. right now there's two publishers. Yeah. They're that they're they're both part of the same you know, overlord. So there's a one publisher uh, for US and Canada and then another one for the UK, Australia and New Zealand. So any of those countries right now can order the book. So someone in the chat asked if you already ordered the book, do you get the sticker? So I don't know. Yes. What... Yeah. As long as you put in your proof of purchase, right? Yeah. You could show yeah. a proof of purchase. So go to the link and it'll give you the opportunity to show uh, like you just, you could take a picture of a, the receipt or whatever. You know, even if it's an online thing, just take a screenshot and they'd be happy to do it. Uh, and we can keep, we're recording audio, right? We can keep that. All right, here we go. <clears throat> All right, back to the actual show. So part of the reason why we are recording this episode, and there'll be another episode that we're recording as part of a live stream, is because our second book, The Skeptic's Guide to the Future, is coming out in just three days on September 27th. Uh, for those watching the live stream, here is the book. So this is the, this book is the Skeptic's Guide to the Future. But, uh, Bob Jay and I wrote this one. This was a ton of fun to uh. research, to talk about, to you know, to design, figure out what goes into it, to write. You know, we've already had a few interviews about it. It's super fun to talk about. So, you know, essentially what we do in this book is um, we go through first the history of futurism, right? Mm -hmm. So previous attempts at predicting the future. And how did they do? What did they get wrong? What what patterns of wrongness are there? Like they, we talk about uh, futurism fallacies, the common mistakes that futurists make over and over again. We looked a little bit into futurism as an academic discipline to see what they're saying there, et cetera. And then the, you know the the meat of the book is we talk about the cutting edge technologies, where they're coming from, where they are now, and then we try to extrapolate them into the future, the near future, the medium future, and then the distant future when those technologies are fully mature. What is like the mm. ultimate potential 
of these technologies. Yeah, we had fun. That, that was the fun part because then, you know, when we discussed, you know, what is this technology going to look like 50, 100, 1,000 years from now, then we, we took the opportunity to write some science fiction mm -hmm. to illustrate that technology in use, which I thought came out really well. Like, that was a ton of fun. Like discussing what those you know what that could look like in use yeah they're like they're we call them vignettes they're like not even really a full short story it's just a glimpse of the right. future and they bring in and they bring into lots of different technologies yeah. that we had just discussed you know or that we're about to we're discuss, about to discuss yeah. in, in the book so it's not just one tech but a bunch of them all in one story yeah, yeah. and that of course is one of the main themes of the book like one of the futures and fallacies is to think that what how will this one technology look in the future but you can't think about it that way because by the time you get to that point that you're talking about, all other technologies will have been advancing in the background, right? So, like, hopefully, yeah. So I say, well, what what will you know fusion power look like in 50 years? It's like you you can't talk about that without also talking about what solar power is going to look like in 50 years, and uh, you know all other sources of energy because it's always going to be compared to all of the other options. Or if we, we talk a lot about space travel and we think, oh, by the time we get, you know, inter you know, here are the problems that we'll be facing with, with spending a lot of time in space or interstellar travel. It's like, yeah, but by the time we get that, we might be cyborgs. Mm -hmm. We probably <laughs> will be. We'll be genetically engineered. We may just, you know, transfer into a robot for the trip, you know, or whatever. Like, wow. you have to think about all the other things that are happening. It's not going to be us. Right, right. It's, it's not going to be us in the future. That's what we want. That's, we mm -hmm. want to imagine us right. in the future, but that's not what's going to be happening. Yeah. And if you look at previous, you know, uh, you know, predictions of the future and, and futurists, that's what, that's a classic mistake. They take themselves, their culture, yeah. and they just put it, they plop it into place with, with this new fancy technology. Right. And that's a, that's a classic mistake you see over and over and over. Right. And it's important because part of, Pre, quote unquote predicting the future is thinking about how people are going to interact with that technology and again we imagine how we're going to interact with that technology but I think we're living at a very interesting time probably our generation or maybe more than any other generation has a first hand example of like for those of us who have kids like the, our kids have a different relationship with technology than we do oh, you know gosh, yes. mm -hmm. right they use social media they use their smartphone they use all these things differently than we do. They think about it differently. You know, they, um, they prioritize different things. Like my, my daughters rarely, if ever, use their phone as a phone. You know, <laughs> it's not really a phone for them. They use it way more to text or to communicate on certain social media apps or whatever. Wait, it's, Steve, do you use your phone as a, you like make phone calls? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what? Just yeah. just yesterday, I was telling Rachel, and when yeah. I was her age, I had two means of communicating with people. I wrote them a letter, or I picked up a phone yep. and called them, and that was it. Or that you met it? them in yeah, person. Yeah, or you met them in person. But short, but short of that, because well, I moved around the country a lot, I had when I could communicate with my friends. So we talked about how that happened. I mm -hmm. said I wrote letters and made phone calls that cost fifteen dollars for thirty minutes. That's right. how you communicated with people across the. I was it. I like, remember worrying about the cost of making a phone call. Absolutely, you had to oh you had God. to call it off peak hours so that you wouldn't get charged the prime rate because yep. my parents would kill me if they found if I ran up a fifty dollars phone a bill, long distance phone for call a, yeah. for a for a call to my friend back at the other side of the country. I think Steve's a little bit anomalous though because I mean I definitely use my phone a lot and I definitely don't use it mostly for making phone calls. Um, it, there's, there's so much other stuff that I, that the obvious stuff. Oh that yeah, I, that I, I mean, a, a smartphone is probably the phone app is one of the least used aspects yeah. of it. Absolutely, my, my smartphone is my my handheld computer. That's not my point. If it but I do, could we get I, by without it? I do call and accept phone calls. Like it is right. still my phone. Yeah. yeah. But like my That's daughters. Right. So do you? My daughters, they turned off their ringer. Like they don't use it. <laughs> yeah, at I don't all have a ringer. As a my, phone. my phone is on silent with no Aww. notifications ever for my mental health. But I'm curious. So the only time I ever talk on the phone, and I guess that's changed a little since I've been in Florida without a car. But in California, the only time I would have conversations was when I was driving long distances. Mm -hmm. Does mm -hmm. anybody else have that same vibe? Like the only time I talk to people is in the car. That's not the only time, but that's definitely a huge opportunity because you're just right, sitting right. there doing nothing and it's a good, you know, you could talk to people. And now that, you know, it's easy to, when you yeah. put, route the phone through your car so you're not holding it, so you're not well, breaking Where are off. you talking to people then if you're, not, if you're not on the phone? Are you not having phone conversations? Are you not having, you know, yeah. 
conversation. You just communicate yeah, you just in virtual time, yeah, with texts and emails and whatever. Oh uh, no, I'm definitely I'm definitely more of a phone talker than a texter. Definitely. Oh, and then if I like if I'm missing somebody and we want to have like time together, like quality time together, mm-hmm. then we FaceTime. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Well, I pr- primarily use my phone to get angry at the internet. <clears throat> I think if I summarize. My interaction. She's an angry old Facebook man. I am. I stalk at basically everybody that uses social media. I, I log page. in and I'm instantly furious with what I see. Mm-hmm. But this is a classic uh, sort of futurism fallacy again, in that you know past futurists pretty much unanimously imagined that in the future, you know the amorphous future when the technology existed, people will f- will video call. Right, and now we have. We assumed it. Even we did. Yeah. Oh, that was sure. that was predicted many, 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 many years ago. Long that was time the ago. obvious next step for phones. So we have now we have you could video call, audio call, or text, and people prefer texting yeah. to audio and mm. audio to video. Like it's the exact opposite of what everyone predicted and prior to. Or I mean, I think they all have different though, uses. But that's the thing. We, you, until right. you put a technology in the hands of billions of people and see how they use it, it's hard to predict. Most most futurists right. think we're going to use future technology like we use current technology. So here's another fun example. Yep. Yep. When commercial airplane travel was be first, first becoming a thing, futurists imagined that it would evolve into these gigantic luxury airplanes. Flying hotels, almost. They were flying like, cruise ships, right? Mm-hmm. Right, so like they, luxury liners. They were right, like right. luxury liners in the air. That is how they were imagined because they assumed that the use and priorities, it's all about luxury, right, would hold true, even to, would translate to this new technology. And they didn't anticipate, like, no, people are going to want to get there fast and cheap. Right. And, I mean, they, you know, who now we've gone all the like so far the other direction where we're like we crammed into these tiny seats, you know, and you could pay through the nose for a first class seat where you get a slightly bigger seat, you know, or right. or uh, lots Makes of other difference. airlines, lots of other airlines I've seen where you can go super ultra mega first class. Oh, forget where you, that. I mean, you literally get a, a TV this big, a little room, and a foot rub. Yeah. Somebody comes in and gives you a foot rub, but you're spending forty thousand dollars. I mean, how many people yeah. are going to really but, do and, that? And, and Bob, break. even that's nothing compared to the luxury liners that they imagined, where like right. it was like you're right. living in a hotel while you're on the plane. Yeah, yeah. Titanic you know, in, in completely the Completely different. Yeah. Did you guys notice in the chat I mean, somebody be, pointed out that be, when we were talking? Oh, sorry, Jay. When we were okay. talking about um, being on phones that I was doing the, this signal, which ages me even. Yeah. Because young oh, yes. people now do this. This is a phone. Oh, or this. No. Oh, my God. No yeah. way. No, no, Either it's this. this. Of course. Of course. And so for, this. Because this Absolutely. doesn't make sense to them. For the podcasters. With, with normal phones. Yeah, for the, normal phones. phones. For people listening and not watching this, what Kara's talking about, you do the finger and, and thumb, thumb thing. The banana yeah, thing. The yeah, banana like the thumb. Extend, thumb. Yeah. Extend yeah, fingers that's, one in five. And, right. Whereas yeah. these kids today like just put their palm to their these ear. These kids today. A flat, like a plane, like a brick to their ear, which makes perfect sense. Yeah, because it looks like an iPhone and not like a... Well, like a with the receiver, the speaker and the receiver, and yeah. then the well, it's, yeah. it's like remember that the, the rotary. Oh, yeah. Look at almost oh, every sure. program in existence, and if if you want to save something, there's a little icon that's like a, a little hard disk. I swear, how many people know if you're under like if you're under thirty or even forty, sometimes you're not going to know what that little image is of as a, of a like hard disk because they never oh, like use physical like disk, floppies right. or anything. You mean yeah, it looks like a floppy. Sure. Yeah, I saw. I read somewhere online. Some guy was saying that he showed his kid a, a diskette, basically a hard disk, right? Not a floppy, but a hard disk. Um, and the kid goes, "How funny! You three D printed the save icon." Yeah, <laughs> like they of course, didn't. Yeah. Of, of course. course, what yeah. else could they no. possibly have for reference? Right. And on my phone in my office, so I have like a land, <laughs> like a, like a landline in my um, in my psychology office. The icon to check my messages is an envelope. Yes, which envelope. I find so strange. Mm-hmm. Like it's not a voicemail. Like it, it first, it was the envelope, and then you notice, like sometimes on cell phones, it looks like tape, like the little yeah, d- oh yes, yeah. yeah. uh, d- dual so real like, recording. We're co- yeah, we're constantly using iconography from like a bygone yeah. era to talk about future tech. Kara, have you ever called the remote control the clicker? 
Uh, I have. <laughs> okay. But that, that dates I have. Back yeah. to the original remote device, yeah. which That's made a click tethered. noise. No, no, no. Yeah. yeah. It would you would l make a literal clicking sound the frequency, when you right. hit the button. It would hit a like tuning fork rod, mm -hmm. which would vibrate at a specific frequency, and the TV would respond to that frequency. So you had like three or four three controls. Buttons, that's it. Yeah, like three or four buttons, like volume, uh, you know, channel up down, off, on, channel off. up down, on off. That's that was it. it. Oh yeah. That's and it literally so clicked. Funny. Yeah, so, so you people, yeah, so people still call it the clicker. clicker. We also still say tape, like we're gonna tape something. Right. Yeah. 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 That's when Instead tape of, yeah. is nowhere in the loop. But they make yeah. it. The, the, those things, people understand what they. Yeah. Mean, what they mean. Yeah. Yeah. And and you know, I promise all of you that that are young, you'll feel old one day too. Mm -hmm. Whatever whatever you think is normal now, it mm -hmm. won't be in thirty years, and, you, and you'll be doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> God and, damn it. And, it! and it will probably just speed up. Yeah, and like oh gosh, you know, yes. like a twenty-five-year-old and a twenty-year and a twenty-year-old might find see dramatic differences uh, as the pace of increase, uh, you know, accelerates mm -hmm. as it probably will. Oh yeah, look will. at this. Somebody mentioning their keys. Like I live in an apartment that was built in twenty nineteen here in South Florida, and we have fobs and an app, so our door is electronic. I have a key, but you don't have to use it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I actually don't need to bring my keys with me anywhere because it's an app in my phone. Yeah. And I just swipe on my door like in a hotel. Yep. So it's not a key and party, I think, it's an app party? Is that how it works? I think that's like the future. <laughs> and nobody's cars. Just, whose car has a key now? You've got like a clicker and a remote start. I don't think we're going to have keys soon at all. Yeah. For, yeah. One of my cars, I the I don't have a physical key. I just have to have a, I have a fob that I need to have on me and that's it. Mm -hmm. And for, for uh, Jocelyn's Tesla, it you get like a credit card, yeah. but the only time you use the credit card is to give it to a valet because you could your your basically iPhone app is your key. Yeah. So you, you and you could you could give the key to somebody else by basically activating it on their phone. Yeah, but her Tesla also has a spot. This isn't known very widely. There's a spot on the door. If you touch it just right, it punctures your skin and tests test your blood for the DNA <laughs> to let you in. So it's, it's, that's a new thing. Yeah. Not many people that's know that for a reason. Yeah. yeah. And we're just skimming the surface oh, man. <laughs> of this book. The third section of the book goes into um, science fiction technology. So we go beyond actual technology where like the roots of it, even if like the beginnings of it already exist, even if it's just a, a proof of concept or a theory at this point. And then we just talk about crazy sci-fi tech and discuss, like, is this even possible? Like lightsabers, you know, things like that. Like, Anti-gravity. Is, is it even possible no. that we could possibly make a lightsaber? Transporters. Um, and what would that be like? And, and then, again, you think about it. Like, by the time, if you could make a lightsaber, that technology would be useful for so many other right. things. Yeah, it would be, it would be so <laughs> a power source. That power source. It'd yeah, I'm going to plug changer. that into my building and run my building off of that. Yeah, right. Exactly. That's, That's like a, the transporter, you know, like when yeah. in Star Trek, you know, like it, it would, it, that one invention would change reality. It would mm -hmm. change everybody's life. In, in ways that, you know, would be impossible to predict. Yeah. Or, or my, my, my favorite, and we go into this in the book, the holodeck. Oh. If you could do that, oh my gosh. why would you confine that to one little room, right? Why wouldn't the whole ship be a holodeck, right? You just. Right. So it would configure itself as needed to whatever functionality you needed anywhere yeah. on the ship, yeah. except, you know, with the only exception of <clears throat> assuming you had intricate power. machines that it couldn't make. Assuming you had limitless power. Every, right. at your every room would become a room of requirement. Yeah, basically. Yeah, basically. Uh, yeah pretty much. But it and, wouldn't, and all you would need is uh, give me a holodeck and a replicator, and I'm good. I'm done. Yeah, Goodbye, see, everybody. have a nice life. I would check out at that point. <laughs> you, you, you go into Bob's holodeck, like, 50 years later, and it would be like a Halloween planet. Yeah. He would have constructed, right? Also, don't go in there with a black light. <laughs> uh, oh, my God. I saw the wow. joke and I took it. Yeah. Holy shit. Mental edit here. Okay. <laughs> Come on. Ooh, how edgy. I'll decide at the time. <laughs> we'll see. Um, He's already decided. So, uh, we encourage anyone who's interested in any of the things we're talking about, anything about futurism and future technology and existing technology and the history of technology, all of that, and sci-fi stuff, to pre-order the book, The Skeptic's Guide to the Future. Uh, if you're listening to this after September 27th, you can order the book just mm -hmm. directly, and they'll send it to you. 
Um, the links are on. You can get to the links on our home on our the SGU page. You go to the you know slash books, and then that takes you to the publisher who has all the actual links to specific sellers. Uh, I also will remind you that we this is our second book. Why is this keep timing out? <clears throat> Don't forget about the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. That's our first book. It's still selling quite well, actually. Yeah. Um, so, and you know, you could always order them as uh, as a pair mm -hmm. on Amazon. You could link them together. That's right. All right. Let's get to yeah, some actual content, Bob. Oh boy, you're gonna do a forgotten superhero of science. Yeah, I haven't done this in a while. Um, so yes, forgotten superheroes of science. This is uh, Ray. Gene Montague, 1935 to 2018, naval engineer and the first female program manager of ships in the United States Navy. Uh, in her own words, she said, I'm known as the first person to design a ship using the computer. Cool. Um, so uh, Montague was inspired early in life when, uh, for, her, for her, you know, her scientific career. When she was seven, I believe in 1940, her grandfather took her on a tour of a captured German sub. Wow. And she said, uh, she's quoted as saying about that experience, I looked through the periscope and saw all these dials and mechanisms, and I said to the guy who was giving the tour, uh, what do you have to know to do this? And he replied, oh, you'd have to be an engineer. You don't have to worry about that. And the implication, <laughs> of course, mm -hmm. a, young, a young black girl, you know, is never going to become an engineer. And don't forget, and also this was like in the 1940s, so imagine, you know, the attitudes then for somebody mm. like that becoming an engineer. I mean, it's uh, almost unimaginable how bad it was. You know, today, it's not great. Back then, oof. Um, but uh, Montague joined uh, the, the United States Navy in 1955 in, uh, in Washington, D.C., and she was a clerk typist, and she was sitting right next to the UNIVAC-1. UNIVAC-1. The UNIVAC. Um, yeah, so if you remember, the ENIAC um, was the first programmable electronic general purpose digital computer. Uh, there were other computers at that time that had some of those capabilities, but th that was the first one to have pretty much all of that um, at the same time. And it was completed in 1945, and uh, it was used for the United States Army's Ballistic Research Lab. Of course, uh, it, was a, it was an amazing tool. Um, of course, it was, you know, it was a computer. UNIVAC-1 was essentially the business version of the ENIAC. That's, that's basically what that was. It was the very first successful civilian computer and it was obviously, that, that was a critical piece of the dawn of the computer age. I mean, it, it's, it's a milestone of milestones right there. And she was sitting right next to it. She was working next to it. And the story goes that one day, a lot, all of the engineers called in sick for whatever reason. I don't know if they were really partying the night before. But none of them came in. And she was able uh, to dive right in and accomplish some work on the, uh, on the UNIVAC-1 because she had seen and she had observed the engineers using it for, for quite a while. So um, soon after that, she was studying, whoops, soon after that, she was studying uh, computer programming at night school. And then, uh, then the promotions seemed to come very, very quickly for her. Um, she was appointed uh, as a computer systems analyst at the Navy Ship Engineering Center. Um, and then program director for the Naval Sea Systems Command Integrated Design, Manufacturing, and Maintenance Program. And uh, then division head for the Computer Aided Design and Computer Aided Manufacturing (CAD) CAD CAM program, and deputy program manager of the Navy's Information Systems Improvement Program. So um, lots of titles, lots of responsibilities. And then back in 1971, her department was challenged with uh, with a task to create a computer generated ship design. Ne had never really been done before. She pulled uh, together a lot of uh, systems, some automated systems that had been created, pulled them together, and within 19 hours, she had a, a, an initial draft uh, for an Oliver Hazard Peri-class frigate. Peri-class frigate, I, I like the sound of that. <laughs> um, in 19 hours, uh, that made her the first person to design a ship using a computer system. <laughs> and then after that, uh, she worked on uh, Seawolf-class submarines, Nimitz class aircraft carriers and Dwight D. Eisenhower and uh, and I'm uh, just amazing to think she started as a clerk typist and and uh, she ultimately was doing amazing things and, and breaking ground and what being, a the, life. being the first incredible you know, being involved in all those different things that is fantastic uh, amazing and uh, and also you know you can imagine you know the pushback she got being you know being a black woman and uh, at at that time 
So I'm sure that that wasn't easy as well. Well, so, it's a uh, testament to just how unbelievably talented and, and intelligent she was. Like she had to oh, yeah. blow people's minds in Ab order to absolutely. Get and that, that's a common thread in a lot of these superhero uh, segments that I've done, where they were just so they were so superior. Um, that uh, the, it couldn't be denied, you know, in a lot of cases. She, that, and that's unfortunate that you have to be so amazing just, just, to, just to get the same opportunities that people who are average amazing uh, have. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so remember the United States Navy's hidden figure, Ray Jean Montague. Mention her to your mm -hmm. friends, or Jay, mention her to your friend. <laughs> Um, especially when <laughs> discussing, <Bob. laughs> it's, so mean. it's just Bob. <laughs> especially when discussing drawing interchange formats, cattle bar arrangements, or especially geometric modeling kernels. Ooh, I like those. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> cool. Saving that cough, Steve. Thank you. I appreciate it. Are you doing that, Steve? Are you holding it back? Yeah, I'm holding it until in between segments. They're so they're so so hard to hold. I in. know. I've yeah. done it to such a degree, my eyes watered. Yeah, where you're like, it's, oh, you're like it's like you're gonna explode. It's, you know? it's far worse no. than holding back flatulence. Far Some worse. things will never go away in the future. Things like that, the people cough. will still yeah. have to cough and can only control it so much. Um, who's talking about the uh, burgers? Burgers, me. The meat that you, Jay? Me, me. All right, all right, it's all right, time. Jay. Tell us about the future of that grown meat. Yeah, well, it's this isn't the future of. Uh, of vat grown meat it's more about the the difference between plant-based meats and traditional and like meat-based meats and meat-based meats yeah. that are happening today <laughs> and, and, and the, you know the real question here when we compare the two is you know how sustainable are are you know these plant-based meats you know what what is their what is the profile and i you know after doing some research and reading about it it's pretty interesting like you know how we got to plant-based meats and then we're comparing like the energy and resources that it takes to create them versus traditional meats, okay? Mm -hmm. So as everybody knows, a lot of people eat meat and unfortunately meat demand, if anything, it's just going up. And um, I have to admit, the older I get, uh, I am way more conscious now about my meat eating usage. You know, I just don't, I just don't, I try to lower it as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and as much as I do love meatballs and everything, like, you know, I've def I, I don't let myself go there. It's like maybe once every couple of months at this point, where it was more like every two weeks, which is a big <laughs> difference for me. Every two weeks is fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the other thing about just eating, you know, traditional meat is that it once is... Once a week is fine. <laughs> it, it takes a, a significant toll on the environment. You know, animal agriculture promotes deforestation, greenhouse gas emissions air and water pollution. So eating meat is just not helping global warming, which, which you know, is getting worse and everything seems to be getting worse. So, But just as I have to say, because we've covered this topic before, you know, just to, to give it more nuance to that, that doesn't mean like zero meat consumption is what's optimal. Yeah. Right. And I know this is controversial because there are some people who think that that is the case. Mm. But, um, you know, you know when, when we've done a deep dive on this topic, I think it's a fairer summer summary is that we should really have a lot less meat consumption, mm -hmm. but not zero because, you know, it's there's a there's an integrated agricultural system, you know, where there's you know animals are good at converting non-human calories into human calories, mm -hmm. so there, there there can be an efficiency there, and um, they can use land which is not usable by you know, for, for growing food for people. And, you know, they can eat food that people can eat and then convert that into food. And they produce a lot of fertilizer. Half of our yeah. food we grow oh with gosh, we with cattle, cattle manure. So if we, they all went away, that would be a huge problem for yeah. the agricultural system. So there's, you're and, saying there's a healthy balance in there. So. Yeah, so there's, yeah, there's, a, there's probably a sweet spot in there somewhere. We're not at it right now where I think we're, we're just... Demand is requiring that we produce more meat than is optimal for the system. But... That, but not to imply that the that there's a consensus that we need to go to zero meat consumption. And the there's optimal. studies that show that that a, you know that a meat consumption at decent at, at certain levels is perfectly healthy yeah. and is not and is not going to give you a heart attack. Right. Of course. So approximately 15 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions come from livestock, and it, and mm. like I said, it's only going to go up in, as demand for meat goes up. They're saying that there will be a 15 percent increase in meat demand in the next decade. That is significant. That is way more than I would have guessed. Hmm. 
Greenhouse gases come from where? When, when you're talking about grazing animals like sheep, goats, and cows, right? They, these animals burp methane that comes from them dige digesting grasses and the like. So greenhouse gases um, also happen to come from chemicals that are used to grow feed. So there's lots of things in the industry um, that, that are the result of these greenhouse gases. So interestingly, uh, chickens and pigs have much lower gas emissions than cows, which I did not know. They're also better at converting the calories they eat into muscle. So for example, when we compare chickens, pigs, and cows, chickens need to eat about two pounds of feed for each pound of edible tissue gain. Pigs uh, need three to five pounds of feed, and cows need- For every need, pound. What? Per pound, yeah, everything is per pound. So a pig needs to eat three to five pounds of feed to, to make an edible pound. And then cows need six to 10 pounds of feed. Whoa. Yeah, so it's a, it's a really big difference here. And goats for, are even worse. They're like, they're like 15, 16. And fish are close to one to one. Wow. Yeah, oh, fish yeah, are the fish best. Are, Goats yeah. and sheep are pretty bad, but they're not consumed as bad. in as large quantities yeah. across the globe yeah, as I mean, cows. Just he, reading these stats, like eat chicken and fish. I mean, that, that's a good yeah. shift mm -hmm. in your meat right there. Just just focus on them. Um, so this correlates Jay, to... Jay, yeah. your mic needs to be closer. Okay. Microphone etiquette. Sorry, Anna, what do I know? That's so funny because to me, Jay is the loudest, but I think I'm calibrated differently than the audience. Oh, Jay's the loudest. Ian, Kara keeps cutting out for me. <laughs> like, I can't hear her right now. She's not cutting out for me. I'm not talking right now. My, also, my I'm, seeing a lot of, <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of duplicate comments, which I really can't remember seeing before. Uh, it's because we're on Let's all just complain to Ian for the next uh, no, I'm 10 I'm just minutes. throwing it out there. What, what was that, Ian? No, I'm kidding. Only 10 minutes. We're on multiple platforms. It's, yeah, it's, okay, just, it's all right, that's fine. Different. So getting back, so... Cows produce six, six times more gas than pigs and approximately nine times more than chickens. Mm. So they are clearly um, you know, the biggest problem when it comes to grazing animals. Yes. So today we have products that simulate the taste of meat, but, and they're completely plant-based. And I don't know if you guys have ever tried them, but mm -hmm. I have. I have. I've tried them all. I'll tell you I've about tried. it. They taste nothing like meat. So texture. <laughs> I love Impossible Taste Burger. Taste or texture? Impossible Burger, Steve, you would not know the difference. Oh, absolutely, I know the difference. You've no, you know it. the difference, but they're the closest, I think. If somebody gave it to I've had them. We somebody were going to do blind to tests tell at some me, point. I wouldn't even... Yeah, for hamburger, it. it's fine. I mean, I... Uh, so it's just a little that's bit That's a separate here. question. If you... I, I mean, they taste fine. I would never confuse it for beef. Right. But they taste I think fine. it tastes better than beef. That's but that's okay. different. You how good it is is a different question than how much... What do you have on your hamburger? The whole, sh you know, yeah, lettuce, the whole ketchup, yeah. pickles. Yeah, by the time you put all your condiments, you know, like how much, you, you know. But let's, let's, let me focus on this because we're going to easily get derailed in our personal experiences with <laughs> plant-based meats here. So plant-based foods create significantly lower levels of greenhouse gases than meat-based foods. Mm -hmm. during, during the 12-hour show, and this is my anecdote last year, right? When we do that last, a year ago last spring? Um, I cooked meatballs for everybody in real time, and I also made Ian, because Ian is a vegetarian, I made him plant-based meatballs, and I got to tell you, legit, they tasted good. Yeah. They were good. They weren't, you know, you they weren't beef, but they were a very good flavor, and the texture was fantastic, so I wasn't really that disappointed in them. Um, Jay, what did you use? I used Impossible Burger meat. Impossible, okay, yep. yeah. I've also had shepherd's pie made completely out of Impossible Burger, and that was fantastic because it's, it's heavy with, you know, spices, so it, yeah. it obfuscates the flavor. And, you know, so the, so the point of me saying this is you could use plant-based meats in dishes where, you know, there's a lot of spices and everything, like for tacos mm -hmm. and things like that. Like, you could just think about swapping that in right away because it tastes fantastic. So researchers were able, were able to make a plant-based product that has similar traits as real meat by figuring out exactly what makes meat meat. You know, why, is, why, why does meat taste like meat? Why does it have the texture that it has? Why does it have the flavors that it has? So as an example, many of the products that they use, like, like coconut oil is a great example. They use coconut oil, I believe, in Impossible Burger because it has a similar animal fats feel in your mouth, mm -hmm. right? So your mouth detects it your mouth detects a lot of things and it gives you a certain experience and, and coconut oil is able to, to feel similarly to animal fats, which mm -hmm. is great because it's a much healthier oil to eat, as you know, by the way. 
Um, now, what, uh, we, Kara, it seems to me like you and I talk about heme quite a bit. For some reason, you and I are always chit-chatting about heme. Leg hemoglobin. Heme. Yeah. Hemoglobin. <laughs> so this heme is the red liquid. liquid. The globin. This isn't blood. It's the red liquid protein that comes out of meats. When you, if you have you know, a steak or, or even, even uh, ground beef, if you squeeze it, you see this red liquid come out. It's you, blood, But Jay. by the way, it's not leg red hemoglobin. Liquid. It's blood. It's, it not, it's not exactly blood, Steve. It's a part of blood. It yeah, it's a part of blood. Like Watery blood. blood. It's, it's a part of blood, and it's pretty amazing. When I visited the Impossible headquarters for a TV show, I had to, like, taste leg hemoglobin, which is the version that they use, the animal-based version, or sorry, the plant-based version they use in Impossible Meat. And it tastes like your mouth, like your mouth is full of blood. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. it's gross to just eat on its own. It makes but, you feel weird. But that's right, and you're not supposed to. But, Kara, the point is, <laughs> and I want to make this perfectly yeah, don't do clear, that. they made a plant-based version of heme. Yeah, that, it's that leg hemoglobin. It is like hemoglobin. It, it No, it's called leg hemoglobin. Oh, it's leg hemoglobin. Jay, yeah. Jay <laughs> Kara, did, did you guys exchange version. heme memes? Is that what you do all day? Heme memes. Heme memes. Heme memes. But, but I, I want you I'm, I'm to done. appreciate the, the chemical science here, you know, and the mm -hmm. agricultural science that the, the feat of them creating these plant-based meat simulations it's a big deal, and the fact that they were able to to come up with a, a heme, a plant-based heme, is is damn near miraculous science, in my opinion. Well, all plants have it. They just were able to first they isolated it from um, soy, yeah. and then when they realized that the quantity that they could get was so tiny, they started genetically engineering yeast to produce it yep. because it's just so much more efficient to do it that way. Yeah, and they, they, you know, so they cultivate these yeasts, and then they create reactors that the yeast can, you know, multiply in, and then it cranks. This is like insulin, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. This is, this is, by the mm -hmm. way, is how we, you know, insulin is made. Um, so these, these products, like every pro separate product that goes into a plant-based meat, there is a lot of processing. You know, like it is a highly processed food. Not in the same way when you think, oh, it's got a lot of, it's got a lot of cane sugar in it, and that's bad, and all that. It just means that they have a lot of steps that they have to go through. To, to get these products like soy to get it into the position that they needed to in order to use it in, in plant-based meats. So taking a close look at how much energy is needed to produce these products will answer the overall question that I'm putting to everybody here is, you know, how much better is plant-based meats for the environment than regular meat? So let me give you guys a little bit of a, a background here. So each ingredient needs to be traced back to where it comes from, from all the processes Right? There's a ton of processes that they need to get through in order for it to be the final version that's found in a plant-based meat. And this is called life cycle analysis. Mm -hmm. So, for example, each ingredient is what? They're farmed because they're plants. They're transported, and then they're processed. And each of, in each of those three stages, there's a lot of things happening and that they had to track all of those different steps and every single thing that happens. So each step along the way uses fuel, uses water, uses land, uses chemicals, and, and they have to total up all this information for each ingredient, and that gives us the final answer. But the snag is, because there's always a freaking snag, is that the information isn't ready, it wasn't readily available to these researchers. Com the companies that make plant-based meats, you know, they're keeping their products and ingredients and all of that information to themselves because it's proprietary. You know, they don't want to like say, here's everything that we do and every single w process that we use because that is part of their, their company's business, right? And it, it does make sense. I don't think they're doing it to, to, to you know, for uh, malfeasance. They're doing it because they don't want other companies to copy what they're doing. Yep. It is their intellectual property. So scientists had to rely on information that these companies shared <coughs> about their products. That is the one disclosure that I have here. I'm just assuming that they gave a relatively accurate uh, rendition of what's actually taking place. So to get to some numbers, Impossible Burger production only creates 11% of the greenhouse gases produced by the same amount of beef. That is significantly oh, wow. less. Yeah, that's significant. Yeah. Other plant-based meat producers were showing similar numbers as well. So compared to pork and chicken, uh, pork was 37% of, of beef and chicken was 57%, which is even better. Um, you know, these, nu these numbers are, are, are pretty significant when you think about the, the impact on the environment. Researchers also found that the amount of water used was only 23% of that in beef, 11% used by pork, and 24% in chicken for equal amounts of protein. So the, they're, they're dramatically less. 
Land use has huge differences as well. Plant-based use was 2% of what beef uses for the same amount of protein, 2%. Wow. 18% for pork and 23% for chicken. Land use is important because, you know what, land, land is very important here because it has, there is a potential huge amount of carbon storage that a, an acre of land can have. And when you're, when you're deforesting tens of thousands of acres, unfortunately, of the Amazon, you're getting rid of an incredible amount of vegetation that's holding a lot of carbon. So it, it all. But again, up. you know, there's because there's always multiple angles here. Um, the the land that like cattle are grazing on is not rainforest, right? right? It, you're going to cut down rainforest to grow crops, not mm -hmm. to graze cattle. Um, and so there, a lot of that land use is not arable land or land that we could be using for agriculture. Um, and uh, there is a, there's a separate movement, like another way to mitigate the, uh, the resource use of, of cows and meat, you know, um, meat-based animals, mm -hmm. is to feed them <laughs> more. Meat-based animals. Yeah, <laughs> more, uh, to feed them more of the uh the refuse you know mm -hmm. like like you, know, you don't grow grains to feed them you feed them the leftover stuff from other from, processes from human agriculture yeah. so that is more of like a circular system uh so so it, you know it remains to be seen how far that can go but there is a huge movement in agriculture to do that um i just read a recent you know news item about that steve they, they are clearing amazon forest for grazing purposes and Soybeans are also huge, very high on the list of what's being grown in, in former Amazon forest right now. Yeah. Um, so it is it is a problem, and you know that they're whacking back those that area. Well, that's that's a, a separate problem. Yeah. Even without animals, yeah. for any reason, that's a problem. It, and right. it you know the, you know even if they're just growing crops, even if whether fit animals are in the mix or not or not, uh, they they that's the worst thing they could be doing is you know. So what they're essentially doing is burning down the forest and then planting crops to get all the nutrients out of that, and then they move on once yeah. they... Uh, once it's they... not even burning down a forest. You're, there's like burning down libraries, essentially. <laughs> I mean, because you've got genetic diversity in those rainforests, oh, that, and, they're, and they're isolated. You could have a genetic d diversified area that, yeah. is, that is unique. And never no other area, once that's gone, that is gone. Forever. It's millions of years of evolution, now gone, that we will never retrieve. There could be amazing drugs in there, uh, amazing genetic information that is gone. So it's, it's so far no, worse it's than just and so, and, and there, trees again, and stuff. There are alternatives. Uh, like, you can farm the forest, right? You can you know, right. pl plant and cultivate and whatever things that will grow within the forest without right, having without to destroy Yeah, like castanhas, yeah. like Brazil nut trees. They're really sustainable. It's a great way to harvest things that are already growing there yeah. and not disrupt the ecosystem. And, and also, think, they could also use the land they're already using for farming better by planting things which regenerate the soil that are also cash crops, you know. But so they're just not doing it smartly. They're not doing it well. Well, in some areas, people really are doing it smartly, oh, yeah. and in other areas, there's too much demand, and the the cost is too high, and individuals are going to do what they need to do to maintain their livelihood. Absolutely. So this is way bigger than the boots on the ground in the Amazon. It's oh, the pressure from countries like ours asking for tropical hardwoods and asking for more crops to be grown and more animals to be um, produced in those areas. Um, Jay, I think it's important to note because I've been looking at the. Um, at the comments mm -hmm. that a lot of these lab grown or synthetic meats that try to emulate real meat, the target audience is not people who are already not eating meat. Cause yeah. you hear a lot of times people going, it grosses me out. It tastes too much like real meat. I don't want to eat fake meat. Yeah. It's not for you. Yeah. The idea that like the CEO of Impossible when I interviewed him, I think Pat Brown is his name. He was very clear. I wanted to develop this so that I could give an altern alternative to people who are doing the environmental harm. People who, people like who are meat. eating large quantities yeah. of yeah. meat. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. So that they have an option to do better without giving up what they love. You know, and yeah. also interestingly, all of these numbers apply to cow milk versus, you know, like say nut based milk. Mm -hmm. You know, all all of the greenhouse gas emissions and, and you know, energy used and everything. So 
right but you have to be careful with which nuts you're talking about because almond milk for example is like so water intensive yeah. it's mm -hmm. horrible it, to it, make it is, it is very water intensive but as far as greenhouse gases and bad for the environment it's you know it's a completely different thing and it's also important to note here um you know they say that farming practices are hugely significant here you know all of these numbers are are largely uh, responsible to the latest state-of-the-art farming practices. So if a farm is growing plant-based, like let's say they're growing soybeans and they're just not doing it well, they're not up to date on everything, the, all of these numbers can go way back up. Greenhouse gas mm -hmm. emissions could go way back up. So it is heavily dependent on them doing it right. So the, I think the, the meta problem here is that um, yeah, there are smart agricultural practices. There are optimal, you know, agricultural practices. We can get the system to be more circular and work together. But, but it's not like there is a world agricultural organization who that actually controls what every farmer does, mm -hmm. right? And so what you have is individual farmers making individual decisions that are in their best interest. And, and a, a lot of the times it's like, well, they're making decisions so they don't starve. They're making decisions so that they don't lose money doing mm -hmm. what they're doing. The margins are so razor thin with agriculture. And so um, they're, they're not necessarily doing what's optimal for the whole system. But we're at a point with, you know, 8 billion people on the planet where we've already basically using up all the arable land and because of global warming, where we need the whole system to be efficient together. Yeah. And that's really mm -hmm. what we're talking about is moving towards an integrated system coordinated. That's, that's coordinated and that's optimal. And that may mean having to pay poor people to not do stuff or right. giving them better paying to give them better ways to do things or integrating it better. Uh, but but. Again, if individuals will make smart decisions for themselves that are not good for the whole system. Yeah, that's really sure. the problem. Right. That that's why we have poaching. That's why we yeah. have gold mining in the Amazon, because it's the only option these people have. <coughs> yep. You know, I think it's fair to note here, um, there are some drawbacks to plant-based meats. Like right now, they cost 43% 40, more than products that they're trying to replace, which mm -hmm. is a lot. And I did go on, I did some online searching and verified that that's true. Um, Which so, is another point. Like if you're if you're like a poor farmer in Africa, sometimes animal protein is the cheapest, best protein you can get access yeah. to, and that's very important for certain people. Again, yeah. we can't just look at this from our perspective, where like we have no issues with getting enough food or calories or high yeah. quality proteins or stuff. When most of the world is living on the edge, we have to be very careful about any changes that we make. And right now, uh, plant-based meats are only one percent of the market, yeah. which is basically yeah. you know almost not, it's nothing. Um, I would just like to say at this point, eat green leafy vegetables, eat beans, eat grains. Lentils. This is, this is much healthier than you know, predominantly eating meats. Well, again, it's all about balance, but we definitely should eat more of that right. than we are that. generally in the West. Yeah. You know, well, you know, not say. only is it good for the environment, but it's better for your health. And since uh, plant-based meats are processed food, they create 4.6 times more greenhouse gases than beans per unit of protein as well, right? So you could just look at plant-based products and say that they're, you know, these plant-based meat products are still worse for the environment than just eating, you know, beans. Mm -hmm. Five hours to go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Already? Wow. wow. Oh, An hour down? Hour One down. news item we're in? Oh, my gosh. Um all right. have a lot of oh my god we're one news item in we we have an interview coming up oh. uh in half an hour with the everyday astronaut oh yeah. bob you're gonna so i think we'll try to time this so that we go right from this next news item to that interview wow. uh bob you're gonna ta talk right now yep oh geez yeah okay <laughs> new news item. see the picture's there for you that's I visual that might be mine. that's called a visual cube uh. yeah so not, bob not you're gonna talk to us Bob, you're going to talk to us about whether or not we should go back to the moon, or why should we go back to the moon? Okay. In a half hour, so, good luck. Yeah. So <laughs> 1962, <laughs> September 12th, what happened? JFK did his, his, his uh, he announced his public plan. The moonshot to, speech. To put man on the moon at the end of the decade, right? Big, big, huge milestone. And now it's 60 years later, 60 years later, and the United States is about to launch the first mission of the Artemis program to go back to the moon. Now, there's, there's, there's a lot of people that are saying that, ah, let's go to Mars. For example, Apollo 11 astronaut, Jay, yeah. Michael Collins. Yes. He, uh, he and Mars Society founder Robert Zubrin 
both of them have long been advocates of, of America going directly to Mars and not the moon. So He's biased. When so, you've been to the moon, eh, go to Mars. Right? So, <laughs> you, you know, it's not unreasonable to say, all right, why are we going back? Why repeat what's already been done, been there, done that? Why do we need to go that, to go back there? And, I mean, one good reason, one, the big overarching reason is Mars practice. Sure. We need to practice going to Mars, and it's a test bed in a lot of ways. And so there's lots of examples uh, that's part of that. One is radiation. We've talked about radiation uh, many times on the show. The radiation, the cosmic rays, solar particles that are in space for long-distance travel are horrific. You could go there and be like, well, I got my dose of, uh, of radiation for my entire life now, and uh, cancer, all this stuff, it's, it's horrible. And we've talked to NASA people, and their attitude is, yeah, we don't have any good <coughs> solutions right now. The big plan now is to get there fast and then treat it medic and treat the problems as they arise medically. And like that mm. was it. That was it. So th this is a hard nut to crack. Mm. Dealing with dealing with the radiation, it's um, it's a it's a huge problem. And there's no way we can go to Mars right now. It's really no way for lots of reasons. But radiation is is a huge one. So now Artemis is planning from its very first mission. They're they're, they're going to do they're going to do experiments and studies on what radiation does to living organisms, and they're going to be testing various things. Like how about this one? At first, I'd never heard about this. An anti radiation vest. They're looking at an anti radiation vest. Wow, I want to learn a little bit more about that because that sounds just a vest. Yeah, that's a, well. That's I mean, you know, whatever. I don't know. Anything starting much, right. Make a whole suit it. out of it. I suppose at some point you, you start with a vest. Is that the point? I don't. I don't know. I mean, I, I guess that's... Hey. Well, the thing is, you there's a, there's different tolerances for your limbs and your organs and your thyroid, which is the most yeah. most yeah. vulnerable. So, like, when x-ray techs don't wear a, a suit, they just wear a vest, and they wear a, 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 goi you know, a okay. collar. What do you call that? The thing that goes around your neck. <laughs> a goiter collar. Not a goiter. <laughs> it's go not a, 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 uh, a ascot. I there's, there's a name for that, the thing the things that go around <laughs> to protect your neck. Uh, so... Uh, so it makes sense, right? Your arms yeah, and legs sure. just don't, they're not, uh, don't have the vulnerable stuff that your internal yeah, organs true. has. My friend is an IR physician and she wears these, like she wears like the best thing and then she wears these like bananas glasses, like these really intense goggles mm -hmm. when she's doing her yeah. work so that she doesn't get radiation in her eyeballs. Yeah, Ooh. yeah, yeah. And also whenever we talk about radiation in space, Bob, I know you know this, but we have to do Ionizing. Sep separate out, well, just to, even just like solar radiation from galactic, intergalactic cosmic, cosmic, cosmic rays. rays yeah. Like everything we're talking about, like a vest or shielding or whatever, is only about solar radi radiation. There right. is no shielding for cosmic rays. Yeah. I'm bombarded In, by cosmic rays right now. Co well, the atmosphere protects us. Oh, yes. That's what course, protects right. us. Um, and really, really well. But without an ocean of atmosphere above you or feet of rock or something like that, um, sh any shielding that we can devise would actually make the problem worse. Eesh. It just traps it inside, oh, so it bounces, bounces around. around. There's even more yeah. damage. You're better so, off just letting it go straight through. Right. So radiation, huge problem. And so we can learn a lot about how to deal with radiation by going to the moon first. Also, mm -hmm. learning to live off the land is also very important. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, the moon... <coughs> Sorry, say that again. Okay. Uh, okay, so, so learning to live off the land is another huge thing that we, we need to learn on the moon before we, before we can get to Mars. Um, uh, the, you know, the, we, have, we have astronauts in space you know, right now on the, on the ISS. We've, we've been to the moon. The, the moon is a thousand times farther than the, than the International Space Station. And you know, if, we, if you have a problem on the, on the space station, no problem. You, just, you can get a rocket there in, for, relatively quickly. And even on the moon, if there's a major problem, you're a few days away. Um, so we've got we to, so, but Mars is a completely different beast. You're months away, probably maybe even more than that for worst case scenarios, far worse. So you need to be able to be self-sufficient uh, on Mars, and you can test that on the moon. Mm -hmm. For example, like there's plenty of ice on the moon. We can learn to, to use, we can have drinking water, hydrogen, oxygen, rocket fuel, amazing. Also regolith, there's lots of different things you could do with the regolith of the moon. Um, so learning to live off the land on the moon could, could teach us a lot about living off the land on the Mars, which would be critical because you're just so amazingly isolated. Never, you know, uh, isolation never experienced by any humans ever before. There's also new technology testing. There's lots of new technologies that are coming out. The new spacesuits that are coming out 
are are pretty amazing. If you look at the Apollo spacesuits, they were designed to last just a few missions. Yeah, that's, that's it. it. A, a few moonwalks, and that was it. Uh, they they were like falling apart. They Crumbled. Were, they were in bad <laughs> shape. Um, now Artemis and Mars is going to have missions that are going to last, you know, a lot more than a few a few days or a week. It's going to be weeks months or even potentially years so yeah. it's a completely different beast so that so we got to test these new spacesuits there's also vehicles that they're that they're developing that you're going to need on on mars so they're going to test them on the moon on the moon pressurized unpressurized and then there's there's energy sources uh portable nuclear fission fission systems i've talked about kilopower on the show before there that project is developing a, a fission system that's 10 kilowatts that can last many many years um it, it incredibly beneficial to have a source a source like that on mars that could last you for years and you don't have to worry about anything you don't need solar or or any or or any other type of fuel that's going to be critical all going to be tested on the moon um there's also china competition china you know has to go into this uh um nasa feels that we need to settle the moon in some way before the chinese they're planning on mm -hmm. settling or having Taikonauts on by the year 2030. And the NASA boss, Bill Nelson, said this in a recent interview. He said, we don't want China suddenly getting there and saying, this is our exclusive right. territory. Yep, I mean, you know, that. who knows what's going to happen. I, that wouldn't shock me if they did that. But they want, they feel that they need a presence there before there could be any, any reasonable kind of claim that another country could have. Plus, this whole space between the uh, moon and the Earth the cis lunar space is going to be a huge competition, a, a hugely strategically important uh, space um, uh, that that you're going to see China, mainly China and the United States, kind of like vying for. That's one of the one of the reasons why we're really seriously developing uh, nuclear rockets now because you need to have mobility in cis lunar space, and that's uh, the, and I love the fact that we're moving away from chemical rockets, but I hate the reason why we're doing it. But NASA is not stupid. They're, they're involved in these nuclear rockets because they feel that once NASA develops them or once the, government's, uh, the government uses them for cislunar space, they can then take that as the foundation, foundational rocket that they could improve and use them to go to Mars. Mm -hmm. Great, great, great. I love it. And um, Bob. And, yeah. Sorry, Bob. You, uh, so Chinese uh, astronauts are actually called Ty taikonauts? Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I like Tycho. Tycho Cosmonauts is cool. Tycho Knots is cool. I guess astronauts is cool too. We're just used to it here. Right. It's it's like, like yeah, yeah, it's outdated. Yeah, yeah I cool. like it. Um, and then the other the other huge reason is just science. Just going to the moon for just pure science. And it's not just Tang science, right? Mm. It's not just that. <laughs> uh, astronaut Jessica Meir said. Uh, the samples that we collected during the Apollo missions changed the way we view our solar system. I think we can expect that from the Artemis program as well. Obviously, there's going to be tons and tons of new science coming out of these of these missions over over the next 20 years. The, the science that's going to flow from the moon back down to Earth mm -hmm. is going to be mm -hmm. is going to be amazing. It's unpredictable. Who knows what we're going to find? But we're always surprised with stuff like that. And if if, if history is any any precedent i think uh we're going to be even more amazed at what we discover on the moon from just a purely science perspective so um there's so many reasons to go to the moon first and i think it's not just going to be a, tr a training you know a, a, a training platform for mars it's going to be a, there's going to be a human settlement there for and there's lots of amazing things that could be done on the moon not and and uh from a science from point of view and from so many different points of view i th i think that that it's it's vi it's a good reason. I think going to the moon is a great idea, even if Mars wasn't even in the picture. I think going to the moon is is just a, a, fa a fascinating new journey for for humanity. That that's inevitable. It's inevitable. It's so close. Uh, there's so much we can learn and experience there that we can't on on the Earth. And I think we just need to go. Bob, there. we've talked before about the moon being the stepping stone to Mars. So is that Absolutely. still the, is that still totally. it, but is that still the case in a physical sense? Like we're going to yeah. launch the Mars mission from the moon. Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely, so. and that's one thing I wanted to cover. Also, the, the gateway station that that's going to be orbiting the moon. That 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 station um, is is you know it's going to be integral you know to the Artemis mission, and and it's going to be it's a way station. They're going to you know astronauts are going to ferry you know from the from that station to the moon, but it's also going to then be used as a way as a waypoint for going to Mars. Because mm -hmm. um, imagine now you're going to have lots of launches going to that to that station. And then the uh, the final, and then the rocket then will go to that station, and then load up, and then off to Mars. So that's so that that too is also going to be 
another thing that needs to be done and on the moon before. The, the big reason for that is the rocket equation, right? Chemical, you don't want yeah. to do one long trip if you can avoid it. If you could break a long trip up into multiple smaller trips, that's always much better. You know, the rocket equation essentially is that you need the fuel to carry the fuel to carry the fuel. And so it, mm -hmm. it, the amount of fuel you need for any trip, like if you, you could calculate, I want to go to from point A to point B in this amount of time, right? And that includes getting out of a gravity well. You can calculate how much fuel you need. Time is important because like we, you can go really far if you don't care if you get there in 20,000 years. You don't need a lot of fuel. Um, but if you want to get to Mars – you know, in, in uh, without overexposing your astronauts to cosmic rays, you want to get there as fast as possible. So actually, most of the energy to get from the Earth to Mars is still just getting, just out, getting of the out of Earth's, Earth. Earth's gravity well. So if you can get to the moon, you've already used a chunk of your, a big chunk of your fuel. Then you use a fresh ship with, with but you're not carrying the fuel to get the Mars right. off of Earth, right? You're only going to carry it firing from the moon so that's a no-brainer we get to the moon we've already spent most of our energy going yeah. anywhere mm -hmm. anywhere in the solar system you've already spent most of your energy going from the earth to the moon and then the moon really becomes our launching pad for everywhere else right that's the system that we have to get to assuming right. you're not going to be accelerating all the way or halfway to Mars. you know and imagine it's, if still, we, it's well, still a chemical rocket imagine right? if we're, we're using the, whole way. the moon's regolith to make the rocket fuel. The well, that's the other thing. Or, 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 or even the ice. The in situ ice, resources. Hydrogen, yeah, the, oxygen. Yeah. Is yeah. It, did you say in situ? I thought it was in situ. Whatever. It depends if you're carrying There's multiple ways to pronounce it. I say in situ, like situation. <laughs> situ, yeah. It, yeah. I find that scientists and, or sorry, I find that physicians tend to say situ and scientists tend to say situ. We're which scientists, is kind of so I'm wrong either way. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know, but like. I know what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. I oh, you could say sit too. That sounds a little weird, but you could say it. Yeah. No judgment. Parasaurolophus. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Kara. I can't. If you say <laughs> that word, my brain literally gets about a quarter of the way through it and then shuts down. Para. I love you so much, Dad. <laughs> All right, but Bob, so here's the, here's the devil's advocate question. Oh, boy. Ooh. Like you say, oh, we need to go to the moon in order to get to Mars, but you're just sort of kicking the can down the road. Like, why go to Mars then? The, the big, we know this, we've talked about this before. The big devil's advocate question is, why not just have robots do everything? Why put mm -hmm. people there at all? Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, like, humans are explorers. Yeah. It's, it's part of the, the way that we operate. And there is something romantically profound about traveling the universe. So romance. Is no, but it's it is the human condition, though. You know, like yeah, if you want to just look at it by the numbers, sure, we send we send machines. Machines can do science there and all that. But you know, as, as romantic as this sounds, what was cooler than putting people on the moon that humans have done? So, I agree with you, but I I think we need to go deeper because that's not enough. The cool I think, fact to sell it to say why we need to spend an order of magnitude more money to send people to do what robots could do much cheaper. Let's put that money into building better robots so that they'll be better able to. Yeah. So to the do question the boils things. down to is what can a person do that a robot can't do? Well, that's a well, that's one question. Yeah. That's not the question. That's mm -hmm. one question, and that's you know it remains to be seen um, because right now, uh, you know we. Yes, if you had a human scientist with instruments on Mars, they could react to what they're discovering, plan a follow-up experiment. You know what I mean? They could do that all right there. You don't have to say, oh, now we need to design another rover, and in 20 right, years missions. we'll be able right. to do the follow-up experiment to mm -hmm. what we just discovered. But, of course, you know, you, the, the co-argument is, well, well, robots will get better to do that. But I think, okay, sure, but we'll also get better at putting people into space at mm -hmm. the same time. And mm -hmm. as, you know, again, as we mentioned previously when we're talking about the book, it's, you know, um, we will be robots going into the space, right? That's we will uh, genetically yeah. engineer ourselves and we'll be cyborgs and whatever. So it's, should, should we send people or robots into space? The answer is yes. Both. We'll send both. We'll be both. And I think, <laughs> you know, developing the technology to have biological organisms um, basically inhabit the universe, mm -hmm. I think, is a reasonable goal. Because if we don't, 
we're limited to this one planet forever. At some point, we need to, you know... We're going to break it beyond repair at some point. Yeah, but even without that concern, even I don't think... See, I don't, see, threats. That's, that's not my argument. My argument yeah. is that we're going to destroy the Earth, so we've got to go elsewhere. I'm hoping that we don't destroy the Earth. Well, I don't think we're going to. Sure. I think eventually... We may make it shitty for a while, but I think, you know, as technology advances, etc., Earth's always going to be the home of humanity. And um, So even that argument aside... Um, why wouldn't we want to spread out into our own solar system? There's so much to do out there. There's so many resources. There's just so much to learn, so much science to do. And why should robots have all the fun? Yeah. I also think and that we want the, the ability to have human civilization spread to other locations. Yeah. You know, uh, there's, there's hundreds of billions of suns in our, in our own galaxy. And we have no idea how common life is. What if we're the only sentient race in the galaxy? It's a lot of space out there, you know, oh, that, yeah, that we could expand thought. into. Um, I personally like we could have a whole planet, worthwhile. Steve. We could have a whole planet where cows could just go crazy. Yeah, just go for it. Cow planet. Yeah. Well, we already cow we planet. Got, Mars is a robot planet. <coughs> it's absolutely True. a robot oh, planet. Yeah. I, you know, but when no. you say that, when you talk about like the fact that humans one day will merge with our technology and machines, like I, I totally agree with you. It bothers me that I, I'm never going to know what that is. I wish I could just see it. You know, what, what, mm -hmm. what human potential is. And the other thing is, no. I just hope that I live long enough. To see some human being have a a cybernetic limb that functions similar to the real thing, I don't know yeah. if we'll be able, if our, we're going to live long enough to see it, but I always wanted to see that. Well, it's you know we know that we can interface with those machines yeah. and and it's all the good. It's yeah all the hopeful. proof of principle is there. So and it's just at this point we just need incrementally better robotic limbs, inter incrementally better brain machine interfaces, but. They will work. We do have crude versions of that now. I, I don't know that, you know, we're going to pass some arbitrary threshold, but I think it's just, they're just going to get better and better. Yeah. To the point where they're going to be better than even our, you know, biological limbs at some point. And, and there's always the chance for a dramatic improvements in the technology, yeah. especially yeah. If when you bring in, you know, AIs into into the equation and, and the ability to to do some types of research very very quickly. That's true. Uh, that that's a good hanger. You know, we could always hope on that, Jay. Yep. Mm -hmm. So um, we we have the everyday astronaut. Uh, is he on deck? Not yet. I told him to log in about ten minutes early. Hold on, let me talk to him. He's still setting him up. Okay. Okay. So um, why don't we? <coughs> I don't want to get off because there's no point in starting a new topic and then right. Well, let's keep talking about this. Let's keep talking about this. Maybe we we could take a question or yeah. two from the chat. But one thing that wasn't addressed, I think, is the idea of of an ex existential threat. I mean, the yeah. Earth can be taken out. Yeah. I mean, we, we see a fast-moving a fast moving comet we could discover tomorrow, and we <coughs> could find that we are toast, and there's nothing we can do about it. Literally, the, the entire surface of the Earth, the entire lith lithosphere of the Earth will be magma in two years, and there's right. nothing we can do. We could find that out. Yeah. So, I mean, th I mean, there's lots of reasons that, that you enumerated, but also another decent reason is to have, you know, not all of your eggs in one basket. The moon's a have, lifeboat? You know, we can survive... You know, human culture and, and mm -hmm. genetic diversity, to some extent, can survive if we're not all on, on the Earth. And that's another, that's just one of the, one of the other reasons that, that, that I think can be used to support this idea of, you know, having yeah. a presence off of the Earth in, in some way. Yeah, I mean, I do subscribe to the view that, you know, humanity is a precious resource of the universe. You know, again, we, we don't know how rare we are, but I'm willing to bet we're pretty damn rare yeah. is my my sense. I and agree. that certainly could be true, even <laughs> much more so than, than we imagine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, at the universe would lose something if we were wiped out completely. Um, and I think we got to start thinking from like, and I mean this, from a real sociocultural social justice perspective. Yeah. Who goes and who doesn't? Because I think Don't Look Up, as much as it was like a bleak wow. and hilarious film, got it, like hit the nail on the head. Absolutely. Like we are the type of culture who is going to send our richest assholes into space. <laughs> and is that the way that we want to protect or facilitate? Well, but Kara, a... the problem is even if we sent the people that quote unquote were worthy, their children could be assholes. You know what I mean? Like, like what we need to do as a species. Oh, she didn't like what I said. I guess. <laughs> Let's blame Ian for this. <laughs> did, Ian, did Ian just watermelon, watermelon again? Uh, I, 
I hear what you're saying, no. Jay, but like we, <laughs> yes, people can just randomly be born assholes, but we are products of our culture. Yeah, uh, that's exactly families. where I was going with it. We need to Star Trek ourselves. We need a culture yeah. that respects itself profoundly. Mm. And re- that's what I'm saying. Yeah. And we need to be able to identify within our culture what we want to facilitate, what we want to prioritize. Because right now we prioritize capitalist um, power. We prioritize, we think that the best among us are the people who have like made the most money among us. And that's how our entire society um, is sort of geared. That's who gets all the power. That's who gets all the praise. That's who gets all of the um, opportunity. And if we continue this way, I think that we are going to really be replicating what we saw in that film. And, and, you know, there are a lot of sci-fi examples that I think kind of get it right. Mm-hmm. We, we send the sort of the richest and the most privileged into those positions. Yeah. And what does that leave? What, what, what are we then saying about what matters about our humanity? You know, this is like the exact opposite of Sagan and the Voyager disc. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's as absolute as you're saying, Kara. Obviously, you're right in that we, it's, it's a fact of history that power mm-hmm. and wealth gives you the power to secure more power and wealth. And so that's a yeah. feedback loop that has occurred in every society ever that humanity has yep. de- developed. Uh, and But I don't think that's it's an absolute statement. I think like the thing about the, uh, the don't look up is that the people who were getting on the ship and going away were fleeing a doomed earth, you know, but mm-hmm. hopefully we're not going to that's not going to be how this plays out that we have like hopefully we don't wait until that we don't wait until the last moment yeah i think that we who I, in fact i think that the you know the the, the pampered individuals probably are not going to be the people who want to make a trip to mars that's going to be really for rugged, rugged adventures. Explorers. Yeah, i mean i think so. yeah i mean you want to first of all you're going to survive the trip there <laughs> um which is in no small feat, and even just the psychological yeah. aspect of being in a ship for this six a months or whatever, cruiser. I don't know that I could do it. You know, uh, and, right? And but then I also think eking out an existence on Mars—that's not—that's not, that's not going to be the faint of heart or no. or the currently pampered. Your wealth isn't going to do you much good on Mars. I, I I agree and I disagree. Like, still the the <laughs> dialectic there that you're talking about is wealth and ruggedness. But the truth is, it's the wealthy and the rugged who historically have always been the explorers. So they're still pri- they're still the privileged class. They're just the rugged among the privileged class. Well, it's not. But it's, and, that's not that's not literally true though, because you do have also the 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 wealthy the class. Crew. Well, no, they could be the patrons of the explorer, like. Christopher Columbus True. wasn't wealthy. He just had to beg a queen for, for money. So I do think well, that... Well, he was still... But I'm saying he was still privileged class. He was still privileged <laughs> like class. Still the he, white dude yeah, with yeah. the power to be able to get a, a meeting with the queen. But I do... You know what I, I mean? do... That's what, what you're making an argument for is to make sure that there's, a, there's enough of a fair meritocracy in the mix. Yeah, that it's and, equitable. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. And yeah. I do think that that exists, at least that concept is not only exists in our society, it's increasing over time. It's not a it pure, is. you know, inevitable linear increase. But if you look at the broad, you know, brushstrokes of history, I do think that there's way more respect for, and all of our science fiction celebrates the the meritocracy. You know, not yeah, like and it's better denigrates now the than rich it's asshole. Ever been. Yeah, and I think it's only going to get better. It's still nowhere near. I agree. Where right, as, as a lot but, of things. But, right, as a lot of things are yeah. in our society. Hopefully, by the time it's relevant, you know, we'll. I think we'll know that we need to send competent people yeah. here. I mean, like, yes, the, every absolutely. Every one of the first people on Mars has to have probably several expertise oh, skills, that are yeah. Mad skills. useful. And that is not somebody who lived a privileged, pampered life. That is somebody who worked their ass off. So, right, right. 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 But, Bezos so we'll, should not be the first guy. Right, and exactly. <laughs> they happen to be rich, then, then so be it. They might be going along for the ride too. I mean, you know, it's that that's kind of uh, you see that a lot in that's science the fiction. Gross part. They always get a seat. They, they always get a seat, which yeah. means taking yeah. it away from someone yeah. else. And then they and then they somehow manage to let the monster out of the cage or whatever. Like they're they're the person. <laughs> Jurassic, yeah, Jurassic Park yeah. does yeah. the yeah. horrible kind of thing. That that too. <laughs> it's always the rich asshole that does it. You know. <laughs> oh, Tim, is he with us? Okay, Some call him Do you him think it's going to be... <coughs> Do you guys think it's going to be kind of like in Wally? Oh my I hope not. Oh my gosh, that's, that would be that's, awful. Yeah. That's How, a dystopian... That's, uh, that's horrific. <laughs> that's bad. Great movie. I, I gotta watch oh, great that. movie. 
They can't Hi, see everybody. you. They can only hear you. Oh, hi there. Hey, we can. Hey, hey, right. hey, let me hey. do the intro. So we are joined now by the everyday astronaut Tim. Welcome to the Skeptics Guide, man. <laughs> oh, thanks for having me on again. This is this is quite the treat. Yeah, I love how you for just us. like don't have a name. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's you just do, everyday. but yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny. I've actually got some friends that exclusively call me Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut. Like for anything, <laughs> they'll be like. Hey, Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut, can you grab something out of the fridge? <laughs> yeah. Like, no matter what. Yeah. And I adore them for that. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's like Phil, the bad astronomer. It's kind of this, you know, oh, yeah. the, the, the moniker, moniker takes over your persona. Your... So we were just spent the last half hour talking about whether or not we should send people back to the moon. What do you think? <laughs> oh, 100%. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hey, I'm dopey. Uh, yeah. We kind of rigged this, blown. Kara. We rigged this against you. Kat. I know, I know. Yeah, yeah we're we, like, what's we that, Kara? Humans. Kara, what's that? I you don't think we should less... send people back to the, to the moon? Hold on a second. Bring in the everyday astronaut. Tell her how I... she's wrong. Too. <laughs> and to be fair, I know he's wearing his Mars hat for everybody who can see him, but like, I'm a little different about the moon. I feel like, like anything else, it's never polar. There's always shades of gray. Yeah, of course. Moon, I'm more okay with than Mars. For sure. <laughs> oh boy. For sure. Mars is a long ways out. Yeah. But yeah. it's a good aspiration. Yeah. I mean, can Maybe. you imagine? It's a good people? aspiration that could have a lot of negative consequences societally. So we just need to. Yeah, keep but there's a flip to that too, Kara, because, you know, in, historically, <laughs> NASA's efforts have produced amazing, useful technologies that, we, that we're using right now. Listen, I completely agree, but I think when you take the long view and the global picture, when you look at um, imperialism and, expo and exploration, there's a lot of good stuff that came from it, but there's also a ton of devastation that there we sweep was under the rug. Well, think, and I think we need to look at both of those things within the same frame. But at least they're not, you know, Mars isn't populated by people that yeah, we're going to step on. Yeah, that's the big on, thing. You know, it might be, if we have to very quickly... it might quickly, have microbes, we don't know. We have I'm to just very saying. quickly determine whether or not Mars has life. Trying to figure that out right now. If Mars does yeah. not have life... It's a rock, and we could do whatever the hell we want with it. That's right. If it has <laughs> life, if it, it has life, then that's a that's right. a it's huge still a rock with life. And mineral or mineral plus that's animal. That's what I'm that's saying. I think historically, <laughs> the, the perspective has always been that life doesn't count because it's not the same as our. I don't life. think that I, that's that, what that's will happen. Lo that's long been the view. I don't yeah, think that's, that's what will changed. happen. Even Carl Sagan said, even if we find tiny little bugs on Mars, Mars belongs to the Martians. And I think but that's, that's because Carl Sagan is awesome. And but, I don't but think that's his culture. But the, been awesome yeah. this. but the missions being conducted right now are looking for this ex to answer this exact yeah. question. Yeah. And we're going to get right. the samples really, back. And, and what's important is the drill samples are being cached completely so that even if we do have any, you know, extra interference or we accidentally contaminate the planet in some way, we at least have those as like a real good proof is in the pudding in our little canisters. Yeah. You know, that's. That's very important. Yeah, yeah. What, so tell us, what, what's your bottom line on the Artemis program? What do you, how do you feel about it? I think, okay, so, it, I mean, in <laughs> general, I'm very happy about Artemis. And I think it's it's a, an important step to finally start exploring beyond low Earth orbit again for the first time in, you know, almost 50 years. Yeah. Which is just crazy to think about. Like, we, we mm. literally, 50 years ago, you know, we were doing stuff that we just haven't done since and that just it feels so backwards to me it feels like uh you know like humans are have gone backwards in time almost um so i personally am a really big fan of anything that that even if it's a slow march forward at least you know goes in that direction and the artemis program is is you know for better or worse kind of uh currently revolving around the sls rocket and the orion capsule and although those are, you know, over budget and, and the slow programs in general, I am still a big fan of the fact that, you know, it survived three administration changes now. That's and uh, yeah. that's a big deal. And then uh, that they're also working with commercial partners for things like the Lunar Lander, the Eclipse missions that which will be uh, just Lunar Explorers, you know, little. It, so it's heavily rooted in, you know, in these commercial partners. And I think it's just set up in a way that will go more and more that way. But for now, you kind of have that backbone of having the option of humans getting on a more traditional rocket right. and a more mm -hmm. traditional. And at least it's like a, we know at least this is going to be progressing forward. And we know like, even if it's slow, at least like it's, it's moving. It is moving, you know? Yeah. We have to separate the Artemis mission from the SLS launch system. The Artemis mission is the mission to go to the moon and do what they want to do on the moon. The SLS launch system is what they're using to get there. Yeah. But that doesn't mean they always have to use the SLS. Right. I mean, we're kind of committed for now, because we've already, yeah. you know, 
dumped yeah. a lot of money into it and it's it's ready it's on the launch pad you know had to skirt the the hurricane but other than that they're they're, <laughs> they're ready to go um but i agree i mean it does look like i know like, like just a few i mean you probably you know heard about this probably even wrote about it like the nasa is soliciting more submissions for lunar landers you know i know that they already did they they officially contract with spacex to use yes yeah. yes as of last year i think they were the sole <laughs> procurement out of three options last year but they but they're was... they're asking for more they want more options they do, and they they originally most people thought they would down select to two. So it was actually a pretty big shock when they only were able to select um, SpaceX, and most of that was because of the price. You know, SpaceX was by far the cheapest option, despite being um, almost a hundred times more capable than the than the next options, or, or ten times more capable than the next. Why options. was that? How were they able to do it so cheaply? Their Starship vehicle is just so absurdly, so much larger, bigger, more. It's just a way bigger platform. And, you know, the, the scale at which not only they're building, but even manufacturing things is just kind of on a whole different. It's a whole different ballgame. I mean, the, the Raptor engines, they're I, I don't even I can't keep track of how many they built already. It's it's over 100. It might even I don't even remember. It might be wow. like 150 or something. Really? And that's an engine that really just started doing stuff about three years ago. So in rocket terms. This is like insane pace that, I mean, they're building almost one a day at this point. Jeez. Yeah. And it's Literally. also yeah. deliberately designed to be cheap and reusable. I mean, yeah. at one point Musk said, we could use like a carbon polymer and that would be lighter and everything, but you know, steel's really cheap. And so they're, <laughs> they're just building that of, you know, high grade steel of the right kind, you know, to, for the, what they needed for. And steel is still a great material, you know. It, it, mm -hmm. So, but but the but the the choice was because it's che the cheapest thing that will get the job done, right? So it shouldn't it, shouldn't every rocket be utilizing that kind of mentality? Well, shouldn't Kara, we the, be the, trying to make everything. Cheap? The difference between a private company and the government is profound. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's red tape. You know, when it's you bureaucracy. think about like what yeah. what um SpaceX has been able to achieve. Just in the idea of reusability, just in that concept alone, mm -hmm. the reusability saves. I mean, it's going to easily save trillions of dollars down the road. It's, it's a, it's but the massive. messed up thing is like it's a private company that's just using this public funding. <laughs> so it's like this weird thing where the money coming in is the same. They're still taxpayer dollars coming in, but then they're able to do everything without the kind of government regulation and bureaucracy. Yeah. But correct me if I'm wrong. There are though, two that, things. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, there's just kind of two things that are that are a little bit different specifically about the, the so basically SpaceX would be doing Starship with or without uh, the government at all with or without a dollar from NASA. Um, as a matter of fact, they're actually beyond matching their contribution to the lander is substantially more than NASA's contribution, which is really backwards. And it's because SpaceX really believes that this is going to be their commercial platform to make you know, this is their this is their bread and butter now. This is going to make it so their Falcon 9, which is already the cheapest, most prolific mm -hmm. launch vehicle right now, will look like a child's toy because it will be able to be, you know, five to ten times more capable um, and and fully reusable. So it could bring the cost down by an order of magnitude or more. Is that so match they, overall or is it just for this project? Because, I, I mean, like money's fungible. They take a lot of money from NASA, do they not? Yeah, they've they've won a lot of contracts from NASA, yeah. and so and overall, like what percentage of their of their funding well, is Elon Musk had to beginning... finance SpaceX for years through failure yeah, yeah, without that's any... true. so that that the, the startup costs almost bankrupted him. But he's like, keep going, keep going, we'll get there eventually. Yeah, the Howard Hughes approach. And that, so it would be interesting it, to see the accounting overall yeah. over all this time. So now. I can but, give you a sense of that. Four point mm -hmm. three billion was basically the original contribution from NASA to win. Uh, is is how they got the Falcon 9 developed and the the Dragon capsule originally developed was because and then they were they were trying to get out of they they originally were flying the Falcon 1 when they finally did launch it on their fourth attempt and made it to orbit that was like every penny was in already like a hundred percent every single you know per private dollar and, and investors dollars were one hundred percent in on that rocket if that rocket failed SpaceX would not be a thing anymore mm -hmm. because they won that they ended up winning uh another other contracts and they then they were able to uh the first commercial it was at the time of cot cots program uh commercial orbital transportation services which turned into the crs commercial resupply missions um and so they were one of at first three one of the companies failed uh, north of grumman is still the other company that's procuring and and resupplying the international space station currently and then again that that went into a, another round which is the commercial crew program which is what we're in now with the crew dragon capsule 
and Boeing Starliner is the other option that still has not yet to date flown people. Um, and the big thing there is, you know, Boeing won almost two times as much money as SpaceX, uh, most of it for timeline assurance purposes. And despite that, they still haven't flown anyone to date. Mm-hmm. And SpaceX Yikes. has sent, they're all, we're about to send their fifth crew to the International Space Station already. Wow. wow. So, so if you were to put like a, I mean, you probably can't do this quick and dirty on the back of a napkin, but if you were to put like a percentage of like how much of SpaceX overall, their, um, their revenue has been self-funded by Elon himself, has been other contracts like purely commercially gained and then coming in from NASA, would you say it's like a third, a third, a third? So we can count. So they, they do uh, three to four, about four resupply missions each year with NASA and they do um, they're basically doing every six months with dra- Crew Dragon. So there's six missions a year. Um, and then every now and then they win things like Lucy and a few other things. So probably eight or nine launches are NASA launches most, most of the time. And those are, you know, those are at cost plus contracting. No, those are, I mean, uh, fixed price contracting. So a, a bid. Um, and then these days, though, SpaceX is going to be launching probably pretty close to 60 launches this year. Holy, the is that vast- from Starlink? most of it's Starlink. Yeah. Okay. And Probably. so that's, is that making them bank right now? Or are they still self-funding that and hoping to see still the money on the back Still self-funding it gotcha. and seeing it as like, well, now it's going to be this kind of backbone for so much of, mm-hmm. of the internet. I mean, you know, already mm-hmm. we're seeing T-Mobile wanting to use Starlink to be able to um, use a little bit of their little slice of, of bandwidth to be able to basically make it so any T-Mobile customer could potentially use their phone anywhere. Mm-hmm. I have a lot um, of friends who are living in like rural parts of Europe who are already Starlink subscribers because yeah. it's like just, it's so much better than anything they had previously. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's, it's just the beginning, you know, the, this is like the Starlink literally 1.0 or 1.5 um, and these Starlink 2.0 satellites that are meant to launch on Starship, which is the big reason why they're pushing for Starship. Uh, mm-hmm. is to get these much bigger, much more capable satellites. And that will be what's completely changes the game on, right. on all of this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Fascinating. Right. So they really want, they really want the, mm-hmm. uh, the starship to be their heavy lift rocket. Yeah. And it's going to take over. I mean, as soon as that thing's flying regularly, of course there'll be some, you know, some missions are just too vital to put on anything other, like, you know, if a, a no department of defense right? mission, Exactly, exactly. If there's a military satellite or something that's already been designed and built and is and paid for a Falcon Heavy uh, launch, it's going to be on a Falcon Heavy launch or a Falcon 9 launch. There's going to be a handful of those. So you'll see it taper off, though, because obviously the price price wins out at some point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, new customers will very quickly be signing up for, for Starship. Mm-hmm. They actually already have. Like, there's already customers. That's how far along they think they are, SpaceX and their customers believe, you know, we're within like earshot of Starship actually being an operational rocket. Uh, to me, it feels like we'll probably see some big booms here. We'll see some some big failures as they test. The, you know, just the way they test things is like it's good enough to see if we can get data out of it and see if you know yeah. does it survive this initial phase? Can it survive reentry? And it will be a little while before I think we see it be operational and be something that you know is flying important payloads other than their own just Starlink stuff because they don't care if they blow up their own Starlinks. It's not a big deal. But I think it's going to be you know, probably two years before we see two to three years before we see Starship really like becoming a routine thing like Falcon 9 is now. Mm -hmm. That'll be fantastic. I mean, it's just good to have multiple companies that have the infrastructure, you know, because there'll be competition, which will help the price go down. And then the more companies that are building it, you know, they're building spacecraft, the whole spacecraft industry will become less expensive. Just it'll be more ubiquitous and it'll be a part of everyday life, you know. 60 launches mm-hmm. is so many launches. When you think about like 20 years ago, if we talked about a company launching 60 launches in one year, that number just seems way too high. You know, but yeah. it, it isn't. It, it's happening and, it, and we're lucky that it's there. Mm. And next year they're going for 100 and I absolutely oh. believe it. I think, you know, oh, two years ago, if you said, you know, if Elon goes, we're going to do 100 launches, I'd be like, yeah, oh, this is like the most hilariously optimistic Elon thing he could have ever said, but. Now I told when they say they're going to do 100 launches, seeing their pace now, it's like, yeah, they yeah. can absolutely probably do 100 next year. That was a good Elon impression. <laughs> <laughs> and the SLS is one per year. Uh, one per year at best. And between mm-hmm. Artemis 1 and Artemis 2, which will be the first time they put crew on board, uh, it'll be two years. Mm-hmm. There's a two-year gap. Yeah. And oh some God. of that is because uh, the, the vehicle, I think at this point, the SLS will be ready. The next SLS will be ready. But um, they're actually reusing some of the avionics 
from mm-hmm. the Orion capsule. Yeah. Oh. So, um, so it's not like they're relying on it because I guess they do have another set of avionics that they had to, you know, take it off from Artemis three and bring it on board or whatever. But that is actually a, one of the turnaround things is it takes 20 months between splashdown and having the Artemis two Orion capsule be ready with that set of avionics. That's my, that's so, mind blowing when you compare wow. that to what's, what, you know, what SpaceX is doing. Mm-hmm. It's like SpaceX is an order of magnitude more fleet of foot and capable, you know? And I, I just feel like even though we've dumped a ton of money into it, like they're gonna, they are Two going to be shifting over to, to SpaceX and whatever other company is going to be out there because NASA just doesn't have the infrastructure, I guess. They just don't have the, the bandwidth to do what SpaceX is doing. Well, NASA shouldn't. NASA, you know, NASA mm-hmm. should not be developing and operating a rocket, just like the FAA does not operate aircraft. You know, the mm-hmm. FAA is not out there with our own, like, imagine if they ran, like, FedEx and had to run American Airlines and work. Delta, like, wouldn't work. it would be terrible. If they developed their own airplanes and had to operate them, and it, it'd be, Can't it'd be it. terrible, you yeah. know? Like, yeah. And that's, and that's what basically what NASA had had to do in the past, just because there weren't there commercial weren't options. Companies. It was that's too right. big of an investment up front. You know, we're talking about billions and billions of dollars to get especially like you know we, we see small set launchers like you know rocket lab firefly astra you know all these new small set launchers but they're you know they're maybe in like the hundreds of millions of invest initial investment to get a, a, or, a small orbital rocket but to get an orbital rocket capable of carrying people to certify it for human space flight all of these things i mean we're talking in the billions yeah and we just didn't have you know there wasn't the funding for that you know 10 20 years ago so it was an evil, a necessary evil, really, for NASA to be doing the ones, uh, you know, building and designing and operating rockets. But it's just not the. They shouldn't be doing that anymore. I'd much rather my taxpayer dollars get spent towards science missions and exploration and Earth, you know, mm. Earth sciences and things like that. And I think, um, you know, they're better off being a customer to yeah, a commercial. For sure. Yeah, yeah. Now the rocket. the Starship can go to the moon, right? I mean, if it, it big enough that it could launch off the Earth and go to the moon. After refueling in orbit, it has to refuel in orbit, and yes. is that going it's, to be possible? When's that? When is that going to be possible? I guess I should say that's like one of the very first things they're going to have to figure out because obviously with the Artemis program, they're relying on this vehicle being able to land on the moon. So yeah. you have right there, you know, you have uh, <laughs> <laughs> one of their big contracts for the thing is relying on this orbital refueling, and orbital refueling has not been done with cryogenics at this scale at all. I don't know if it's actually ever, if there's been cryogenic transfer really between two vehicles. Ever. So that's one of the things they have to test out. Mm-hmm. And initially, it's going to be just literally transferring it between two different tanks, between yeah. the header tank yeah. and the main tank. Um, then they actually want to contract for that as well. Tim, do you but, know? Um, I'm sorry, keep going. I was just going to say, so yeah, so it does require, it's it has such a heavy dry mass. You know, it's carrying around those flaps and all the, and the heat shield, all that stuff. Taking that out to the moon is not the most efficient way to get to the moon. Uh, but you can brute force it by refueling. And bit. and the using the Starship as a lander that they're just going to get a couple of the starships to like to lunar orbit and keep them there to go up and down from the moon. Is that the idea? So it's, a, it's still actually quite confusing, honestly, even yeah. for me. Um, huh. So they, they're making a bespoke version of starship that does not have, you know, landing or does not have the big flaps and a heat shield because you'll never need it. If you're just, you know, between the earth moon system and, and never coming back, but I'm still not entirely sure how it gets from on the moon back into lunar orbit and how, you know, how, when's it exactly hook up with the Orion capsule? How is it refuel? Where is it refuel? I mean, I, these are the things that we hope to learn in the near future, you know? Yeah, I've, I've been able to wrap my head around it either. I have so, so many questions that I can't find the answers to anywhere. Well, what does that tell you that the answers don't seem to be out there? That, that, Not that, ready that they're probably as, almost as clueless as we are about how it's going to be solved? That's, that's scary. I think <laughs> there's, well, there's definitely like a lot of, um, you know, especially the way SpaceX does things that they're, they don't, typically go too far into the, I mean, obviously they have big aspirations like let's land on Mars. That's ridiculous for now, but you know, they're really looking at what can we do absolute next step? You know, like right now it's like, let's try to get our full stack off the ground. Yeah. It might blow up soon after it leaves the ground, but we want to get all 33 Raptor engines firing and fly. And so for them, I think that's literally like most of the companies just focusing on that one thing, especially if you're yeah. on the Starship program. And then, you know, from there you can, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to get ahead of yourself, like the waterfall method of, you know, of, Pro, computer programming where you don't want to get like 10 steps ahead because what if step three changes and you have a big change then all that work you did on step 10 is now yeah, is totally. negated 
I was so, wondering, you know, yeah. thinking about that, this, a ship that big, to me, you know, craft landing on the moon, they're small and they're very dodgy, you know, like, but they want to land a big spaceship on the moon. Tim, do you know, are they going to actually have to build like a stable launch pad for this thing to land on? That's not currently in the plans as far as I know. The only people that I know was working on some, I think, was it actually Mastin? Maybe my uh, Discord will remind me, but someone was actually working on a system that would, uh, you basically inject into the exhaust plume of your rocket engine. You would eject like a, a concrete, basically. What? And it, at, <laughs> as it like is landing, it's literally Drop creating its pad. own landing Holy pad. Moly. That wow. is freaking science fiction awesome. And if they could do yeah. that, could you imagine? <laughs> That was the theory, and I, unfortunately, Masson just went under. And Masson had some of the coolest engineers and some of the coolest ideas, in my opinion. So I'm really sad that they that well, they someone just went else under. will grab those people and hopefully, but I just yes. bring them into their fold. Exactly. I did read something where they were talking about having to create some type of landing gear for the moon. That was specific, like SpaceX was saying that. But then well, it, it hit me like, yeah, but what are we talking about? Because that's a big ship. It's very different. It's a very different landing feat, you know, like on the moon. The other thing, too, is like, you know, historically, we didn't land where we said we were going to land on the moon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lucky they landed. So 11 seconds of fuel. Yeah. Yeah. Seven, yeah. I think. <laughs> Just a few more seconds. So there's a, there's a few things there. Um, that A lot of the landing stuff, that's why the CLIPS missions, the commercial LEO something something partner systems or whatever, their job is to literally like scout out the landing spots first. Um, and they're going to be sent off to, I think there's a, there's a lot of them. I think, I don't remember how many, like almost half a dozen or a, something like that, at least, um, that are all different lunar landers that will be checking out different landing spots all in the South pole of the moon. Uh, so hopefully that it gives, you know, scientists, uh, a lot better sense of actually where they're landing, if it's safe to land, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, map out some of the topography a little bit more accurately. Uh, but with Starship, so the thing is right now, the normal you, Starship is kind of like a whole fleet of potential rockets you know you have the normal starship that's going to be deploying satellites or whatever in low earth orbit you'll have a you know a resupply version of starship you'll have uh, potentially a, a, an expendable version of starship for like going to jupiter or something you know, where the upper stage is just expended but the the lunar lander specifically will have huge will have to have big landing gear with a pretty wide stance because this thing is you know 150 wait uh, 50 meters tall sorry yeah, so yeah. 165 feet tall so it's so, you know, that's that's a high center of mass uh, with, you know, the crew crew cabin up top. So it's you definitely have to have a way to have a wide stance and be able to level it out. And the other consideration for a long time, they're talking about having thrusters, the landing engines actually on the top of the rocket so that it diffuses the uh, the exhaust and doesn't create like a giant crater with exactly. its main engines. Yeah, because that, those engines would it would blast Blow the, the hell out of the all over the place. Yeah. And how do they yeah. get down from the crew cabin at the top to, to 165 feet down to the moon? They just jump out. <laughs> <laughs> and in a few minutes, they land. That's the one six gravity. It'd be like falling from like 10 meters. Yeah, you know, it's yeah, uh, that's not going to work. Um, there's Pretty actually cute. a huge elevator. Like literally, uh, the concepts that we've seen is like the side of it opens up and there's a giant like just cargo elevator. That's and cool. Yeah, that's hook yourself cool. up yeah, and oh take God, the ride down. Send a, a ship with a camera so we could watch that whole thing happen. It'd be like man. a conveyor is... belt. You clip yourself to a conveyor belt, it will carry you down. I would imagine that is 1950s I mean, science fiction. That is so awesome. Like it, it is. Uh, it is. It's like retro future almost because, like that, you know, that's what we envisioned was it would have these massive ships that have like cranes and all these you know cool things and just deploy stuff on the moon is no big deal. And I, 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 that's when you have this size and the scale of a vehicle you're talking about. That literally is kind of the stuff that you have to employ. Yeah. And at the, and at the end of the game, like at the end of the day, that, that's relatively primitive, like a, an elevator. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's, Sounds that's like, a yeah. pretty primitive thing. Yeah. But obviously that elevator needs to work, yeah. <laughs> you know, in the lunar environment with, with dust and regular dust. And all that stuff. Yeah. I oh, guess the, the backup system would Or is be... it like all high tech? Like, couldn't they just do like a cranky crank yeah. crank? Yeah. Hopefully they have like a backup, like a manual right. backup. I'm yeah. guessing, but I'm not. To, no to. details have been talked about mm. at all with that. <laughs> you imagine some renders. They get all the way there and a freaking elevator doesn't work. Right? You, well, would re you just yeah, repel. Like, you church, just, church. just repel yeah. down the side of the ship. You're good. Well, here's the real question: Will the elevator have Muzak while they're yeah. descending? <laughs> oh, <gosh. laughs> it better, it better. It just automatically sinks Bluetooth and it's just some. Yeah, <laughs> just horrible music. That'd be awesome. So Tim, we we um, invited you on. 
another reason was we, you know, we have a new book coming out. T Steve, show him the cover of the book. Now I have <laughs> a, a copies being sent to you, by the way, I told you. I can't wait. Um, so there are some chapters in here that I think you'll be interested in that we wanted to, uh, to discuss with you. So Steve, what, what would be the top one? Well, I mean, you know, we have a whole section on space travel. So a anything in there <laughs> would, would be, uh, you know. Now here, so here's a question that we address uh, in the book. Now, I don't know how much you get into, like, the future of space travel, like beyond existing technology. But we'd spend a lot of time thinking about that. What's, what's the infrastructure going to look like, not only in 10 or 20 or 50 years, which we, what we've been talking about, but then where do we go from there and where do we go from there? So what, I don't know, have you thought about that much? Like, what, what do you, where do you think we're headed? Like, when we're zipping around the solar system, wh what kind of ships are we going to be using? What would you say? Do you want, like, a 10, 10 50, and 100-year yeah. prediction? Yeah, 10, 50, yeah. and 100. Okay. Perfect. And, and then okay. a 1,000-year then a <laughs> prediction. Start. <laughs> okay. <you> <laughs> 10 year, I think in the big thing, the big hurdle right now is just getting the cost of getting to space down, period. And that is happening. So I think in 10 years, hopefully the idea of, of putting something into LEO, into low Earth orbit, you know, even if it's a large, you know, new space station is not so insane that it's just, you know, in, impossible with our capital now. Um, so that opens up the doors of, of heavier and heavier, uh, you know, bigger, heavier things. You can have cheap space hotels, you know, cheap being still yeah. hundreds of millions, but not like billions, you know, um, and you know, things like that will open up. But I think that even makes it so, uh, as Bob might have whispered under his breath, nuclear engines. Mm -hmm. I would I would love to see uh, if there is a resurgence of, of nuclear capabilities. Both the United States and the Soviet Union fully developed uh, nuclear rocket engines. Um, they're amazing. <laughs> There's no reason we shouldn't be using them, especially. It doesn't make a ton of sense in the Earth-Moon system. But as soon as you leave Earth, uh, well, uh, a nuclear rocket engine. <laughs> well, from from what I've read, though, there, there's a real push now for nuclear rockets in the cislunar space because that is such a strategic space. And with China, you know, China's is trying to do it as well. And and there, from what I've read, the idea is that you, you know, if something happens, you need to move a lot of mass very quickly to a different space in within cislunar space. And chemical rockets are just not going to be able to handle that. And you need something like a nuclear rocket to move, a, a, say, a big satellite from there to there. And uh, so, I mean, they're, the plan, I mean, you're right. We have done a lot of research in the 60s and 70s. We had it. We, we had the rockets. We were, they were being tested. But now they're really, they're developing them now and plan on having test beds in orbit. You know, at this decade, uh, they're really pushing for it. And it's really the push for cislunar, control of cislunar space. And I think that's going to be the big, the big push for nuclear rockets. And from what, and NASA's involved, from what, from what I've learned, NASA's involved. They've, they've got their, their hands in it because they want to then take that rocket that's good for cislunar space and then develop it a little farther to ha actually go to Mars with it type of scenario. So that, that, that's my understanding. And I, so I'm really the, the, hopeful about nuclear rockets in, in the next 10 to 20 years. Actually. The big problem with nuclear rockets, though, is uh, there's, well, there's two things. They, they run on hydrogen and obviously liquid hydrogen. Uh, the, it has no oxidizer. All you're doing is you're heating up hydrogen with, uh, you know, with nuclear fission. Um, and so hydrogen likes to boil off. So you really can't, it's not great for long term. If you're trying to sit it on a satellite for decades, uh, it's going to take a lot of energy just to keep that hydrogen in a liquid state. It's going to mm. want to boil off in a hurry. Mm. So, right. uh, you know, it, it's, it's really uncommon to have, you know, like there's ACEs upper stage and a few other upper stages that are looking into like literally having basically a, an internal combustion engine that just sits there and recondenses the hydrogen constantly on orbit. But, you know, it's also really heavy. The, the yep. Nerva engine that the United States developed yep. was so heavy, the only vehicle that could lift it into orbit and the stage accompanying it was the Saturn V. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we'll, it was yeah, we'll be using huge. chemical rockets for launching for a long time. It's oh, yeah. just it, the thrust is just off the hook and and uh, nuclear rockets. You know, you know, I haven't seen any plans on using nuclear rockets for an actual launch system. It, it, usually they spew yeah, out no. too much radiation. Yeah. I, I did yeah. read about a plan that was feasible, but it's like it's super, you know, that's in farther, much farther in the future. We'll, we'll be using chemical rockets for sure. But what about resupplying if, if, if hydrogen? boil off is an issue. I mean, I would think just resupplying that uh, in cislunar orbit somewhere between Earth-Moon system just to, to resupply that um, it seems feasible. 
the the big thing like i think in my opinion um nuclear will be great for sending large you know you get just get a bigger rocket out to your cis lunar system or get a, a bigger satellite you know like it'll do the translunar injection no problem you know you can lift say two to three times more mass because you're using a nuclear engine as your right. kick stage to get out there but then ditch that big heavy thing you have way more you use a, a storable propellant you know like a like a, a bi-propellant something that's hydrazine based or something can last decades like right. voyager you know um, and, and then, and, or use, you know, Xeon, use ion thrusters because ion thrusters are, are even more efficient. You know, we're talking mm -hmm. super thousands efficient, but... of seconds of specific impulse instead of yeah. high eight hundreds, nine hundreds. Yeah. But the acceleration, so just... the acceleration sh is shit. I mean, you don't want to, you can't, be, you can't move a lot of mass quickly, which, which with using an ion engine, right? You can't, that's just not going to happen. I mean, the thrust is like the equivalent. What's the iconic example, a piece of paper on your, on your on your finger, that's, that's, that's the kind of acceleration, but it builds up and builds up and over weeks yeah. and months, you can have tremendously efficient and you can attain a, a, a lot of a pretty intense velocity. But my understanding of cislunar space is you need to move a lot of mass fast and nuclear rockets, they say, is the way to do it. And, uh, and that's what they're shooting for. And uh, it's unfortunately, you know, it's, it might take something like competition against China to make this happen, and that's unfortunate. But I'm happy that they we may end up with some nuclear rocket technology that we can then have NASA parlay into something that we could extend into the outer solar system, which is what oh, which is what we need. Because uh, you know, waiting a decade right. to get to so Pluto what do you think about a hundred years from now? <laughs> All right, oh, that's fine. Yeah, that's true. Okay, how about so fifty? A little bit like more near future. I think we'll just see. We could potentially just see huge, huge, huge things in space. Uh, I think you know nuclear will be great. I think rotation detonation engines are another thing we'll see in the relatively near future. Ah. Um, those are basically engines that don't. You know, like ro rocket engine doesn't actually have any explosions. It's all just a deflagration. It's all uh, high energy gas, high pressure, hot gas that's flowing really quickly through a D-Lavel nozzle. Um, but a, a rotation detonation engine literally takes and detonates fuel intentionally, but it propagates in, in a circle this detonation continually, almost around like a, an aero spike, which is another love of mine. And uh, that makes it so it can be substantially more efficient and makes it so the exhaust is coming out already at hypersonic velocities. Mm -hmm. So it's, or potentially a hypersonic thing. So it's, um, that was, it would be a technology I'd love to see. But I think by then, you know, just hanging out in space, I, I just really think in 50 years, we'll definitely have some substantial, like it won't be a big deal to go to space. But I think it's only, I think we're still going to be using scaled up cheaper versions of what we see today basically i don't think in 50 years we're going to have some huge breakthrough yet i think it's still going to be i mean physics is physics and until we figure something out you know we're just going to be kind of using bigger cheaper uh so, more commercially available options of what so we chemical have rockets so for that. the next 50 years chemical rockets still um yeah i i, yeah. I hope not. i hope you're wrong because i i'm hoping for a bunch bigger well a nuclear, nuclear engine rocket. is it Nuclear is a still a chemical rocket. I mean, ish. It doesn't have a chemical reaction, but we're using traditional propellants. Yeah. Well, it's not okay. like a new... Yeah, we don't. Yeah, I, I, chemical. Yeah, from, yeah, we don't. Dis, we don't describe it that way because chemical rocket and then nuclear rocket and then then beyond then that fusion. Um, yeah, yeah, fusion, we, fusion. Yeah, we. Get, I think. We, yeah, we have to have a, a lot of different kinds of rockets. Everything optimized for its specific function because you know we, can, we can't. Rather than trying to have one size fits all, there's just too many specific things we need to do. What do, what do you think of the role of uh, solar or light sails? I, it'd be it'll be uh, interesting if if uh, light sails, you know, the things like light sails are exciting. You know, obviously we've, there's a handful that have been flown so far, um, but you know they're really 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 limited right now. Like they just you have to have something insanely massive yeah. and fold out big mm -hmm. fragile thing just to fly around like a shoebox. You know what I mean? It's 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 really hard to scale that up. Uh, but things like pointing a bunch of lasers, a huge laser array at like a reflector and shooting that off like to another star or something. Yeah. Yes. Yep. I hope that's something we see in the next 50 years. Yeah. Be, that's our yeah. best chance to, to get there in the next couple of generations is that type of, that type of technology. Chemicals not going to do it. No, 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 no. That's where definitely not. You got to have some, you know, light propulsion type of thing. And, and hopefully in after 50 years, you know, hopefully we have a better understanding of physics and we learn how to, you know, potentially exploit physics, you know, or something like that, you know, because I feel like we're still making a lot of discoveries about, you know, our understanding of our place amongst the mm -hmm. stars, among, you know, all everything, you know, Higgs boson type of things. And who knows, we might finally understand how to open up like a wormhole in yeah, yeah. a couple well, hundred years. Yeah, I'm not, yeah, yeah that, that would be wonderful. Thousand, but, um, yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> that's, I'm trying not to like, get my hopes up for that. <laughs> right. I won't be around for it. I won't be around for how, it. How long do you I think, think it's going? How long do you think it's going to take us to land a person on Mars? I used to say 2030. I actually thought there's a decent chance that humans would walk on Mars in 2030. I'm starting to get I'm oh boy. I'm getting a bit worn down right now from Scrub City basically. Um, you know, watching Artemis Scrub, watching Starship yeah. take longer than yeah. than anticipated, watching I mean just things just take a long time. Yeah. So I'm not as optimistic about 2030 anyway as <clears throat> as optimistic about 2030s as I used to be. I think it'll probably be in the 2030s. In the like 2030s. 30s. Ooh, That'd be nice. 5? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay. That's really, I don't know. Though. It sounds a little optimistic, huh? but I hope you're right. It, it really Damn. isn't that far off if you think about it. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about mm-hmm. just over a decade. But that, yeah, that requires a lot of things go well and on time. Yeah. yeah. Pretty yeah. much between yeah. now Unexpected and Unexpected delays. We get the James Webb the, syndrome. The tail of the dragon is just hard to predict, though, when you have, you know, it, again, like if you had tried to predict the success of the Falcon 9 before they had landed a Falcon 9 in 2015, like July of 2015. Actually, here we go. June 2015, when they blew up. Uh, CRS seven. This is uh, I, I think it was like June thirty first or something, twenty fifteen. Uh, they they lost a Falcon nine in flight, and if you try to predict then like what's twenty twenty two going to look like, I don't think anyone in their mind would have said, oh, they'll be flying these things fourteen times, yeah, with minimal refurbishment, and they'll be flying sixty times that year with the Falcon nine. Yeah, like there's just no way. And you know, even trying to predict what's going to happen in five more years from now is just really hard to predict. And, and companies like Rocket Lab too. I mean, they're they're launching. They they had a turnaround time of like 15 days recently, and they you know, and they're starting to kick butt and ramp up too. So it's just really hard to predict these curves, yeah. you know, yeah. because it, yeah. it it, it kind of sneaks up on you, and, and you you could be off by two years, and on either side of that, and be completely off by an order of magnitude. You know, it's yeah, just yeah, yeah. Four well, hours. Well, Tim, it's been wonderful having you no, on the show. No, Tim can't go. Why not? Because we, <laughs> our audience, oh, Jay I am not. I didn't get to to bromance him yet. All right, go ahead. No, but we, <laughs> our, our audience uh, has some questions for Tim. All right. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Go. Let's go. All right, they're gonna get. Okay. We're gonna get those in a second. So while we're Ian, Ian's getting the audience questions lined up for us, so I could I can ask you a few of them. But Tim, what is your favorite thing about what we have coming up? it's all big and exciting that's what's like it's it's for me like i missed you know i'm way too young to see the saturn five um i technically obviously you know grew up in the space shuttle era i'm 37 so um i grew up in the space shuttle era but i didn't really care when the space shuttle was flying but i've wanted to see you know i I actually did technically i saw i was on vacation with my dad when i was like my with my family when i was like five and a half and i remember my dad took me outside in the parking lot of the hotel we were staying in and i actually saw hubble launch no way i just happened like we were in Florida when it happened. I have pictures, and I just realized this like two years ago. We're looking through family albums and stuff, and we're looking through, and we're like, "Oh my god!" I, you know, I knew we went to Kennedy Space Center, but on the bus tour, we're going, and we have pictures of Hubble on the pad on the space shuttle, and I had, you know, I had to look up the dates, and I'm like, "Oh my god, that was Hubble!" You yeah. know, and then I have this cool. vivid memory of watching it take wow. off too, um, from our hotel, but. Um, so I missed the big rockets. I missed the really, really big yeah. rockets. The biggest rocket yeah. I've ever seen fly is like the Delta four heavy and the Falcon heavy. Um, so I'm excited to see rockets that are, you know, more powerful than, than anything that's ever launched ever successfully. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and just the scale of it. Like, I, I just really can't wait. Yeah. I can't wait to see a base on the moon. Yeah. It's a, it's a light <laughs> moon base. Goal of moon mine. Base All right, we got a, we got a question up. <laughs> yeah. There are, so here's a question. Uh, there are numerous small and mid-scale rocket launch companies across the world. What do you think the landscape will look like in 10 to 15 years? Mm. So last year I did a video breakdown on like the rocket companies that kind of had the most promise to make it to orbit next. At the time, uh, Astra had almost made it to orbit. Virgin Orbit had almost made it to orbit, I think, when I made this video. And really, Rocket Lab was the only one that was successfully going to orbit as a small sat launch company. And it, and I, I think at the time there's 154 companies trying to make it to orbit. Mm-hmm. 154. Obviously, there's wow. not room for 154 launch companies. That's I think nuts. even since the making of that, handful of them already gone bankrupt. You know, it's the launch industry is very saturated. Um, I think there's honestly three or four that are probably going to survive and be small sat launchers in 10 years. And they'll gobble yeah. up I the just, other companies, the other small ones. Yep. Yep. But that's. I, I am excited to see. A couple of companies are starting to use each other's technology a lot. So Rocket Lab is very big on like they're providing space systems like the Star Trackers and avionics and, you know, in space propulsion. All of these things. Rocket Lab has become a, a big player in that market. But even um, like 
Firefly, who's going to be launching next Thursday or Friday um, on their alpha, they're selling their engines to uh, to Astra, mm-hmm. their, their, uh, their Reaver engines. And then they're also using their new first stage will be used by North Grumman for the Antares for an update on the Antares mm-hmm. rocket. So it's just cool. I think that's how these companies will survive is like not just by being launch providers, but some of them will spin off into like, you know, kind of find their own niche in this in this modern day and age, you know. Ian, you got another one? Okay, what alternative word for astronaut is your favorite? <laughs> I heard the Taikonaut uh, discussion <laughs> a minute ago. Um, Taikonaut's really cool. Um, yeah, I, I still like, I, maybe it's just because of this thing in the background of my weird obsession of like Soviet history. Cosmonaut just sounds cool too. Yeah, it does. You know? yeah, it, does. Yeah. it totally does. Cosmos, you know? Yeah. So I think, I think that's my favorite. Cosmos. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right, here's another one. Assuming the, the discussed plans for using the moon as a stepping stone to get to Mars, what do you believe the next destination will be for physical humans, not robots? Plans for using the moon as a stepping stone to Mars. What do you believe the next destination will be for physical? I mean, I think Mars is literally about the only option humans have. <laughs> like, so maybe, kind of maybe period. a moon, a yeah. moon of uh, Jupiter. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a, a couple that you know. Even um, oh God, why am I blanking on this? The um, Titan, Titan, you know, is, is almost you know with the right equipment habitable ish. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's, it's got a thick atmospheric atmosphere, pressures. Right? Yep, that's it's got a thick atmosphere, and but it's relative. Like the temperatures are are almost no, they're not almost human. Never mind. There's liquid methane on yeah, the planet. Yeah, they're very cold. They're very cold. Yeah. But if I remember right, yeah, it's. I mean, it's like how's the radiation with the right equipment? Um, that's probably the other big thing is there's probably just an insane amount of radiation there. Um, I don't know. I don't know what realistically maybe uh, you know cloud cities on Venus or something would be a potential. I don't know if you consider that stepping foot, you know, stepping on the planet, mm-hmm. but. Oh yeah, Venus would have the potential to have you know classic literal cloud cities like Star Wars. That's that's really far in the future though. I mean we're not. Yeah, it's like the twenty forties. Oh, I don't even know. I honestly, in some ways, I think that sounds a lot easier than actually landing on Mars. Honestly. Yeah, Yeah, you just float there, right? Yeah, just get there, (laughs) gentle aero brake, and just have a vehicle that's you know yeah that's that's still pressurized like a like a submarine almost you know in the atmosphere. It's then we have, to, uh, we have to we have to to spin up series or something, right? We have to you know hollow out <laughs> yeah. large asteroids. It's not, yeah, the, Mars it's, is really it. Yeah, yeah. If we that's want the to end, end realistically, that's the end of the, the line. Future. Mars, okay. All right, let's get to this <laughs> next question. Uh, what category hurricane can the SLS safely withstand? <laughs> this is my hell right now. Thank you for rubbing it in, Brendan. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I believe it can, it can withstand, what is it? 74 knots or 74 mile an hour. I don't remember which one is close enough anyway. Well, what are the um, category distinctions? Let's look them up. Yeah. Uh, and I'm pretty category. sure if it's a category three, it's no bueno. Even well, category at, three, nothing is bueno. That's like, yeah. that's it. Like we're screwed. <laughs> like my apartment is like, I gotta but take it, everything. But it does depend down. of course where, you know, where you, like if it's going up the East or the, the Gulf yeah, coast of Florida, which currently on. seems like it might be, you know, then. But even if it is a category three, some of those winds might still track even on the on the Atlantic coast track high enough to be outside of the realm of safety of the rocket. And that's exactly what they're trying to figure Mm. out right now. What did you say it can withstand? I think 75 knots or mile an hour. Knots or if it's miles an hour, it can't even handle a category one. A direct hit of a category one. Yeah, that's that's (laughs) yeah. Yeah, no, no. If there is a low end, a a category one is 74 to 95 miles per hour. Yeah. Yeah. Category three is 111. Oh, forget about it. Yeah, that's that's (laughs) yeah. But I don't think they're they're considering at all it being a direct hit, basically. You know, I mean, that's the the odds of that are. But the hurricane is getting bigger as it like uh, I'm I'm on the East Coast, right? I'm in Fort Lauderdale. And um, oh, yeah, we're thinking we're going to be hit by a category three. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it's looking like. You are so screwed, yeah. Kara. I know. Are you I have a plane. I have a flight home on Wednesday. This <laughs> no, is not going to happen for me. <laughs> no, <is it>? you <laughs> don't. No, no, you think you have a flight. Can I tell you guys my absolute hell is right now? So we were trying to cover the Artemis launch, of course. And I built this like 4K production van and drove it from where it stays most of the time in Texas outside of Starbase. Drove it to Florida. Get there. It scrubs twice yeah. in, in, like in a week time frame. Then I'm also contracted. I am the sole live stream provider for Firefly. Mm-hmm. So I had to drive it to California in three days, oh. set up for two days. And then they had two launch attempts that both scrubbed. <laughs> so then I'm like, 
and I'm like stuck in purgatory because then it's like, okay, well, SLS is going to launch here. You know, it was coming up and Firefly had rescheduled again. So like they just keep going back and forth on opposite sides of the country. You need two of these <laughs> and, things. You and need you yeah. to, to build two. And I have to have the van, So I literally purchased running. like... I literally purchased like a portable version of like, because the hard thing is NASA is what's really cool. Sorry, this is a long rant. You probably don't want to hear all about it, but I got to tell you. So NASA is providing clean feeds of their cameras on the launch pad via fiber optic. Like literally it's going through a router and boop, we get like 12G. So 4K 60 frames per second wow. from NASA, That's awesome. which is like the coolest thing ever. Yeah. Yeah. The uh -huh. problem is to take in 12G into like any old switcher, like down a video switcher, you gotta down it. it's... It's insane. So each channel is like $560 to convert from fiber to, to 12G SDI. Mm -hmm. Then you have to have a switcher capable of 12G, or you have to downscale it with like another $500 thing per channel. Mm -hmm. So just like, it, you know, that's why we have the van with all of that stuff. But when the van needs that stuff and it's currently plugged into Slick 2 Launchpad in California, two like we're not going to tear it all out <laughs> of the van and ship it over to Florida for a to watch a rocket scrub again you know to get leaky and scrub and then i fly back it's just like you need a second van yes is, east coast west coast operations you do <laughs> all right uh, tim well, as, I, I think this yeah this is probably as, the last time i, I try to chase as crazy this, as this yeah. sounds for a six hour show we're actually running short on time <laughs> <laughs> that's good that's um, good that's so good it, it was wonderful to have you on the show yeah, man, thank you're you. always a, you know a wealth of information we'll definitely get you back definitely want to get you back when when like artemis is getting before it, it, <laughs> we're, we have boots on the ground on the moon but we'll, we'll be happy to track the whole thing with you and tim i want you on our game show do you know our game show boomer versus zoomer I no, I don't actually. I'm going to email you about it. I, I, I want you to be a contestant on on our game show. I'll tell you all about it's really it. Slick. It's a ton of fun, Sounds great. and I think you would have a great time. So I'll contact you about that. So Let's wait, are it. Tim and I Zoomers? Millennials. Millennials. Yes, millennials. We're millennials. We're in between. Yeah, that's a, between yeah. Yeah. Now with millennials. Now with extra now millennials. With millennials. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, all, every, awesome. all, all the generations are included. All right, Tim. Thank you, Tim. Well, thank Thanks you again. Guys, Take care. Peace, brother. Yes. Thank you, guys. We'll see you. He's all awesome. right. Ooh, what the hell is a blast, that, Steve? Yeah. That's How gorgeous. awesome was Tim, man? Oh, <laughs> yeah, that he, was he's great. Wow. He's a ton of fun to talk to. <laughs> all right, we're going to move on to artificial intelligence. Oh, boy. We have we, we have an a interview at 4 o'clock with artificial four intelligence. 4 o'clock. Awesome. That's going to be in the next episode. So a real, we hope. A, a real AI is going to interview with us? No, we're going to talk to a, a, a human. A human. Oh. A human, yeah. <laughs> oh, a, well, the real AI would have <laughs> been better. Oh my Humans gosh. are cool, too, I guess. All right. So recently, a digital artist won a, uh, in the digital art competition, won an art, an art competition, an art show, with this entry. And he followed all the rules, did not break any rules, but he disclosed afterwards that, I think he might have disclosed it up front even, that he made this this particular artwork using an AI art generator. Yeah. Yep. Right? Um, so there, that triggered off a controversy over, is this really art? Is that fa fair? Did he make the art or did the I AI make the art? He used a program called Midjourney. Uh, so oh, that's mid journey. For the last week, that's why we're doing it. For the last week, yeah. I've been playing around with it. I, you know, my fellow rogues have been playing around with it to a lesser extent, but I've been really trying to, to you know, understand, wrap my head around this this application for the last week or so. Um, so I'll just say that uh, before we go off this piece of, of art, the artist, um, it took him 900 iterations to get to this point. Whoa, 900. Yeah, so it's not what? like he just plugged in a, you know, a prompt and he got this yeah, as this a result. Solid this was effort. iterations of iterations of yeah. iterations. And then he imported it into Photoshop and tweaked it and cleaned it up and improved it. Oh, hmm. And then he used another piece of software to upscale the the resolution and then he printed it on canvas. So that and then he submitted ah. the canvas to uh to the art wow. show so there was a process involved here but yes at some part of that process was using an ai art generator to to create these images um it's a beautiful image oh i my mean God. and absolutely worthy of winning that award i mean what's I the mean, title I, of this piece i didn't i didn't i didn't take a deep dive though it's, i mean what was the result of him disclosing or the realization the that, huge controversy right but yeah. was it taken away was he no 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 the, the art right. show was like no no he he won he deserves to win all right you don't break the rules 
Yeah, the, they, I'm happy. They What's the title of this piece, Steve? Huh? What is this piece called? It it's, has to have it's, a title. It's, in a, it's something, it's like the opera, something opera. It's like a foreign language. This is the supposed Star, to be... The Stargate Opera. Got it. Uh, all right, so <laughs> um, I do have some examples of what I've been working on for the last week. So I haven't been able to get 900 iterations of anything. Why? So I just wanted to like play with the program and see what it was capable of. Um, so... There's, there's. Let me pull up a couple of things. This is, this is a um, nice. Yeah, this is a fun one I created, um, <coughs> or the AI created at my direction, depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, the, I'm gonna give you a quick, very like two minute tutorial on, it, just so you understand what the process is here. There's actually potentially, there's four different kinds of commands you could give the AI, right? The, the most basic level and the one that most people start with is a natural language description of what you want. Show me a futuristic city in the mountains in the fall, in the autumn, right? Mm -hmm. Or I want to see a cat with a pumpkin on its head. Whatever, you come up with any crazy prompt you want. <laughs> um, or you could give abstract things to see what it does. Like, Kara, like one of your first ones was a totally abstract one, like the existential dread of something, whatever. Like, just... <laughs> Come up with stuff like that and you see what it does. But no porn and no violence? It no won't do gore? porn. It won't do graphic horror. Like, it won't, if you say, like, you oh, really? To, yeah. Right. Stabbing yeah, someone so, in the eye. Yeah. So, Probably. will it do it? it? It just won't give you what you're looking for? I don't, I don't know. It, say, like, it won't do it. Whatever it. that means, it won't do it. Yeah. Uh, oh, interesting. It won't do You won't output that. Huh. Uh, and also, I read an interview with the CEO of the company, like, saying this, this particular AI program, there are different ones out there. Dolly 2 is probably the premier one at this point. I haven't been able to get on you know, the beta server of that, but uh, this one is meant as an art program. It's not meant to make deep fakes. Like, there's other things out there that do deep fakes. So if you if you want like the Rembrandt, to, one, a, yeah. a photorealistic picture of a specific person you know, in a situation, you can make it do that, but it's not optimized to do that. Um, so the next layer of, of description, so you have your subject matter. This is what I want you to paint a picture of. The next layer is artistic direction. You could say, I want a pencil sketch or an ink on paper, or even in the style of this artist or in this particular style or with high dynamic range. And there's tons of, of, of uh, direction you could give it in terms of the amount of detail and everything, the aspect ratio, all of that. The third layer is a uh, specific computer programming code it's very simple. It's like dash, dash, and then a word or, or uh, you know, a letter, and then some parameter. So you can give it specific parameters, like how much chaos do you want to inject into it, how much randomness, what the aspect ratio is, what, what engine, what version of the engine do you want to use. You have to basically learn what they are and what they do. And the fourth layer is uh, you can actually use a picture as a prompt. You could put a link to a picture and that becomes the baseline. So you could basically mock up your composition if you want to do that, or you could use it to, to, uh, to, to, to make sure that it understands what it is you want the picture, to, the subject matter to be. So you could use it as a starting point, for example. So you could make, you could make a, a sketch of a person that you create with the software and then use that, a picture of that as your starting point for endless iterations of that person that you created. So like if you're making a graphic novel and you always you you create a character and you could be consistent with that character by using a picture as a prompt going forward. Um, okay, so let me just show you a couple other things. Just so here's an example of asking for a style in the, of a particular artist. This is Klimt, but my prompt was basically I want an angel and a devil together holding hands in the style of Klimt. Right, and that's eventually what I got to after you know a few iterations. But you know, it, but if you're familiar with the artist, it you if you saw this and had no context, you could confuse this for a work of art. Fool your daughter with it, probably. Oh, for two seconds. Yeah. <laughs> but you say confuse it with a work of art. You mean that you think it, it's from the original? Yeah. Right. That that, that, that this is an painter. actual. Now, I don't think you could probably f confuse an expert. Yeah. You know, I, I think they would s sniff this out in two seconds as being, they probably would think that's a knockoff by some Somebody artist else imitating his style. And in a way, that's correct. It's an AI program imitating the style. But if 
you know, putting the that question aside about is it art and who's the artist and everything, just right now I'm just showing you the kind of stuff that you could do. And this is me noodling around with like not not much uh, direction. This one's cool. This is, I wanted like a Victorian era museum engraving nice. of a butterfly, right? And mm. you can see how the, this one is interesting because you can see how it reconstructs a butterfly. It doesn't copy a picture of a butterfly. It uses pictures of a butterfly to reconstruct as, as it. As inspiration, really. Yeah, and, and you get a butterfly-like image. It's not, there's, it doesn't quite match the anatomical detail. If you, if you zoom in close up, you can see like that's not really a butterfly. But, it's like a patchwork. Yeah. Oh, I see. And a you can see it's moth. also reconstructing the words so you get not actual words but like a fake le word like stuff you know in the picture yeah. did you make that oh. uh yeah so but i think it's kind <laughs> of intriguing it's looking like a like, butterfly like, blueprint yeah, or yeah something. kind of you, you could use blueprint as a prompt and you get you get blueprints um here is an art deco nice. robot nice. yeah that's yeah, see, i didn't do this one somebody else did but that's an art deco that robot um here all right there's a couple of what else you ones. got um, so this is another futuristic city wow one, that looks from, big from orbit yeah and that would be big and wow then here's, so a here's a, a colored ink sketch of I gave a description I wanted like an old English explorer and then went through multiple iterations but like if I wanted this character to, to if I wanted more images of this character I could use this picture as the prompt right mm -hmm. Um, Bob, you'll like this one. Ooh, that's a colorful spider. Um, lots, of, lots of legs. This too. is using one of the what? newer <laughs> engines, yeah, right. one of the newer versions that get that's more detailed and less chaotic in terms of what you get. Wait, so that oh, so you use a different engine for that. That one. different engine for that one. Yeah. Okay. Who do you think that it's is? Jay. It's Jay. Is that Jay? <laughs> that's Jay. How'd yeah. you do that, Steve? I used. I linked to a picture of you. That's really cool. Online. Yeah, it's got him, but it's if, a you little at, off. if you look at the individual components, it's not Jay, but the Gestalt. The is Gestalt Jay. is, yeah, because again, yeah. it's reconstructing. Yeah. It's reconstructing it's the picture from the prompt. It's not trying to make a deep fake of Jay. It's trying to make a picture inspired by that. And again, right. I didn't. I wanted to do a lot of different things, so I didn't spend a tremendous amount of time on any, on any one picture. What do you think my prompt was there? Darth Vader. Well, Vader, oh, and then what did you combine it with? Empire, um, evil Empire, and so that. <laughs> That is a propaganda poster for the yeah. Empire, for the Star Wars Empire. Nice. Mm. That was my prompt. I'll join. Uh, in fact, you could see the prompt up on top in the name. Retro propaganda poster Star Wars Empire. That was it. That was my prompt. Um, and, yeah, you could use it as a starting point for all sorts of things. Uh, I think I showed this to you already. Who is that? It's yeah, Evan. and it doesn't it's look Evan. like me. That that was I used Kara as a starting point for that. But again, you get. Did you use an image or did you use the search term? I used the search term, which means yeah, that's it, interesting. It just found images of you online. I mean, you could kind of see Kara in there, but it, yeah, you, the Gestalt didn't really capture. Her. But the other thing is, no, when, yeah, when you make variations, it adds it more drifts away, more, yep. more variability. Mm -hmm. Plus, if I wanted it to look more like you, I could have told it to be less interpretive and more. Uh, right. More literal. specific, more literal. Yeah. You could have said like photo real or something. Mm. Yeah, photo real. Steve, somebody asked if you give the, the same prompt a second time, does it give you the same image or is no. it no? Nope. So there are something called a seed, and if you if you could specify a seed, then yes. Otherwise, you get a random seed, and then the answer oh, is no. Uh, Bob, I made these for you. Nice. <coughs> <A little> gothic, <laughs> gothic haunted house. That Beautiful. Awesome. That's awesome. I love the lighting. Yeah. Um, I'd live in one of those houses. I'm trying to find here. All three? Oh, Steve, I went back through my, my text thread to figure it out. My prompt was Death of the Ego. Death of the Ego, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it was good. It, was it gave cool... me some really cool, yeah, interpretations. Again, it's really, it's really good at cityscapes. Damn, man. Oh, yeah, Ooh. seriously. Yeah. Um, this is an advanced futuristic city, you know, occupied by robots. I don't see the robots. But no, haze. They must have figured uh, the this carbon is... problem out. Whoa! I, it's a galaxy oh, brain, brain. It's a, or yeah. a brain galaxy. That's what so it came cool. up with. It's more like a nebula, but okay. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, so here's one where um, I think this is cool. So 
I, I, the prompt was for a futuristic city, but this is a specific style that's called futurism. futurism. So I said in the in the futurism style. Nice. And this this is what you guys again. So it's mm. it's much better at like impressionism, artistic style. Like we could do pop, it, it also inspired me to learn a lot more about different styles so that I could communicate to it better. You know, this is actually a fun way to learn about art. Um, there was one. Um, uh, abstract prompt I gave that was really interesting um, and you could try to tell me what you think you won't you there's no way for you to guess what the prompt is based upon the image maybe it didn't get uploaded is that it yeah so oh, that, that looks like that looks like the um, that looks like New York City the building the yeah that wedge building what's it called yeah, oh, yeah. is that the, the the Washington's Arch what is that my, called my the, uh, prompt for this Washington one was Park. the the fragility of narrow AI. Oh, oh, yeah, no, no way. way. Yeah, so and you could kind of see like how it would interpret fragility, like this. This is like a society that lo it's very oppressive. It looks like it's collapsing in on itself. It looks very, you know what I mean. But it's that's how it interpreted, or you know, image wise. Paul asked about sharks crazy. with lasers. I know you actually did that one. Yeah, I we, tried to do a shark with laser. Yeah, yeah it didn't quite. Um, it was very stylized. Yeah, here's uh, one where I was trying to make somebody who looks like a spy. Um, but I then I asked for it after I got a sketch of this basic person that I said to do it in the style of Basquiat. So that's if you're familiar with his work, that's what he drew like. So it's so here's the question: is this is the this is the futurism question, right? I have no artistic talent, right? I'm just you did this noodling around with this AI, AI program. What, how disruptive is this technology going to be? And how is it going to be used? What's it going to do to the various aspects of the industry? Mm. You know? That's very easy to answer. Go ahead. No, it's not. Well, I think <laughs> I've been thinking it's about it a lot. I wrote two blog posts about it. I've been talking with artists about it. I've been you know, thinking a lot about it. So I do have a few thoughts, you know, about, about, so I think the best analogy is photography, right? So when photography first came out, it, it, it was thought of as the death knell of, of painting, of art, you know, because yeah. at the time, uh, like oil paint, like one of the goals of, of oil painting, of, of painting, of, of that kind of visual art was to create things as realistic as possible. And so in that context, you know, photos, a photograph is going to be way more realistic than a painting. Um, and so that's why it was thought that it could be really damaging to, to artists and to the art, you know, in industry. But that, of course, that's not what happened at all, right? So that but photography just became a new thing, a new tool that mm. people could use in lots of ways, including making entirely new kind of art. And at the same time, the, uh, you know, the, the visual art world essentially said, well, all right, screw realism because, you know, photographs. Let's do a lot of other things. So that's when you start to get, you know, abstract, non-representational art, impressionism. All of the, you know, later artistic styles arguably were, were uh, inspired by the existence of photography. Um, and now photography has continued to evolve, you know, over the last 150 years. Essentially, with digital photographies and more and more powerful cameras, a lot of the technical work has become more and more easy. And so that, the, the result has been to make it more and more accessible to more people, right? And, and, and again, trying to break it down, if you think about photography, there are several big categories of the ways in which it is used. It's used by amateurs for their personal use, right? And that's sort of the bottom of the pyramid. Most people are taking pictures for, you know, their vacation, just throw some other things up there, for whatever, and for personal use, and that's fine. Then there's sort of professional photography, which has a lot of different uses. So professional photographers for your wedding photographer, for um, news organizations for, for yeah for, for corporate yeah. reasons for your website for you know whatever for school pictures and then there's fine art photography so um i think the 
you know, the advent of like the, the progress of automation in photography doesn't hasn't really affected the fine art photography because again they're, they're going to want maximal control it's been massively beneficial to the personal use end of the spectrum because oh, yeah. now anybody with a phone could take a really good picture without knowing anything about technical photography you really just need to know some basics of composition and, and lighting yeah. and things like that thirds yeah um and then, uh, and then you know the the middle zone, if you will, about commercial photography is is interesting because you could argue that it may have eaten away at some of the applications where people might be sitting for a photograph rather than sitting for a portrait, you mm -hmm. know, in some contexts. Uh, but it had, but but you know, oil painting and whatever as an industry is actually much is bigger than it's ever been. So it clearly didn't make it go away. I think they just sort of adjusted and filled their own niches right so now if we think of use that as an analogy to mid-journey to these kind of applications i think the biggest impact is going to be at the low end of low in from an artistic point of view of personal use the personal use applications of this are legion you know now if you, you again by 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 lowering the technical skill required to produce something usable Right, the AI is doing the heavy lifting technically. Um, you really just have to learn how to communicate with it. <coughs> Excuse me. Wow, I like that. But um, <laughs> yeah, a and then now it unleashes your creativity, you know, on the creative end because you you don't have to master the technical end because the AI art's doing that for you. And you could use this for fun, for your role playing game, you know. Mm -hmm. For whatever your website, or uh, you know, and then and then, I, it's not going to affect I think artists at the high end. And in fact, like with photography, there all all there are already digital artists who are using this program, who are using AI assistance as part of their creative process. It'll just become a new type of art. And again, the big question mark is in the middle. Is it going to be disruptive to any um, of the, the not high art but professional uses? Like for example, book covers is a huge example. Um, you know, and we I actually we had this discussion with Michael Whalen, who's you know for a long time was primarily a book cover artist for the, you know the speculative fiction arena, and he was telling us at one point that you know f publishers have shifted a lot over to photographs once they realize that you could sell a book with a photograph for the cover, it's a lot cheaper to have sure. pay somebody to, to take a picture than it is to have a, a high-end artist create Let's a custom, a thousand hours put, create a custom a, work of art yeah. for you. And so that, that was disruptive to the industry, and that was just a use issue. Um, but th I could definitely see, uh, people are already talking about using this to make their book covers for their oh, sure. vanity press you? or their self-published work, or even, you know, there's a question of the, the rights to it in terms of publishers using it, but you could see it being used for that. Or again, like that $5 artist thing where you hire an artist online for five bucks or 10 bucks or whatever to do something when you could just do it here. I could see that happening, you know, being disruptive to that sort of but, that marketplace. But you know, the, the counterpoint to what you're saying though yeah. is, you know, some of the imagery that you've made, Steve, yeah, is, and like, I'm just, you know, I made a whole bunch, you know, yeah. I, I signed up myself and I, <coughs> like it, it is strikingly gorgeous. Yeah. And it, it, it punches very high. Yeah. You know, it's not like it's a crappy thing. Like, you know, I just, I'm blown away. Like this is better. This artwork that I just created with typing in five words. Yeah. Mm hmm. And I'm sad about it, but it's, sadly, it's better than any piece of art that I saw when I walked through Florence for, you know, when I went well, there last year. Well, again, <laughs> we are not qualified to comment about the true artistic quality. You know, like the, the artistic quality comes from how much you put into it. If you typed in a few words and you got a picture back, you put zero pretty much artistic input into it. Uh, and, and an artist could use the same tool, put in a ton of artistic content and, and create a new style, create something that, that really hasn't existed before. We're kind of repurposing, you know, in a very completely necessarily derivative way, the work of existing artists. This is, this is beautiful because 
artists have created things like this and this AI learned off of them and is just reconstructing it mm -hmm. with parameters we're providing. Now, having said that, I don't know, but when, I don't when you really agree. learn, when you really learn the, um, the ins and outs of how to control the output, the more control you have over the output, the more op opportunity you have to put in some of your own creativity, where you're choosing mm. the perspective that you want, the composition that you want, you're influencing the composition, you're influencing the color choices, the lighting, how the different subject matters are interacting. You might be mashing up different styles to produce something different. You know, so yes, you can get to that point, but just, but the fact that it's beautiful doesn't mean it's art that it's valuable as a work of art. It's just that, yeah, it's 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 hotel motel art, right? It's like, yeah, it's a beautiful piece of art that I might like as my windows background. This is awesome at creating all kinds of fantastic, you know, windows wallpaper for yourself. That's like probably one of the best uses for but, it. But I don't know. I think you're underplaying like, like, first of all, this is, this can only get orders of magnitude better as we move forward. In yeah. Time. But that's another thing. Like anything we say about this now is not, is going to be obsolete in two weeks. Yes, They're iterating this so quickly. Mm -hmm. Wait, it's obsolete right now. Yeah. In five <laughs> years, imagine where this is going to be in 10 years. So, yeah. but, so the, the, I guess the raw question here is, yeah. first of all, like this is all my opinion, right? You know, I yeah. mean, I'm not an art critic. I'm not an expert in any way, but you know, me coming up with a sentence, like I just typed in uh, sunset, in Florence, Italy, and it and it spit out a dramatically beautiful piece of artwork. Yeah, um, I don't think this is valueless. I no. think it has it has an inherent beauty to it. Um, you know, I made I made one. I, I typed in um, a samurai warrior in front of the moon. Yeah, and I showed it to, to my wife Courtney before. I just asked her, "What do you think about this?" She goes, "Oh my God, that is." That's breathtaking. It's gorgeous. Yeah. This, this. Right, but Jay, the, the value of art is a subjective and ever changing uh, target. And so art doesn't have right. inherent value the way that gold has in, inherent value. So if the collectors, if the individuals who want to literally purchase this art see this as something that's worth those dollars, it will be worth those dollars. If they see AI generated art as an as a derivative part of the art world mm -hmm. and they don't want to fund it the way that they fund hand painted or hand created or whatever you want to call it art, then they won't. Time I mean this is something that just has to play out in the marketplace. Yeah, yeah, yeah value guess... value is subjective, but <clears throat> I disagree with the idea, the notion that this is not artistic. Isn't that? I don't think anybody. I thought, I thought that was one of Steve's primary points. It's not artistic, because a human didn't put a lot of time into it. I think he's saying that an artist making AI-generated art is probably going to un break more ground yeah. than a novice making AI-generated art. That's all I heard. And Steve I, well, yeah, yeah. My point cool. is very specifically this. I, yeah, I don't. That why don't you is agree with that? minimal effort, an artificial intelligence through my prompt, which anybody could do, created what I consider to be absolutely stunning artwork. Yeah. I, I just think that sentence, stand alone, that's profound. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is. It's it is. freaking profound. And but you also have much. to remember that an image of your child is breathtaking to you and might not be to anybody else. And so, and I'm not saying that the art that you create on the AI generated platform <laughs> isn't breathtaking to me, but it's subjective by its nature. I know, I know, Kara, I'm, I, I, you're, I think you're, you're missing my point again. Artificial intelligence is going to be able to outpace and technically probably out, outperform what humans can do. We're already at the point. We're right now at that point where this this one of many, but this particular AI and all the things that I've seen it do. And and you know, you might be hearing in my voice a tone. I mean, I I'm, I'm just blown well, away. Dude, yeah. Really, I'm 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 breathtakingly blown away by what this piece of software can do when it comes to creating beautiful quote unquote pieces of art. Whatever you want to call yeah. it. It's a just it's a, it's a digital image. But the style and the, the texture and the, the tonality, to me, it's gorgeous. 
And I, it is gorgeous. It's profound and skilled. It's, it's if profound. a human did it, it would be a very. It takes somebody with tremendous skill to to put that together. So, in, it's, in my mind, that makes me think that this is this is. I think it's artistic and it's beautiful and it's more than than just a value judgment. This is something that is that is that it's it's unprecedented and that we've got a machine that's creating something that and, and we've seen it. For how many generations have we seen machines are doing something that people never thought they would do, and they're doing it right. quicker and better but, in a lot of ways than, than a human Karen, can do it. But they're doing it based on human art. Yes. We have to remember right. that. Yeah. This yeah. is yeah. the algorithm. inputs it's that are learned. allowing yeah. the neural net to yeah. generate that, this are human of course, created but that, art. That is the key. I get it. But but even still, this is a unique piece of art that was created mm -hmm. with. We're prompted by me typing in a very mundane sentence. Yeah, it's it's well, it may be unique in detail, but not necessarily in its style, its artistic content, content. But how much of art is? Well, the, but, know, but, but here, I think every time you paint a painting, no, a lot of art is derivative. Most, but, no, but they're, but no, they're most of it. Well, yeah, well, but well, not not the stuff that it. that fill, not the well, top of the pyramid. Well, there's a reason certain things stand the test of yeah, time and just, others it's, don't. Yeah, it's, it's just a matter of time. Before the, before but well, just but this isn't doing it. This is narrow AI. This is so the the AI itself is not making decisions about that are creative. It's not creating a new style. It's not creating uh, uh, anything nope. that's like it's not uh, creating a theme or imbuing uh, meaning or symbolism in here. It's just very brittly, very and very uh, you know uh, narrowly reconstructing images based on stuff that already exists. Yeah, but and you're controlling that process to some degree. Yeah, but it is creating in moments yeah. essentially in such the artwork that is that will cover ninety nine point nine percent of the art that's out, the high end art that's out there. Sure, that upper echelon um, <coughs> uh, the I, I, humans I, still have the edge, but at some point I think I think I think it's more point, the middle zone. I think yeah. it's more the I the, want to show. The, I want to show everybody the, this the derivative, art, repetitive yeah. commercial art that's okay. not high end art is what it's it's going to be really good at doing. Well, I mean, and Steve, so there's that difference, somebody right? Won, somebody won that digital art yeah. con, con contest, but that, he that that's not just middle ground shit we're talking. So well, Bob, think that, about that, if that's you go very subjective. to all right. Well, think about if you go to a marketplace to purchase a piece of pottery, and you may find a hand-thrown piece of pottery that's like garbage, and you may find a stunning hand-thrown piece of pottery. You may also find mass-produced pottery that was like, you know, it says on the bottom, like made in China, it was right. mass-produced based on, and some of it might be stunning and some of it might be garbage. For some people, and I'm not saying this is the case for everyone, for some people, even the most stunning mass-produced piece of China uh, from China is going to be less valuable than a piece of, of hand thrown stunning of course, art. But you're going and back so, to the value question. And when I think we're not dealing we're not talking about a value question, which is subjective. Yeah, I'm not, not talking I, about I don't that. care about what but you are. Value. I think you you're just changing the word no, and you're still Karen, talking no, about subjective no, inputs. You're wrong. I'm not right. talking about what people would pay for it. I'm talking about the art's inherent value. Ian, can you show that picture I emailed? But you? there's no such thing as inherent value. Yeah. That's no, what I'm no, trying but, to say. Yeah, Kara's no, no, right. The, there isn't. There it's is. Based there isn't. On but there. Interest. But there is a skill set, a human, a, a, a skill set that would be required yes. for a human to do that. That is. But that, that is a is, dramatic yeah, amount so, of skill. So that's separate. But so that that's, doesn't play into the value. Yes, it does. It plays. But, that's what it we're plays talking into the about. Algorithm, though. There's but a it's complicated the... relationship. So the, what you're talking yeah, about yeah, yeah. is separating the technical aspects of creation from the creative act, the artistic aspects of creation. And yeah, so you're you're you know oogling over. Yeah, this AI can handle all the technical aspects of creation. It has no sentient artistic aspect. That's and you. that's why I try to use right. the example yeah. of the perfect china versus something that's hand thrown that right. has little mistakes it's like, it's, because. Yeah. Technical art is not always the best art. Mm -hmm. Technically perfect, proficient art is not what most people want. And so again, regardless of if we're talking about skill, when we talk about value in art, that's, I mean, this is the fundamental debate of the art world, right? And we're kind of rehashing it right now. The, the value, the interest, the, the beauty, what, what, all of these are subjective terms. And right. even yeah. technical skill doesn't translate to something being described as better, quote unquote. Mm -hmm.
And I think that's an important uh, yeah. thing but to this constantly is, this is, remember. We, we have to wrap this up. So wait, wait, wait. I'm going to wrap know, it up. I, I, you got to talk for a long time. But this, I, I this, this make is my it. item. I know, but <laughs> yeah, 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 show the time. image. Was this your? I don't think this was his. I typed in. I typed in sunset in Florence, Italy, and this is what this is what came out. And I'm telling you that that is absolutely gorgeous, and it's as good as any other piece of art that I've seen while while touring Italy. I'm not joking. I mean it subjectively is giving me a feeling that a very very high end <coughs> feeling meaning on a computer screen would you feel the same way if you had that printed on canvas next to a hand painted oil I, I don't know I, I haven't experienced that yet but Kara I'm just saying it's a matter of time before before AI is going to be making art that is better in any way you could measure it than probably artwork that human beings are doing and and and, ch and churning it out at a pace that is unprecedented so if I was and what I'm saying is that that word better is a subjective yeah. judgment. It is, it is subjective, but I'm using yeah. it for myself. It is better. Mm -hmm. That piece of art right there is better than any piece of art that I saw. To your any, subjective sense. Any of the people that I saw. <laughs> or anyway, you said that five but, times. But now. it's a and good you point. you be wrap that kind up. of collector. Uh, guys, you know that when I say we wrap it up, we fucking wrap it up. Right? <laughs> so, I mean... Seriously, right. um, I, I appreciate your enthusiasm, but please do not ignore my direction when we're on a live show. Yes, all master. right. So here is oh, this is a live show. This Shit. is the wrap up for for this particular <laughs> news item. That will all be edited out of the actual podcast version of the show. No, eh, he'll forget. No, all right. Yes, here, here's here's the wrap up. Again, well, the, if you look at this from a futurism technology point of view, this is just an an extension of something we've been seeing for a long time, which is. Technology allows for the automation of the, the technical aspects of creation, whether you're making a chair, taking a picture, creating art, whatever. This has happened in the art world. There are techniques that you could use to, you know, to make things easier to automate it. So you, not everything is reliant upon like freehand skill and nothing else, right? This is just an extension of that. And what, the, what generally what happens, what this means is it makes whatever that thing is more accessible to the masses. It, it, it has a complicated relationship with the sort of the professional sort of zone, and it is, can be disruptive to that. And artists just deal with it. They just incorporate it. They move on to something else, and it's fine. And I think that's exactly what's going to happen here. But we have to be very careful not to confuse the technical aspects of creating this kind of stuff with the artistic content, which nobody here is qualified to judge. But you know, even if we're just talking about it in a very, we, we very really simple. Should, we really should get. I'd love to speak to someone who yeah. knows what they're I, talking well, about. Yeah, we tried to hit Michael Whalen on today, but he yeah. wasn't. He was not available. Can we play the uh, deep fake that I made? Well, let's do it next episode. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, when we, we got twelve minutes, yeah. <clears throat> we're gonna we're just gonna jump to science or fiction, and then we're gonna transition what? to the next oh, episode. Okay. okay. So the AI thing is in everything we just talked about is in the next episode, though. No, this is all in this episode. Oh, okay. We're doing one episode. All right. We could <coughs> we could use those items for the next episode if you want to. But anyway, all right. Yep. Let's move on with science or fiction. Each week, I come up with three science news items or facts, two real and one fake, and then I challenge my panel of skeptics to tell me which one is the fake. For this episode, I have four items. I haven't done that in a very long time, but I had four items. And there's a theme, of course. The theme is past inventions that utterly failed, or past technology that failed to change the future or make it into the future. One of the themes of the book is that um, you can't, like the future is not inevitable the same way our present wasn't inevitable. It's made by choices that we make individually and collectively, and it's made also by lots of considerations, not just what's the best technology. Um, and so these are just examples, not in the book, so no one has an unfair advantage, just examples of technology that didn't make it through for whatever reason, okay? And of course, one of these is made up, is not true. So item number one, in 1983, in response to the Sony Walkman craze, Audio Technica, I think it's Technica, yep. released the Sound Burger, mm -hmm. a portable record player complete with earbuds. Number, item number two, in 1981, a Swedish company, <coughs> let me start that again. Item number two, in 1981, a Swedish company marketed an all plastic bicycle, the iteration, it's nope, it's the Itera, this is autocorrect. Sorry about that. Oh. 
The Itera, which turned out to be more expensive to produce, but failed mostly because the weak frame made it too wobbly to ride. All right, number three, in the 1930s, architect Bus Buckminster Fuller designed a prefab home designed to be inexpensive, quick to build, and eco-friendly, made mostly out of waste cow bones from the beef industry. And item number four, in 1964, Klaus Schultz, that's S-C-H-O-L-Z, of Vienna, invented a phone answering robot. However, its ability was limited to picking up and hanging up the phone. <laughs> okay, we're going to go down the row here, starting with you, Evan. Uh, the Sony Walkman one and uh, the Sound Burger. I would like to think that I actually heard about that at some point. Um, I used to be in the audiovisual industry, but I have a feeling it's a conflated memory of some kind. It does sound plausible. There were, I mean, the competition for Walkman at the time absolutely was there. Um, and this is about the time the first, I think, portable CD player was about to come out. So uh, there was a lot of, lot of stuff going on in the portable audio uh, world then. I totally believe that that one's right. Uh, the next one about the plastic bicycle, never heard about this one before. Doesn't mean anything, but it turned out to be more expensive to produce, but failed mostly because of the weak frame, too wobbly to ride. Well, that sounds like that would be the reason why it would fail. I'm not sure about this one. Something seems a little off here. The third one about Buckminster Fuller and this prefab home designed to be inexpensive. I had a prefab home once, uh, didn't I? Or one was built in a... Oh, yeah. uh, in a uh, Who built that for you? I think, Jay, uh, you might have had a hand in that. <laughs> it's still standing, so well done. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what? Mostly, That's but, cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, mostly, but this one in the 1930s, mostly out of the waste of cow bones from the beef industry, not, not totally implausible. I mean, it sounds ridiculous in a, in a certain way, but I don't know that that's... Um, um, necessarily uh, looking for new material, new building materials or different building materials. I don't have a problem with that one. And the last one about the, uh, this is the funniest one, <laughs> the robot. You actually, what, what are you going to make a, a robot to pick up? And I mean, that's what would happen, though, if it, in that time, 1964, you would have a mechanical arm of some kind that would have to do the physical picking up of the phone. Right? You're not reinventing the phone or anything. It's just the, the physical, the physicality of it. So the least... The one I think is the fiction is the plastic bicycle one, um, whereas I see some sorts of plausibilities kind of in the other items. This one seems like Stevie might think he made it up out of whole cloth. Okay, Bob. Oh, boy. Um, let's start from the bottom. The the phone answering answering machine in 64. Uh, yeah, I mean, technically possible at that time, but it also makes sense that they wouldn't be able to tap in and really do anything other than pick it up and hang it up. Um and it doesn't say anything really came of it, so that makes sense because nothing really would have come of that. So I guess I'll say that one's science. Buckminster Fuller, um, wow. I mean, is he, cow bones? Um, I don't know. It, it, it doesn't strike me as something that, oh, no, no way that ever happened. Um, so I'll, maybe I'll just go with that one, but it sounds so bizarre. The plastic bicycle kind of makes sense. The one that um, I had an issue with, the portable record player, I mean, how do you keep it from skipping? Um, you know, I mean, I, I think I, I remember seeing one that was in a car, uh, but that's far different from a portable one, as you say, as you say here. Um, so I think maybe this might be a riff off of the one that was designed for a car. And even that one sounds like it would be problematic. Um, but I mean... Mm. Putting a regular record with a with a needle on it that's portable. I mean, I'm, I don't know how that would be designed in such a way. I mean, would it be such a tight fit that it really just couldn't? The needle couldn't bounce off of it. I don't know. For whatever reason, I'll say this one is fiction. It's probably wrong. It's a good one. <coughs> this one's hard. Hmm. Ian, yeah. can you um, gather votes from the audience about which one they think? What about me, Steve? I'm just, I, I didn't go either. This, we want this to be happening in the background while it, I do go to It's you. only on YouTube. We don't matter. I think he already is. He's okay. already gathering. All right, I just wanted to make sure, Ian, because I, I didn't tell him to do it. All yeah, right, Jay. Jay, what about he, you? He put us in the corner. Right, to, to answer Bob's question, I would imagine, Bob, that you carry this small record player with you and you just put it down. And then, you know, the whole problem that you said is, uh, is you, you're not going to be riding like a bicycle while you're playing but it. You're walking gonna... down the street with a wa Walkman is, you know, kind of a critical component to a portable record player. Right, but it doesn't... 
It yeah, doesn't say it's a Walkman. It, it says say. it's a sound burger. It's a portable oh. record player, which I took as you take it with you and you plop it down and you, you go to the that, beach. That, that may very like well a, be, but it does say in response to the Sony Walkman. Yeah, but but why would anybody? Praise. But Praise. I think you're you're what you're doing bob is you're you're saying well it's because it's sony walkman craze like that's almost like the tricky part here you, there's no way that any kind of record player would perform better exactly than a cassette a cassette player that's i think the I idea it. is it's the portability aspect of it i know <laughs> so ba- right that's basically just a battery power and mine might be reasonable as well so we'll yeah. see won't we uh the the bi- plastic bicycle of course somebody made a plastic bicycle the the next one um <laughs> the architect um Waste cow bones. I'm going to just stop you right there, Steve. I just, there, <laughs> That's it. I always wanted to say that to somebody. Um, there is no way that somebody is, was building houses out of cow bones. I think that one is a fiction. No way, no how. Okay, so Bob is the sound burger, Jay is the cow bones, Evan is the robot. So, Kara. No, I'm the uh, uh, bicycle. Oh, you're the Steve. bicycle. All right, so one, two, and three. So, Kara, you're up. Go ahead, take it. Take the last one. I'm not going to pick the the (laughs) robot. Sorry. (laughs) I'm not going to be that spread out. Jay, I have been with you since the beginning. I've been thinking about this a lot. So obviously someone made a plastic bicycle and obviously was a piece of crap. (laughs) Um, And of course, you could make a portable record player, whether it was meant to be played on a table or on your hip. doesn't matter if it was good. You just made it, right? And so, of course, somebody attempted this. And maybe it was good, because maybe Jay's reason It doesn't say made it. It said released. Yeah. Released. Okay, they might have sold That's... it. Too. There, you, there is an entire museum in L.A. dedicated to crappy products that don't work well that were actually released. Like, I'm not surprised by this. Um, Buckminster Fuller, famously geodesic dome. Yeah. I yeah. feel like maybe that's where and Steve Fullerine. was trying to go. We're imagining a geodesic dome made out of cow bones. But Mr. Fuller was like a real architect <laughs> who made amazing stuff. And he probably did make prefab houses as early as the 30s. I wouldn't be surprised by that because he was really innovative. I don't think making something out of cow bones is innovative. I think that's rustic. It just doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't fit my impression of him. So to me, that's um, that's got to be the fiction. Wow. All right, Ian, do we have a, a vote tally from the, the live audience? Oh, it looks like the, mm, the vast majority went with Jay and cow Kara with the, uh, with the cow bones. Cow all right, so right. most people, all the rogues and most of the audience think that number four is science. So we'll start there. Um, <clears throat> in 1964, Klaus Schultz of Vienna invented a phone answering robot. However, its ability was limited to picking up and hanging up the phone. Uh, everyone pretty much thinks this one is science. <laughs> you going to get us all? And this one is... Say it. Science. This ah. is science. Ah. Yep. Yay. He actually did that. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Um, I don't want to go past the other pictures on my way to that one because they're in order. Uh, uh-huh. So, yeah, he made up a... He made a. We'll talk about it in a second, but he made a robot. All it did was pick the phone up and hang it down. Didn't do anything. Didn't give a message. Didn't take a message. Technically, it's a phone answering machine. It just picked up the the receiver and set it back down. Um, so it's a hang up device. Yeah. So call just, comes in, hang it up. It's a phone not answering <laughs> yeah. machine. Uh, I'm not sure what he thought, what utility he thought it would have. Maybe for somebody <laughs> who couldn't physically pick up the phone. And he made like a full robot to do this, not an arm. A full human robot. Why? Ah. What would be that purpose? It's what? like Simone Yet, like all of her cool, shitty robots, just yeah. like for fun. So, uh, interestingly, 1964 was the same year that they came out with the tape-based answering machine. Oh, interesting. You know, actual answering machine. And it was also the year they came out with Steve. That's true. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Three hours, halfway done. All right, guys. The rest oh of gosh. these I'm going to take in order just so I can go through the pictures oh, in order. Boy. Need a break in 1983, in response to the Sony Walkman craze, Audio Technica released the Soundburger, a portable record player complete with earbuds. Bob, you think this was the fiction? About what was it, like 20% or so of the audience think this one is, is the fiction? The second and most this prevalent. This one is science. Yeah, yeah. So. Jay is basically correct. There it is. Look the at that thing. Burger. Uh, Bob's like, you can't. It you was can't in ride reaction a horse to the Walkman. Are those 45? It was in reaction to the Walkman, which was the diversion. That was the red herring. Because you were. I wanted you to think, how are you going to walk around with 
a record Yeah, you player. got me again. Congratulations. Thank you. You, have, you, <laughs> you do have to put it, it down. <laughs> and that's why it failed, because you have to put it down on a hard, stable right. surface. So it's not really that. It doesn't replace the Walkman in any meaningful way. Is that battery? That's got to be battery powered, though. It's battery powered. Okay, that's something. It has earbuds. Here's the thing. So it basically failed because, of course, it did. Uh, but well, CDs were just, you know, exploding. You, you know that um, that turntables, that vinyl, it has is having a resurgence among yeah. millennials mm, and the then. younger generation. And apparently, the Sound Burger has fantastic sound, and it's no, it's shit. really come Hi-fi. into high demand <laughs> recently. It's funny. I, I even loved, uh, Steve, that you said it had earbuds. I doubt it had earbuds. It, well, that's I what it said. earbuds existed. No, it said oh, it had really? earbuds. It had earbuds. I didn't make that up. Like buds? Yeah. I don't even think those existed then. Yeah. I'm looking up when it's not wireless. Not wireless, but not wireless, but, yeah, wireless, the, but they, the, were, the, they were. No, I know. They had Kara. They, they had those. They, they had them in the '60s. Yeah. They yeah. had the earbu- earbuds. Headphones. Oh, the earbuds. Ones. Transistor yeah. radios had earbuds. They were like earbuds. headphones, but they were tiny. Yeah, I don't the think you can see that. Was not new. To, there's no. nothing new about that. It had earbuds. Transistor radios had earbuds too. All right. Um, that looks like a 45 record only. Yeah, it could play. It could play the full ones too. The 33. Oh my god. Oh Yeah. All right. So wait. So Steve, people are buying those up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not surprised. The sound. All How right, many let's are go to there? number two. In 1981, a Swedish company marketed an all-plastic bicycle, the Itera, which turned out to be more expensive to produce, but failed mostly because the weak frame made it too wobbly to ride. Evan, you think this is the fiction? Yeah, I thought so. This one is science. There it is, the mm. all-plastic Itera. They made a ton of these things, like. Hundreds of thousands of them, whatever. No, sure, why not? The, the idea was they wanted to make a bicycle out of essentially recycled plastic, mm-hmm. you know, to use up yeah. all the plastic that was, that was being created. And, you know, it looks like a bicycle, but it just was not strong enough. And it was the frame itself would buckle and was wobbly. So, as it, if they didn't test their own product, yeah, yes. it's almost as if they didn't engineer they didn't it properly. Put a person on the thing? And, and so they basically had to throw out like hundred thousands of these bicycles. They were. Just oh, they had, just had to get rid of them. I guess the, the guy that made the company must have felt great. He's like, I want to take garbage. Like, well, I think he got confused by the term recycle when it came to this. So yeah, there you go. Got, yep. became All right. Inflation. All, um, this means. all this means that in the 1930s, <laughs> architect Buckminster Fuller designed a prefab home designed to be inexpensive, quick to build, and eco-friendly, made mostly out of waste Look cow bones. bones from the beef industry <laughs> is the fiction. Somebody in the chat already pointed out that Buckminster Fuller, and Kara, you said it, he did make a prefab house, the Dymaxion. He made it out of chrome. Oh, cool. Made it out of chrome. Oh, I saw that too. Yeah, yeah and it, you, could fit the, you could fit the components onto one truck. You uh-huh. could assemble mm. it in two days. That's, that can't include the site work, but... Mm. Assuming the site work is done, you could you could assemble it in two days. Um, it failed uh, for for you know from well, what I'm of reading. Of course it failed. Look at the miserable expression on that guy in the house. It, it I mean, failed guy... in two for <laughs> two reasons that I that I read. It right? can't take a 75 mile an hour wind. Well, chrome will rust. No, <laughs> no chrome chrome it's too rust. expensive. If, you, if it gets chipped, you mean if you chip, yeah. yeah. Is it too expensive? No, it was not. It was cheap, too quick, round. easy to build, uh, easy to and quick to build. Uh, it was too round. Thank you, Lou. Because wow, people couldn't joking. they couldn't find furniture that would fit well with the round design. Oh my god! <laughs> but also, it just, how do you hang those those uh, window? Yeah, covers yeah, right. <laughs> how do you hang a picture on the wall? <laughs> and also, it was just too small. Like the 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 bathrooms were teeny teeny tiny, and the the bedrooms there was like two very small bedrooms. So oh, people just thought it was too thing. small. The shape was too inconvenient to adapt to, and so it never took off. Um, for those reasons, but yeah, but that he designed it to be an eco-friendly, uh, prefab, easy to build home. And so I, ha- I, you know, when I was coming up with the idea of this as the fix, it's like, okay, I'll just have to come up with something else he made it out of. That's not true. And it took me like seven tries <laughs> to find something that doesn't exist as a, as an actual house. So people build houses out of cardboard. Mm-hmm. That, but of course, it's like specially engineered to be as strong as wood. Peanut shells, yep. recycled glass bottles, sure, right? I mean, I just I've seen that. seashells. I had to go through all of these before I wound up. I couldn't find anyone making houses out of bones, so I figured probably because of the creep factor. Bone is actually a good, strong, lightweight material, right? And and 
and, and yeah. relatively seemed plausible and not that combustible. So it's yeah, it's yeah. Uh, but if you turned it into like a pulp and then I'm well, sure right, that's what I thought. Yeah, you, you not even a engineered pulp. cow bone kind of. You could make like a cement like grind it down. And yeah, probably something. Plus, you could it. suck the marrow out of it. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> it's funny sucking. how long it took me to come up with something that people hadn't been making houses out I of. I fell for Kara, it. Kara, how do you and I celebrate sinker. live in this live stream? Um, well, I think that this goes to show how much we love each other because we were just arguing vehemently and now we're done together. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's the phone answering robot. I mean, a full robot. No. What the heck? That's it. That is... I mean, that thing couldn't even go, hello. You know, nothing. And it's got a full body under, under there. You know, anyway. Okay. Maybe he made the robot first and decided this thing's not going to do anything. Maybe I got to have it do something. Pick up a phone quick. Well, this is another futurism fallacy, right? That we'll be <laughs> doing things differently in the future just because it's the future. And we'll, so robots are a future thing, right? So we have to have ro let's make robots to do stuff. Even though it's not better, it's <laughs> right. not easier, it's a waste. But that's no. In the future, oh, we'll be if things are if if we are already doing them optimally, we we'll do them the same even a thousand years right. from now. You know what I mean? That makes sense. Going to be washing our face with water for a long time and drying our face. Probably with cutting towels. food with knives. Too. Yeah, it's just going <laughs> to. All, All right. right. <laughs> One second. <clears throat> Okay, Evan, take us home with a quote. This job is a great scientific adventure, but it's also a great human adventure. Mankind has made giant steps forward. However, what we know is really very, very little compared to what we still have to know. Fabiola Gionati, Higgs boson physicist. Mm -hmm. Great name, yeah. Fabiola yeah. Gionati. Fabiola. That's a good quote. Yeah, it's always important to remember that like, what we don't know is still vastly outweighed. Absolutely, right. And, that's and, right. The, and the more you know, the more you realize, oh man, we know even we know even that's less right. than we thought. The more we discover, the less we know. I think at this point in my life, I feel like because of my awareness of what I don't know, I feel like I know the least out of any point in my. It's in a weird way. That's funny. When I was in my twenties, you know I felt like right. I knew everything. Yeah, right. Because the horizon has expanded. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the known unknowns. Yeah. There's greater known unknowns. Right. All right I'm right. hungry. Um, Same. Close this oh out gosh. so we could we could talk move on and talk about other things. Yeah, we're gonna end the show. Then we'll take a break. Show. Uh, but aren't you just gonna say, "Well, thank you, everyone," and then? Yeah, we're gonna close out. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So <laughs> that ends this episode. Thank you uh, for joining us for this live streaming episode of the SGU. As always, thank you guys for joining me. Sure, man. Steve, thank we you, should Steve. do it again. Thanks, we Steve. should do it again like Soon. in five minutes. <laughs> and until next week, this is your skeptic's guide to the universe. All right, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. That's one episode let's down. Let's do a book review. <coughs> Ten-minute ten break? So Wait, let's do a, really? Not ten we, minutes. How about a two-minute bio two. break? Two-minute bio two. break. Okay, first of all, there's no that. way that this file will export in two minutes. All right, whatever Second it's going to take you to do. I need to eat it. something. All right, three-minute bio break. Ah. <laughs> well, well, since we all can't go to the bathroom at the same time, I'll talk. All right, Jay, you keep everyone entertained for three minutes. Since well. we have begun, Steve, yeah. we have had 229 stick and sticker nice. redemptions. Awesome. Stinkin That's 229 book pre-orders. Guys, that is freaking awesome. That is awesome. So you can go to the Skeptics Guide to the future.com <coughs> to pre-purchase our book. Um, Dean, is this a good time for you to swap your audio? Swap and see. You could pre-purchase the book the at the website. Uh, the well, I'm actually, it's just oh, me and you, Ev. So yeah, I'm about to go. So. <laughs> Reminds me of I'll something. I'll be back, though. Doesn't it remind you of something? It though? does, yeah. We Oddly? built a house together, didn't we? Yeah, among we did. You things. and I... Oh, yeah, among other things. That's right, the secret. Yes. Uh, the, the, now the, that maintain the secret, folks. The only people in the, room, in the studio right now are those of us who... Who know? That's all I'm going to say. So anyway. Oh, yeah. We don't know if Kara's there. Or not. Yeah. <laughs> um, never tell everybody out there. Never tell the truth, okay? Friday live stream, people know what I'm talking about. The, um, so please do pre-purchase the book. Pre-order the book for us because if you're going to buy it, do it, do it pre-order style because that will help us get on bestseller lists, which would, would, would help us sell the book even further, right? It's, it's all about just getting it out there and getting it in front of people. So we would really appreciate it. Um, and I will remind you, if you've already ordered the book, you know, Christmas is not far away. Mm -hmm. These are great books or fantastic Christmas presents. Um, you know, you, can, you could buy people toys and all sorts of things. But a book is like you're giving them knowledge which how often do you get the opportunity to give people knowledge? No, it's true. And, and from the experience we had of the first book, 
is that people bought the book and then they decided, okay, I, I now am familiar with this. I'm, if this is good for my other families. Now I, now I know I can buy more copies and, yeah. and, and share them around for gifts or, or, or whatever else. Just might as well just go ahead and get those extra copies <laughs> now because you know the same thing yeah, is that's going true. to happen. So now is an important time to do this. It, it really does make a difference, huge difference. And thank you guys. Thank, thanks to all of you who've been, who've been here for the first episode. And we have three more hours to go. If anybody in chat has uh, questions for Jay and Evan yeah. specifically, okay. go, go ahead it. and I'll pop them up. What do we got? Don't all rush to the door. Can you move that? Uh, yeah, we have, a little, we have something blocking us. What are we doing? Uh, Ian can move that out. I want to be in here when they find out. Yeah. <laughs> so, so They're not going to find out. Right. Evan, I lost 10 pounds. 12, I heard. I, it's it's well wait I, from sixteen down to uh, two sixteen down to two oh four. Twelve pounds. Yeah, it's twelve pounds. Two more, and you can say I lost a stone. That's important. That's cool. That's cool. That's very British. But yeah, I've been eating um, something called overnight oats. It's basically, you know, stone stone ground steel ground oats mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that I put in a mason jar and I put in skim milk, mm -hmm. and then I put in a bunch of stuff to make it taste good. And is the idea it like fills you up? It prevents you from eating other things, or is it, and gives you and gives you the nutrients you need. I haven't eaten anything since seven o'clock this morning. Yeah. So yeah. every day, Questions. it's basically I go to dinner. I just eat that for breakfast, and I go all the way to dinner, and then my stomach shrank. Okay, can you move the? Uh, oh, there you go. Does pre-ordering on Amazon differ from pre-ordering on the site? Well, basically, your pre-order options. If you're in the United States and Canada are going to be Amazon or like RJ Julia or the strand.com. Um, but it doesn't matter. Like it doesn't matter where you pre or you pre order the book. Just, you know, as long as you do pre order. Also it. importantly, there's no ordering on our site. It's just directing you to other locations. Yeah, that's right. We're not, we're not, we're not selling it directly guys. Like this is all definitely through booksellers. I'll be back in a moment. I mean, let's face it. Amazon is the easiest and most convenient. Um, but if you want to support a local bookstore, then you could pick one Another of the Another non-personal question. Jay, how tall are you? What's your current BMI? By the way, Jay, yes. since what? you bring up local bookstores, we don't, nobody knows what the New York Times algorithm is for picking their book, their bestsellers. Yeah. But it's not raw numbers. And apparently, local bookstores count more than Amazon. Oh, they buy it at So if you have bookstore. a choice, support your local bookstore. I was wrong. New York Times likes that. And that actually helps us more. How did the interview go? Hey, Ian, I'm back. Great. I saw, I was watching a little bit of just the video, no audio. Yeah. And it, you, you looked great. Everything looked like it came out great. I mean, yeah, so I was interviewed for an ABC uh, streaming bit, you know, last night. Um, it's like 15 minutes, which is a substantial interview for a book, you know. So just being on ABC, you know, and... Being able to plug the podcast and the book was awesome. Yeah. Uh, but the, inter the interview was solid. You know, again, just laid up questions and, you know, the, the futures and stuff for us. Like, we well, could our, talk about our, that all day. You know, our, our uh, whatchamacallit, I can't remember. Uh, our sir? agent. Our agent sent an email that said yeah. that he thought the questions were very provocative. Yeah. Which is good. No, well, it's funny because she's, uh, not to diminish anything about the, re the reporter, but she's got somebody in her ear. She was a last-minute substitution, so she clearly didn't read a word of the book. You okay, know? yeah, but she, um, <coughs> but she asked good questions. Oh, by the way, right. reporters never read a word of the book. I know, I mean, which I wouldn't expect them anyway. <laughs> like, I'm just giving her an out, Kara. But I wouldn't expect yeah. anyway. But she was 100% being fed info. They, they had digested everything for her. And we were marveling at, the, at how, you know, the, the system that they have is smooth, obviously. They're, they know what they're doing. They're professionals to the point where... She could look like she knows what she's talking about when she had no idea about anything two seconds before we started, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. that process. She sat That's down. She had she had a list. <coughs> she had a you know list of stuff, uh, talking points in front of her. I just forwarded, they had she had somebody talking to her in her ear, and then and she sounded like she knew what she was talking about. I forwarded Ian the link so he could put that in the chat for you yeah. guys to answer. The, a person asked a question. <coughs> I'm six feet tall, and I don't know what my BMI is, but I don't know if you can calculate this on your own. Cause I, and I don't even know how useful BMI is. I've heard positive and negative things about it, but I weigh 204 pounds now. It's fine as a gestalt estimate yeah. for populations. I, I, with me, it's 100% about my waist. You know, like how, you know, we're, yeah. I, I literally am at the size now where I can fit into any pair of pants I've ever owned, which is remarkable. Nice. 
That's yeah. amazing. Yeah, it feels Good great. Job, Jay. And I'm going to keep going. Hey. I, I haven't been below this weight in 20 years. Hey, Steve. Mm hmm. A little bit of business while Maybe we're in between. I know people can see, but that's okay. Um, I don't think we ever got a rundown. So I'm just like waiting for you to tell me what I'm going to do. It, can you give us a rundown of how you want to do this next episode? So, just so I'm yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know because I was doing that the last minute. Yeah, well, sure. So, so and, uh, I never told you my what's the word, but it's a fun one. So, and it's very futury. So, if you oh, we could start that, with that. Yeah. So, okay. You were doing the, the robot uh, laughing one, right? I have robot laughing and man bear pig. So, which one do you want to do? Robot laughing is much more, well, it, robot laughing is much more future oriented. Man bear yeah. pig is actually like the yeah. past. So, we could do, the, we could do that one okay. for you because you have your choice now. Same thing with you, yeah. Evan. You could choose the electric plane or the. Yeah, I'll do the electric plane. Okay. Um, okay so, I'll so, we'll start with a what's the word. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't have a picture for it, but that's okay. We'll start with a "What's the that's word," okay. and then we'll go to <clears throat> your segment on robot laughing, and we'll, then we'll go to Evan since you guys haven't gone yet. Okay. Oh, you right. want me to just go straight? Are you sure you don't want somebody in between? Well, that's true. If you're doing "What's the word," yeah, yeah we'll do, we'll do Evan and then somebody else, and then I'll come to you whenever. Yeah, and then pull me back. Yeah, yeah, yeah you want that's me perfect. To go to the bathroom now, or do you want to wait? Yeah. Okay. Are you done? Yeah, I'm still exporting. You should go. She's still exporting. Go pee. Yeah, I was waiting for yeah. the bathroom to be empty. Yeah. Oh, actually, I might have finished. <coughs> Terrifile one. How big and is this four o'clock is the interview? Yes. All right. Interview. Who's it with? His name is Mark. Mark. And he's an AI expert. Mark what? What special thing? Oh, cool. Focus. Mark Ho. Mark Ho. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's his name. One point. Yeah, Andrew, yeah that's a Andrew huge Andrew file. Andrew. We need okay. to know. I need to know for sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll send it to you. That's a you faux pas. Email on that thing? Yeah. Okay. What's, the fo what's his focus? AI, he, we're, we're going to be able to ask him <coughs> what, about AI. I mean, I, I think the fun thing with him is he'll help us speculate about like where AI is going. Yeah. Like, what can it do now and where will it be in 10 years? That's, right. that's essentially what I want to No great. cooking segment today. Okay. I am exported, so yeah, if you're waiting robot. on me, um, I'll be ready to go whenever everybody else is. I'm just eating yogurt yeah. in the meantime. Goofy. Ian, you could show my, uh, yeah. I love my it. iPad. I love it. Holy shit, dude. Can you zoom in? Steampunk. Yeah, it's a steampunk engine, basically. Love it. Hmm. Steampunk. Um, I just was experimenting with some flower still art kind of stuff. A flower? These, I had a, did a couple of uh, retro rockets. A beer. Nice. Yeah. I mean, the funnest thing was when you find an artistic style that you like and then doing different things in that style. That's also another robot. I did a robot attacking a city. Is that this one? Yeah. You see how it kind of oh, failed yeah, it's, it's... with the legs? That's the brittle part of the program. It doesn't know. It it has a hard time knowing how things interact with each other. You know? Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, that's where Dolly too is really is really. Good. But again, th there there are newer iterations of this. So like, I didn't try to do this. You could say do it with version one, version two, version three, version four. Um, Hello, so Dolly. Okay. Here's a more artistic one. This is a Hello, Dolly. scientist in a lab pop, pop art style with three colors. Yeah. See, that's the kind of artwork you would see in like a um, high school. No, well, a, bo <coughs> a board game. Uh, I've yeah, seen this, yeah, kind, yeah. this kind of art. Yeah. Um, again, I think that one of the primary uses of this is going to be D DMs. Candy corn. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Totally right. Cause we, oh, absolutely. If you're, if you're running a, a tabletop game, you need endless no doubt art. About it. Endless. Gaming, the world of gaming will. You could change. You could make characters. You could long. make settings. You could say you, to your players, "You come across yeah. this," you know, and then you. Well, also, be, you know, obviously, my other podcast like, is a board game. Podcast. Here's the village. You yeah. come across this village, and you know, and, and one of the greatest expenses <coughs> in board in, in in board game design is the artwork. Yeah. That, that you have to pay for. I mean, something like this, that expense is going to get like crushed down to near nothing. We, I'd imagine. I like this one. Guys, we had a question from the audience. Uh, yep. Oh, yeah, about the book. Yep, hit us. There it is. Who created the cover art, and why did you choose it? So, um, the publisher in-housed the uh, the cover art yep. for the book. So they have a team of people who that's Not what they long. do. <laughs> and no, I, 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 <laughs> honestly, half teasing. I, no, but that's a, that's an important question. What? I, I guarantee you that our publisher would not let an author make their own cover. Mm -hmm. So essentially what you would have is their in-house team would just use this themselves. Yeah, of course. As part of yeah. the process. Right. Um, so anyway, so we, it, that was a, um, 
you know, a lot of back and forth. There's a lot of back and forth where I don't know if we who fired the first salvo. I think we did, where we said this is the, like, the ideas we have for the cover of the book. They came back to us with an option we hated, uh -huh. and we sort of shot that down and we're like, no, please give us something like this. The hope that it was the hang up was they didn't want something that looked like a science fiction book. Right. Because this is not science fiction. That. This is this is. Science. Right, it needed to be immediately kind of obvious the, the, to a casual observer. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, this is not a not a science fiction book. That was so important. They're, was... they're, this is their marketing, you know, yeah, people. They're, like, sure. It's, it's, it, it's being marketed as a certain kind of book. It's got to be on the shelf. People have got to look at it and know what kind of book it is. We said, well, I get that, but this is like science fiction's in the subtitle of our book. Like it's, it's kind of hard to get kinda away. Big, yeah. From that, we need something that does both. We need something that evokes science fiction and science and the future. We, could have, we like both, country and western. So we <laughs> we sent them like 20 pictures that were like, this is the kind of stuff that we think will do that. We sent them a mood board, essentially. Yeah, mood board. They sent us back several more options, and <clears throat> we picked this one, this picture. And then there was some back... So, you know, so a few backs and forths with the, the typography, you know, the words and everything. But they, we, we deferred mostly to them on that. They wanted to have it be connected to the first book, but Continuity. look new enough. You yes. know, so that there was, you know, we, you know, it was, it was, it was tricky because we, we had to make their marketing team happy, their artistic team happy. And we had to be happy right. that it was reflecting yeah. our vision of our own book. But we finally settled on this, right. and I think, and we're all, everyone's happy. Very with happy. This. A couple yeah. of changes. The I remember this. The planet here was basically a splotch without the rings, and we and I think I suggested or someone suggested we got to <coughs> make that more obviously a planet. Yeah, and because of course just, the rings like really sell it. Otherwise, otherwise, it really yeah. wasn't clear what it was. Yeah, and I also liked. Can you see? Why don't you guys make it full screen? Do you have a picture on your iPad? Yeah, yeah. The rings I are do. cool. The book. <clears throat> There you go. Can you? So yeah, so that planet in the upper left was was didn't have the rings, and it wasn't obvious that it was rings a planet. Are a yeah. close to the planet. And you can't itself. see it here, but at the bottom of the screen, there's another little structure. Wait, I can fix it. Look at this picture got shifted. There you go. Wow. Yeah. One, ah, one of the things I wanted, I wanted to have more than just the three hemispherical structures and that tin can structure on the right. I said we got to need, we needed something in the foreground. So they threw that little that little doodad in the foreground to you know which I think made it you know I, I liked it I liked that addition hmm. but um but yeah we're very happy as soon as we saw it we're like that's yeah that's that's it you that's see those two people works. walking on the, the surface yeah that's me and Ian carrying gear to the next gate <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah you know we couldn't interfere with we had, like the a lot of the pictures that they that we submitted they're like yeah the problem is that words. this would obscure the, the the words you know the words are obviously they have to pop you know and it's a, there's a lot of moving parts to a book cover you know um that, and and the subtitle to the subtitle took us a while yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that, that, that can be challenging for the it. first book too the first mm -hmm. book the subtitle was was hard in fact i remember that um uh Kiki gave, Apparently uh, you don't remember. Yeah, no, she she came up with the Here. final formulation of it. Um, so, all right, we can get started. Wait, did you uh, finally uh, save so it? So we're ready for Ian now. Yeah, it's been exported for ages. I told you that. <laughs> no, it's, uh, <laughs> come on, I, I was I was away from the desk. <clears throat> uh huh. Kara, I heard that killer was on. I didn't see him. Killer. He was. I was eating yogurt, and he loves the yogurt cups. So he was following me around, but wanna, I just gave him. Does he want to lick the yogurt out of it? Yeah. Yeah, whenever I finish me. eating the yogurt, he wants to like clean the yogurt cup, so I always give them to him. I hope I get to meet him. It's the yogurt drink. It's his favorite. Killer. He's going hard on it in the corner right now. <laughs> oh. That's, uh, it could be interpreted many ways. <laughs> Steve, what do you want oh, to do for dinner dog. tonight? Anybody got any ideas? Mm -hmm. Order something. Food. Yeah, we should order it, you know, beforehand because I don't want to wait. Go. 
two steaks. I'm literally right now. I'm digesting myself, and I need. I want to eat something. We I just know, talked I'm so about hungry. The, I'm gonna uh, drink a protein shake. The thing you ate this morning. You said it was doing. Yeah, hungry. I know, but I mean, it's not like it's it's super easy. I, I, could, <laughs> I could make it to dinner time. Okay, I, I see what you're saying. But I, I'm already. Bob, have you tried these yet? It. What? These protein, protein shakes, my favorite What's protein shakes. Are we ready? Because mm-hmm. we have our interview at four, so oh, we better get a half hour. Oh, yeah. geez, that's gonna be like one news. Hour. How many, pr- how many, how many grams of protein and how many calories? Thirty grams of protein, one hundred fifty right. calories. We're, we're, here we go. That's good. Mm-hmm. <coughs> it's still Saturday, September twenty fourth. Okay. Is it? Yes. Oh, I need to In start rolling. Zone, yes. Yeah. Ian, we're good. Uh, yeah, we're rolling. All right. Rolling, rolling, rolling. I'm good too. All right, here we go. Hello and welcome to The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. Today is Saturday, September 24th, 2022, and this is your host, Stephen Novella. Joining me this week are Bob Novella. Hey, everybody. Cara Santa Maria. Howdy. Jay Novella. Hey, guys. And Evan Bernstein. Good afternoon, folks. So, no, you are not listening to the episode that aired at the end of September. We are recording two episodes on this day. This episode's coming out in December when we're on our trip to Arizona for Mm. our live shows in Arizona. Uh, This is part two of a six-hour live streaming show that we did. Uh, We recorded two SGU episodes. This is the second one. So this is the episode four sometime in the middle of December. I forget exactly what date will come out. All right. So we're going to get right to um, some... Uh, some bits for you guys. We have an interview coming up very quickly with an AI expert. But Kara, you are going to start us off with what's the word? Yes. So I came across something really fun that I think you guys will enjoy. It is a um, website that was started by a man named Jesse Scheidlower. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. He created the Historical Dictionary of Science Fiction. It went live during the pandemic because he was home a lot and he was bored. I think he used to work for like the Oxford English Dictionary. Um, It's got 1,800 entries. I think it's always growing. And it has information about where these terms, these science fiction terms were first coined. He has the passage from where they were used and a little bit of background about the author. So I thought it would be fun to go into the historical cool. dictionary of science fiction and talk about some common words that, of course, you may or may not know were developed by science fiction writers, but are used all the time now in common science parlance. So the very first one, and it's probably the most famous example of this pretty much across all the coverage that I see online, everybody cites this one first, is the word robot. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. oh, you, you are. guys know? Yeah, oh, you, you are. are. Yep. <clears throat> right. So, robot actually, even before robot was first used, um, I think it was, well, gosh, it's been used by so many different writers. Um, a lot of people will remember some of the more recent uh, uses. But before anything, it was actually used in a play by a Czech um, writer, and I probably can't pronounce their name. Maybe it's Chapek. Mm -hmm. Uh, Does anybody know it in Czech with the little thing over the C? Is that a Ch Uh sound? I'm not sure. Um, But this Czech author wrote um, a play called Rossum's Universal Robots. Mm -hmm. That's the translated title in which he used the word robot for the first time. And robot came from the, um, I think, the Latin for forced labor and that's where the word robot really came into play and so then it's been iterated multiple times um since then but the idea really early on this was back in 1920 and the idea since then has often come from this idea of forced labor uh use of labor in factories use of labor in um armies cheap labor that's where robots come from and today they still kind of carry that um vibe i guess but obviously it's grown to mean so much more than that just like a non-human technological um thing that does something right that does work Mm -hmm. um okay before you go off the robot though the the, uh the idea of of a robot kind of goes back to the ancient greeks you know there was this idea that oh, just not with the word robot not with the word robot just well but right. you think about mechanical things displacing the labor of humans right mm-hmm. that's basically yeah. the basic idea of a yeah, robot yeah actually this is super old <clears throat> yeah but the first time the word robot was used was yeah. by this but, czech um playwright and then of course a lot of people 
think of it, it from 1940 when Asimov wrote about the actual field of robotics and he mm-hmm. had a character uh, who was a roboticist. And so that's where it really did explode. So first use in the 20s, but then in the 40s, it exploded into our lexicon and it was used all the time mm-hmm. after that. Okay, so how about another one? Did you guys know that the word genetic engineering came from science fiction? No, oh, which, where? Cool. Well, the, the, right, not so the, this the word, they, was, they took the two words and I've, put them together. Right? I have all my references. <laughs> this was from Jack Williamson's novel, Dragon's Island. Oh, um, yeah. And there was an occup- occupation within the novel of a genetic engineer, um, or no, genetic engineering started in that novel, and then it took several years before genetic engineer, the occupation was named um, by somebody named Powell Anderson. Um, so let me see which, and you know, Asimov used it also in the 70s, but in 1951 was when Williamson used uh, in Dragon's Island, quote, I was expecting to find that mutation lab filled with some sort of apparatus for genetic engineering. Kara, I, I, just, I, I just finished a series of books and they, they kept saying throughout, engineering. Geneering. Geneering. Oh, yes. oh, love it. <laughs> that and that was a modern that modern that? sci-fi series? Yeah, well, twenty within 20 years. Okay, yeah, yeah. It was 95, so actually, an... so it's, you know, not recent, but... Here's another one that you guys might think, or maybe you know this, maybe you don't. Zero Gravity or oh, Zero G. Yeah. This started in sci-fi, and this one's really fascinating because it was all the way back in 1938. The author... Binder, J. Binder, um, Jack Binder. He was actually, he's a comic book artist and he created Daredevil. He used this in uh, his essay, If Science Reached the Earth's Core. And he wasn't talking about zero gravity in space. He was talking about zero gravity in the core right. of the earth. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you would float ah. at the center of the earth because you're being pulled in, in, from every, every direction, direction from equally. the gravity of the mass of the earth. So yeah. And then later in 1952, Arthur C. Clarke abbreviated the term and made G- a zero G in his novel Islands in the Sky. And that's when it started to take uh, place in space. Cool. All right. Although now it's been, more it's been here. replaced by There's microgravity. So many, yeah. Yeah. So right, NASA right, right. uses oh. the term microgravity now. And I wonder right, if, well, yeah, I wonder if they, yeah. so they were like, let's be scientific about it. Let me yeah, see. It's, it's oh, no technically a little bit more accurate. Microgravity. Okay. Um, so then, of course, alien. The word alien, which no kind way. of is still you we, we've gotten away from the modern usage uh, as it relates to the historical usage was that was a person from another country or mm-hmm. from another place. Mm-hmm. Right. So alien it, from a location other than one's own. But now we we, d- we don't tend to use words like illegal aliens anymore. Right. That's quite mm-hmm. offensive. Um, and we've kind of uh, advanced our. Um, our labels, but that's where the word really started. And ultimately that's how it kind of translated into this idea of beings from other planets. So it's all, it's long been um, used to talk about like something being foreign or something being from somewhere else. But let me see the first person to use it uh, in, in the way of somebody from another planet was a Victorian historian and essayist named Thomas Carlyle. Um, and then apparently in science fiction, we didn't really start seeing the use of alien regularly as a catch-all for like ETs for extraterrestrials until 1929 when Jack Williamson's story, The Alien Intelligence, was published in a Science Wonder Stories um, collective. And then finally, I found some cool stuff with like computer terms. So the word worm, you remember computer worms? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, right. Once read so, many. Mm-hmm. So this was not developed by computer scientists. This was actually came out in a story by uh, Brunner. Um, let me see. What is his first name? John Brunner in 1975, his novel was called shockwave writer. And so here is one of the, there are two citations in it, but the earliest in the book is, Uh, Here we go. Fluckner had resorted to one of the oldest tricks in the store and turned loose in the continental net a self-perpetuating tapeworm, probably headed by a denunciation group borrowed from a major corporation, which would shunt itself from one nexus to another every time his credit code was punched into a keyboard. It could take days to kill a worm like that and sometimes weeks. Mm -hmm. So this is our first usage of a computer worm. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Very cool. Don't hear that 
word very often anymore, but. No, you don't, but it's uh, pretty, pretty cool when these kinds of things are first dreamed up. And we, you oh, know, yeah. we hear about this with Star Trek all the time. Yeah. There's like a million examples we can pull from Star Trek, but it's so cool that this uh, one individual, again, I want to give him like huge props here. His name is Jesse Scheidlower and he was already a word nerd. And he said that because he was kind of home all the time and had the time to do it, he got this site up and running during the pandemic and it's called the sfdictionary.com, the science fiction dictionary. So look it up. You can, you can have yeah, some fun no, on there. Neat. Sounds okay. cool. <clears throat> All right. Thanks, Kara. Evan, yep. you're going to start off the news items telling us about an electric plane. Yeah, electric airplane in the news this week. Uh, out of Sweden, a company called Heart Aerospace. Their mission is right from their website. Their mission is to create the world's greenest, most affordable, and most accessible form of transport, grounded in the outlook that electric air travel will become the new normal for regional flights and can be trans transformational in addressing the industry's key sustainability challenges. So on September 15th, they had something called Hangar Day, in which all their employees, all the everybody in the company, and then invited guests come out to their big, big, big hangar, and they made major announcements. Their, their, their biggest announcement was that they have been working on an airplane, an electric, all-electric airplane called the ES-19. It was, it's designed to be a 19-passenger airplane, entirely powered, but with batteries. Now, they got, it to, they got that to the point in which they made a scale model, and that actually did fly, and that was uh, as of this past summer. But their announcement today is that they're stepping it up. It's now the ES-30, a 30-passenger plane and all of their company's efforts are now going to go into making this design the other part of this announcement that is significant is that they've got orders for this thing and they have orders from some pretty big hitters in the industry including air canada mesa or mesa m-e-s-a united airlines here in the united states and air new zealand are among them who have either put in actual purchase orders um, or have uh, basically said, yeah, we're very interested in, in getting these airplanes to the tune of hundreds of these things that they're, that they're putting in orders cool. for now. Uh, let's wow. talk a little bit about the plane itself. Um, it's not built yet, first of all. Uh, however, they did... It's right there, man. But they have the specs. Yeah, they have, they have the specs <laughs> for it, and they, have the, and they have the test fuselage all built out inside one of the hangars that's, that's hooked up to all the computers and all the simulators mm -hmm. and everything. And they say that everything in that simulation is is working as it's supposed to. What what kind of battery does it have? Uh, it's going to be battery source, battery is primary. Five tons of lithium ion batteries right now. Yeah. yeah so that's a that obviously a comes. It's a lot. How many tons? And five five tons. tons. Okay. Is what yeah. it, is what it is. Yep. It's kind of weird. Of the, the fuselage is kind of weird. Like I mean, it, it almost looks like a seaplane. That's probably the battery. Yeah, right? the batteries are are are, are loaded down there in its belly as as it were oh, that's a lot of bad. i'd like to see with the landing gear down yeah yeah that would that that would be that would be neat to see i wonder how hot it gets uh yeah and right so hot and you know fires the heat things, to, right so heat how, the cabin how are you, yeah how, how 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 does that exactly uh work but they must have it figured out wouldn't be surprised if someone from sweden here is uh in the chat maybe and has heard about this news this past week uh, the range, 200 kilometers right now if you're going to use the batteries, okay? However, it does also in the tail section, uh, or right below where the tail is at the very end of the plane, there is a uh, liquid fuel uh, reserve, essentially, so you can double the, the range mm -hmm. with that. And you, you would have that built into these planes in case, you know, because when you're in flight, you may have to get suddenly diverted to other yeah. airports or other, or other routes. So it's there strictly... As as a contingency for those kinds it, of uh, emergencies, but 100 kilometers just off the 200 battery. kilometers just off the batteries from takeoff to from takeoff to landing. If you go, if you kick in that that <coughs> hybrid system though, yeah, 400. Oh, you, you can 200 or 400. It's 200 400. or 400. so 200. That's 
small city to small city routes. That's right. And this was a particular goal, be, uh, that a threshold that they had to reach because before this, I believe their 19 maybe had, uh, I think it was in the, like 140 or 150. And it wasn't quite enough yeah. from the perspective of the um, not airlines enough, not enough themselves. Routes. Right. They couldn't make the routes. But getting to that 200 kilometers yeah. uh, ticks boxes and gets you from, mm-hmm. from, from uh, real uh, yeah. po- destinations to destinations that you need to get so to. So how about in-air recharging? Uh, yeah, wouldn't that be? But they, yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> how long would that take? I mean, how long would it take to, to fully charge? Forget it. But the thing is, the, the, this this is filling a niche niche uh, for a part of the airline industry, obviously, because you are dealing with short routes. So there, there, there is the, right. What do you have right now for refueling on short routes? Nothing, because it, it yeah, yeah, you don't yeah. need it. So the, so basically the same premise. You don't. You wouldn't. We necessarily have to design this thing with a need to recharge mid-flight. It's not like you're going across the ocean oh, yeah. or but something. What's the recharge time after it lands? Like, uh, 30 minutes, I think, is what they said. 30. Yep, turnaround time, 30-minute fast charge. Fast charge, and, it may, and maybe yeah. there's some other quicker, you know, Damn, longer that, charge. I don't know what that does to the battery life or the life of the airplane, but that's what they're saying, 30-minute turnaround time right there on their maximum altitude, 20,000 feet, which is apparently where you need to be for these this level it basically ticks all the boxes that the um jet uh, that the that the propeller planes right now on these routes yeah. are, are filling and it, it meets it meets it price wise mm-hmm. also so that's these are all the points that they're that they made with this announcement is that it's here right we've got it, it, it the specs are here we're going to build this thing out we'll get this thing tested and, and in the air within within a couple years and we're going to enter these things into service by 2028 2028 2028 yeah, is, is the I goal. bet you and between now and then I bet you the batteries are going to be better well sure. that's the other thing is that they said we're just dealing with what the technology we've got now yeah. and we're counting on things to uh, to get better with the battery technology yeah no doubt about it Ev, I'm sorry did you say its range uh, yeah 200, 200, 200 kilometers also um, you could Slap some organic solar cells on top of those wings. Um, you know, not you can't put like silicon <laughs> panels on there. They'd probably be more heavy than they were worth. Mm. But organic are thin and light, and you know, very easy. Then they're not that efficient. But if they if we get the efficiency up to those like uh, above twenty percent, mm-hmm. I bet you that could add, you know, 40, 50 kilometers to the range. It probably you know? could. Someone's asking in the chat whether they're flying right now. Obviously, this model's not flying right now. They still have to build it. The models that are flying that are all electric seem to be these single or two passenger yeah. uh, planes, you know, the Cessna kind kind of kind of models. So those are out there to be had. I've seen video. I've seen videos on it. I read news. I news items about it in the last couple of years. Those have been out and are being tested. Military is definitely looking into mm-hmm. them uh, as options. But what we're talking about here is commercial. Um, the commercial airline industry. Now, I and I always thought it was going to be a problem with with takeoff and getting enough thrust, getting those fans in the engines to turn to turn fast enough to get the no, thrust. The batteries thrust have need. a lot of power. But yeah, no, it, it, that 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 is not a pr- not an issue. Yeah, it's just you know they say what are, it just. However, they said if you're going to do it with fuel, with batteries, or with hamsters on a wheel, it, says, it doesn't matter. You just have to be able to be generate enough power. Yeah. Now the power density of the batteries. You know, jet, the 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 fuel to run the air the airplanes. Mm-hmm. Is, it's much you know denser energy energy yeah. with the fuel, but the batteries are catching up. Yeah. And like you said, Steve, and within you know five years, next generation of batteries that are coming out, they can only be better. So, yeah, it'll, it'll so only get better. So if they cross that threshold, then that's it. Then then yeah, it'll just get incrementally better from there. Have you ever been on one of those like a prop plane for a short flight? Like Absolutely, a, I have. Been. Yeah, yeah, they suck. Yeah, they're uncomfortable. They're, scary, and kind they're of, they loud. Are. The worst is they're loud and they vibrate, you know. But these are supposed silent. to be a lot quieter. A lot quieter, practically yeah, so silent. Probably a much more enjoyable experience Certainly than from the what's noise currently filling those, the, those, uh, those routes. Yeah. So yeah, commercial uh, battery powered flight. Here it. Here we go. Yeah. A couple years. And then, um, there's already solid state solid lithium-ion batteries mm-hmm. um they haven't quite gone into mass production i think japan is working it has one that they're it's actually commercially being used but when that hits those have about twice the energy density as the Ooh, regular that's a nice game changer there. yeah so either it's half the weight or twice the range yeah, or some combination right. of those two things wow that's a near-term upgrade 
I mean, that's something that we could see in like widespread commercial use by the end of the century, and that century by the end of the decade. Uh, definitely. I mean, there's already some versions of them in use, uh, but that that could be like a little jump, you know, like to twice the energy density. Well, well why eight years from now? I mean, what's what's well, because the pro- yeah, I don't know. I mean, the production pro- it's it's always that commercialization, ramping up the industrialization of it. You know, doing it on a small scale is just is just different. So it could be quicker. You know, we'll see. Could be a few years. Um, but that for this kind of thing, that's really what it's waiting for, is you know the batteries just to cross that threshold. Where, mm-hmm. You know, it, it's usable. But, but yeah, it's good to hear that it's we're, on the there, way. we're there. Um, all right. So. This is going to be a quickie. This will be a good one to just fill in. Before. So we, have, we have an AI interview coming up in about 15 minutes with an AI expert. And um, so I just want to talk about uh, the upcoming strongest laser for the United States, right? So this is not the strongest laser in the world, but it puts it up there with the strongest lasers that exist. And the strength this of lasers... Zeta watt. Zeta. Yeah, oh, yeah, okay. But yeah. but Bob, it's a zeta watt equivalent. What so does that, tell what that, that mean? Well, it's a short. It's a well, it's a super short pulse. Like like we're talking, uh, you know, femto. That's not seconds. what makes it an equivalent. Multiple lasers gaining, equivalent. like ganging up to make the zeta watt. Nope. It's it's well, you're pulling in right laser idea. power from an alternate dimension, so alternate universe. It's <laughs> the uh, it's the Zeus is the is the the laser. Yeah. Have you heard about that? The yeah. Zeus. Yeah. Yeah. So it. Apparently, the laser part of it itself gets up to uh, 300 petawatts. Okay, yeah. And Respectable. What they do is they feed supercharged electrons into it, and that gets the effective power up to what a zeta-watt laser would produce. No shit. But the laser part of it itself is in a zeta-watt laser. It's a 300 petawatt laser. Wow, I didn't So that's why they had to use the term... Zeta watt equivalent, equivalent in terms of the mm. power that it produces, but it's basically like having a zeta watt laser. Um, it's like those projectors that have like uh, uh, lumens, and it's not really lumens. Yeah, it's right. Mix or some equivalent. Yeah, yeah, lumen sh- equivalent. Yeah. Crap. But damn, man. Okay. That's, that's yeah. interesting and upsetting at the same time. Yeah. But you know, it's a, at the end of the day, it's effectively a super yeah. powerful laser. I mean, zeta watt is um, it's ten to the twenty-one, I think. Yeah, it's it's incredibly that's, powerful. That's a lot of a whole lot of watts. But you're right; time. it's 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 very very brief in terms of because oh, obviously yeah. they don't have well, the energy to, to have right. that thing going for any length of time. Um, so what would you? And it's good. You know, so they're going to try it. They're going to get it up in in um, stages. In stages, yeah, in series. So they're first going to shoot it up at only like one um not even petawatt what's before petawatt Peta, ex, uh, it's um, exa exawatt no 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 gigawatt no nope. wait um tera wait tera one terawatt okay. yeah i think they're gonna yeah it's gonna start at like one terawatt okay. then they're gonna go up by orders of magnitude until they get up to the maximum strength of the 300 petawatts and then um they're gonna get it up to the max to the the, the equivalent of the uh the, the one zeta watt um all right so what's this really powerful laser for what's it going to do primarily it's for research right this is primarily going to be for research um with this you could create super hot plasmas for example um how hot you might ask so hot that we can actually do experiments Big bang. on the physics well they said black holes like um, okay like the physics near black holes where you have this, you know, super super hot uh, plasma. Um, you know, they always make general statements about like this will help us, you know, research the quantum nature of the universe without getting into a lot of details because they're not, yeah, like sure. they're not designing experiments yet, or at least not, you know, in the reporting that I'm seeing. It, but that's just theoretically, you're gonna, you you could use this laser to create super high energy physics, which will get you right. into the but what about a Clark gluon plasma? Does it get to that level? Gluon. It might be able to. I don't know. But we'll, you know, they didn't comment on that specifically. Okay. But I think that's the kind of thing that they're talking about. So it just gives us access to new physics in terms of experiments because the energy is so incredibly intense. They also said they could use it for like X-raying very small things, right? Because, but this of course would be the extremely brief, you know, pulse 
but at high energy, it al allows you to penetrate um, things that you otherwise wouldn't be able to see the interior of. So, uh, like metals nice. and, and stones and things like that. Yeah. So, um, it, you know, it, it could also be used in research that way. Um, again, I think it's not exactly like a portable uh, or a, a record player. Yeah, it's not. It's not a portable laser. <laughs> It's, so, I think everyone when you when you when you hear about like the most the powerful laser you know, that we have or ever or whatever, your mind pretty quickly goes to could this be a doomsday weapon? You know, could <laughs> yeah, right. Are we going to blow up Alderaan with what this? are the military uh, applications of this? Held, you know, <laughs> laser <laughs> pistol. But this doesn't, you know, wouldn't be useful for that sort of thing. It's not you know not portable enough, not sustainable enough. Um, Bob, a little bit later in this episode, you're going to be talking about laser sails, light yeah, sails, yeah. basically. And I, you know, I tried to find any mention of using this kind of laser for that application, and, and oh, thank no, you for doing that. Nobody brought it up. Yeah, I mean, that's... but I, and I don't know if that's just because it's not the first thing you think of, or yeah, that it's, it's just not really useful for this. Probably because it's too short. Again, oh, absolutely. You need absolutely. you need sustained. Yeah. Um, lasers. You also and that, yeah, and that's just a matter of having. You know, I thought multiple the, the, lasers too. The, yeah. the resources, um, but also you probably don't want it to be that hot, right? You don't want to burn up. Yeah, you don't want to destroy the, destroy what you're right. trying to ship yeah. around. Yeah. There's got to be a sweet spot in terms of, you know, how how energy intense you want that. Depending laser on the to material be. you're making your sail out of. But yeah, to foreshadowing, I like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll 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 be talking about that more. Like what what kind of lasers would we want? What we need for for light sails, because I think the you know, laser-driven light sails, as we're going to talk about, are going to be important yeah. to the future of space travel. Um, Maybe, probably. Yeah. But there are other countries out there that have more powerful lasers already. This isn't even, this won't even, even at maximum I, well, what power, are they, what are they powerful laser what, in the world. And are they using those yeah. lasers for the same purposes? Yeah, basically. It's basically mm -hmm. a research tool. Yeah, I was actually doing a search recently for the most powerful, and I came across Zeus here. Yeah. Um, but they it said United States. I'm like, oh, wait, no, I'm talking the world. What's, yeah. And it didn't, uh, my, I had a, Ooh, you know, classified. Away. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it'll be, it, I can't imagine though. I wonder if they're equivalent. I wonder if, they, if the real number one right now, I wonder if it's equivalent equivalent or uh, yeah yeah right I, would think I think so probably. i think so i mean that seems like a, an interesting and cheap way to mm -hmm. really upscale your super powerful laser yeah it's a good example of you know of, of the fact that humans are clever you know that uh even when we run into theoretical limitations and we've seen this all the time this is the theoretical limit for whatever like there's the diffraction limit we'll never be able to image something smaller than this and then we find metamaterials that get around yeah. the Trixie. Yeah, that get around the diffraction. Oh, mm. we're just going to cheat. And we're really good at figuring out how to cheat the system. I want to say this is like the most powerful laser that we could make with, you know, the equipment that we have. And then they figure out a way to cheat. What if we feed super high energy electrons into it, and then you get the equivalent of a, of a more powerful laser than should be able to exist with the materials that we have. Mm. It's a fascinating so, idea. I can't wait to read more about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is just very, very early reporting. This is sort of a quickie news item because the, the reporting is very early. Uh, clearly, um, you know, it, it, you know, it hasn't been, you know, turned on yet, and, and it's going to take years to get it up to full power. And then, so probably in a few years, we'll be reading about the research that's being done uh, done with this laser. But it, but you know, but the zeta watt equivalent is a good threshold that I thought it was worth mentioning. Yeah, zeta is huge. I mean, ten to the twenty-one. That's that's uh, an immensely large yeah, number. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I hear Ian talking to our AI expert right now. So, Ooh. um, Are you ready? yeah, we're ready. If he's ready. Okay, hey, what's his name? Hi. Hi, Mark. How are Hi. you? Hello. Hi. Welcome to the Skeptics Guide. Thank you for joining us. So um, can you tell our audience a little bit about yourself and your expertise? Yeah. So um, my, uh, my background's in cognitive science and uh, artificial intelligence. And I kind of work on uh, kind of the intersection of computer science and psychology, studying how kind of people, uh, human cognition works kind of how 
people solve problems, how that compares to how machines solve problems, uh, and trying to understand kind of the general principles of uh, kind of problem solving and uh, intelligence. So what I'm hearing is that when we finally get an artificial general intelligence, you're going to be their first psychotherapist. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Okay. Awesome. Um, but but let's back up a little bit to the world of narrow AI, where where we are now. And so tell us what kind of work you do. Are you, are you trying to model um, narrow AI after how the human brain works? Is that kind of what you're studying? Um, so no, I kind of I'm approaching things from a much more kind of uh, psychological cognitive perspective than uh, neuro perspective. Okay, just more um, so yeah, more basic principle about how thinking works, not necessarily how the human brain works. Yeah, exactly. Um, and trying to understand kind of like, yeah, how, how can we can understand kind of people as thinkers and reasoners in a more general sense? Um, and how does that compare to how, how machines are like current machines and AI systems are uh, reasoning and to the extent they are reasoning and solving problems? Um, Mark, is the goal to, yeah. to make the AI uh, software think more like a human or, or is it just useful information to have when you're, when you're figuring out what, you know, how to program it? Yeah, so there, there are really two goals, I think, of uh, kind of the research kind of field that I'm in, computational cognitive science. One is uh, to kind of use general principles developed in AI and kind of tools and formal methods from AI to model human cognition um, in a way that we can better understand how people are solving problems um, and kind of understand things like perception and memory uh, in, in, in terms that are like precise enough to make uh, kind of quantitative predictions and stuff like that. Um, and then the other side of it is kind of developing better models and kind of predictive general models of how people kind of think and solve problems and perceive and remember things so that, you know, we can use that to design AI systems that kind of understand how humans think and work and design better interfaces and stuff like that. Cool. I mean, some, some of the research in this area that I've read, it sounds like a lot of it is going from the AI to the cognitive theory. Like, AIs are narrow AIs are doing things. We don't know how they're doing it. You're trying to figure out how they do it so we can better understand just cognitive science itself. Is that kind of what you're doing? Yeah, so uh, a lot of the a lot of the research is going from kind of the AI formalisms and ideas for you know how to even build how, like kind of how you would engineer a AI system gives you a lot of insight into how you would you, how you can kind of reverse engineer yeah. the human mind and, and human cognition and intelligence. Um, so there's been a lot of uh, kind of direction that way uh, recently. Um, but there's actually a long history also of the other way, kind of thinking uh, in psychology uh, more formally. Uh, a lot of kind of core ideas in AI kind of originated in mathematical psychology and kind of computational cognitive science. Things like connectionist uh, theories are the foundation of deep neural networks today. Um, and uh, a lot of things from uh, a lot of uh, like these kind of form, these kind of uh, reinforcement learning algorithms, the ones that were able to solve like chess and go and beat humans in these in these games. A lot of the kind of basic principles from that were developed uh, in studying like learning, associative learning in mm -hmm. like rats and stuff. So, th so there's direction that way. Um, and so I, I do a little bit of both. My research uh, is kind of trying to develop new uh, formalism, kind of new theories of, of how humans are solving problems and, and use that kind of in the AI direction. Mm -hmm. So a big thing that I've been focused on lately is thinking about uh, how do people kind of approach problems and kind of model problems and kind of construct a mental model of problems um, in a way that's very flexible uh, and kind of general uh, in a way that a lot of AI systems can't right now. Like you were saying, there's like narrow AI. It's like very focused on a single task. It's yeah. a single task. What's kind of cool about humans is that we can do a whole bunch of things. Like I can jump on this podcast and start talking to you about stuff, even though I've never done it before. Yeah. I can go cook a cake, bake a cake, whatever. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, does I mean, how much uh, in your research do you get involved with the question of like what are the things that AI is better at than people, and what are the things that people are better at than AI? Even as powerful as AI is getting. It sounds like there are still things that we do that that they can't do. Yeah. So um, yeah. So that's a very big active question right now, especially since we're seeing all these AI systems uh, solve problems that for a long time we thought only humans could do. Like I was saying, like playing chess really well and 
uh, identifying objects and classifying things, um, large language models and so on. Um, I think uh, currently a lot of the big questions are around things like uh, uh, kind of being able to generate new new concepts and like generate new kind of combinations of concepts is something that people are really good at, but mm -hmm. AI, like kind of current AI. The other thing is like kind of what counts as AI kind of shifts over time. Yeah. So like 20 years ago, like like what Google Maps is doing every day kind of routing yeah. a routing a routing algorithm would have been considered like AI like artificial intelligence but now it's like just an algorithm that you use on your phone um, so so the kind of what counts as AI is always shifting but I think right now um, and for a long time right now and especially because right now a lot of the systems are like, like these like statistical machine learning systems that learn uh, that, that don't have a lot of kind of internal structure to them they uh, they're not very good at uh, kind of kind of compositional reasoning that humans are good at things like uh, you know if you if you understand what like a cat is um, you can kind of imagine like a red cat or a purple cat or something like that even though you've never seen it those kinds of uh, generalizations are much harder for uh, like neural networks and kind of standard machine learning systems. So um, we, yeah. we we talk a lot about AI on the on the show and so it's good to have an expert on to. And one of the things I want would, would love to have is if you could, if you wouldn't mind giving us like a really brief synopsis of like what is a neural network versus machine learning versus deep learning, you know. So the the the, the big major concept because I know we we throw them around a lot and probably a huge chunk of our audience doesn't really understand what they are. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, let's start with the neural network. So a, a neural network is basically a. Um, it's a it's a big matrix of numbers. Uh, you can kind of think of it as you know if you kind of had a machine where there were like knobs on it, you could mm -hmm. kind of turn them, and there were kind of like there was kind of like uh, an image coming through, and you could you could tune it to like kind of uh, translate that image in some way. Like it would kind of filter things in a different way. Uh, a neural network is kind of a, a abstraction of that kind of general idea of there's kind of like a, a kind of array of signals coming in and uh, they're kind of passing through a bunch of filters, and you can kind of tune what each filter is doing. And um, uh, big neural networks have a lot of tunable parameters, basically, a lot of knobs that you can turn. And a lot of and deep learning is just a deep a deep version of that, where you have a lot of like layer, what are called layers of ne of neurons um, that you can tune, and that kind of gives it the flexibility to kind of transform an input in a very complicated way um, to give an output, like, you know, taking an image of a, of a cat, of an animal and classify it as a dog or a cat. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, basically deep learning is this kind of very s re relatively simple algorithm of kind of, as you feed in uh, an input and get an output, if you know what the output should be, you can say, you can kind of give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down and the kind of system is designed to kind of back propagate that information to like adjust the parameters a little bit so it does a little bit better next time and you just mm -hmm. do this a lot and eventually the whole thing kind of kind of like moves through this big parameter space and kind of learns how to basically classify things that mm -hmm. way kind of learns the right set of tuned parameters um, is that where that training comes in yeah so that's the whole idea of training yeah yeah um, yeah, and uh, so it's like yeah, a billion and then, trial and trial and error a billion times until it exactly tweaks it. Yeah, perfectly. exactly. You're kind of it's it's very it's like trial yeah. and error kind of driven learning. It's error. It, yeah, kind of actually the technical mm -hmm. term is error driven learning. Um, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and then machine learning is actually a broader uh, mm -hmm. category, which refers to not just neural networks, but like a whole range of um, methods. Uh, but uh, I think what unifies them all is that they're kind of all based on uh, kind of statistical ideas mm -hmm. of uh, kind of you're you're trying to kind of like estimate uh, you're, you, there's like uncertainty about the world and you're trying to estimate the best model of the world or the best set of parameters uh, to like explain something or fit some data. So if um, you had to like uh, do a fl like a visual. Uh... Uh, description with sort of umbrellas is AI the largest umbrella or is machine learning the largest umbrella like which category subsumes each other category yeah it's, I, they're kind of like partially overlapping umbrellas mm -hmm. 
Um, and uh, yeah, AI, like I said, AI is always shifting. These days, AI tends to refer more to these kind of statistical machine learning like approaches. Um, but kind of classically, AI also referred to uh, what's kind of called good old fashioned AI or GoFi, which is <laughs> um, like uh, this idea, kind of more and more what's called like symbolic reasoning. Uh, so things like kind of planning, uh, kind of problem solving, kind of uh, kind of reasoning in a more structured way. Whereas like the 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 domains that uh, kind of statistical machine learning works really well in are domains where uh, are things like perception, um, kind of classifying images um, and settings where you just have like a lot of data. You can kind of chug through that data, and there's like kind of some underlying pattern in the data that no no single person could like write a set of rules to describe um but it's like it's there and it can be kind of learned in this flexible kind of tabula rasa way um ai i think yeah and so like ai those kind of like whereas those symbolic kind of approaches uh they're they're they tend to be less data driven classically and they're mm -hmm. much more kind of like you have like a big complicated problem that you know what it is but it's just really complicated and you need like to be smart about how you solve that problem as opposed to kind of learning through trial and error, um, kind of how to how, how to like perceive something or kind of fit pattern match essentially. So there's kind of a, people often make a distinction between like pattern uh, recognition, um, which is kind of more statistical machine learning approach and like symbolic reasoning, which is this more kind of, kind of deductive thinking and, and kind of structured reasoning. But uh, I think the big thing right now is how do we kind of bridge these two approaches? Because obviously people are doing both of these things, doing a lot of both reasoning and complex perception and, and and kind of action. And then so neural nets, which are a sort of sort of subsumed underneath machine learning, that's like the engine by which some machine learning takes place. Is it would you say that neural nets are sort of it now? Is that what most people are putting their chips down on? Or is it just one of many equally effective approaches to machine learning? Yeah, it's one of many approaches. And right now, it is, it's probably the most effective when you have a lot of data, when you have a yeah. lot of... Like when you can data. scrub the internet. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, OK. Mark, what, what okay. would you say like the most complicated thing that some artificial intelligence software is doing today? Oh, the most complicated. I mean, it's or, it's, or give an example of like, yeah, you know, like it hitting really hard. What, what's it? What is AI doing today that's really impressive or, or considered top of the game? I mean, like, one of the most impressive things that's going on right now is like, uh, you know, things like these game playing algorithms that uh, can basically that beat people at, at games that require very, like, long term planning, and like, mm -hmm. look ahead. Mm -hmm. um, and like, you know, kind of thinking about the, what the other person is going to do. Um, I think, yeah, so these like competitive. So like I think chess and basically, go. chess and go, essentially, are, are they're like competitive, uh, well-defined games where uh, we have really good methods for for solving them, and it's not just a kind of pattern recognition thing. It's it's a combination of pattern recognition and uh, symbolic reasoning and reasoning. So these these so these systems that solve chess and go, they're combining both uh, 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 pattern recognition, kind of recognizing patterns on the board, yeah. with planning, with kind of uh, what's called heuristic search, kind of searching through a tree of possibilities and they're using the patterns to kind of guide the search through the tree um and yeah i don't know this it's very impressive because i think like yeah we think of game playing as kind of a very human activity like mm. no other animals mm. play games like this yeah other animals like perceive things and can move through the world and and stuff but only humans can seem to do this kind of uh uh kind of symbolic reasoning in like very large state spaces um so it, it does yeah. seem like the AI applications are getting really powerful over the last five to 10 years. Like we just, they hit their stride and we're seeing all these applications now, like, again, like beating the world champion in Go and the new like art generating software, that you kind know, of folding stuff. Proteins or folding proteins. Folding like proteins, a lot of stuff that is happening. And I've been trying to find out, I've asked multiple people, you know, experts in different ways, like what they think about it. One of them told me that like, the AI itself is not necessarily getting better. It's just that we're getting better at training them and we have better yeah. data sets to train mm -hmm. them with. 
Do you agree with that, or do you think that we're getting better at the underlying hardware, like the underlying um, programs themselves, or is it just that we're getting better at training them? So I think uh, most of it, most of the like current like progress is due to uh, a lot of improvements in the engineering, mm -hmm. better being better at training them. I think the hardware is is part of that. Uh, Kind of developing special like a big thing that's happened in the last 10 years is um like uh w they figured out how to kind of take what are called like gpus graphical processing units um that are typically used in computers to like render graphics and stuff and the types of computations that those things do are basically what neural networks have to do yep, and they do yep. them really quickly they're great and so yeah and so uh they've been able to kind of build on that technology to get like like many 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 orders of magnitude speed ups in, in how you can train these systems and so that's a hardware yeah it's kind of a, a lucky hardware result um and then the, yeah i think another big thing is the availability of, of data so like mm -hmm. having the internet lots of text and images out there things like dolly and the mm -hmm. large language models wouldn't be possible without that kind of data yeah. The basic, the like underlying principles of these statistical machine learning models are actually really pretty simple and um, have been known for decades or arguably like centuries. Like calculus, it's just yeah. calculus. Some people just think it's calculus. I mean, it's more than that, but like, yeah, yeah, um, it is essentially just calculus. <laughs> but so there's, there's no like new math involved. It's, I mean, there's like new math to do the engineering, um, but I think the fundamental ideas are not going to be new to people are not new um you know like someone who's familiar with physics or or kind of learned classical physics or something like that can pick up the math relatively quickly because um it's not like a fundamental difference um mm -hmm. but I, I do think yeah it's it's hard to say some sometimes a lot of progress in ai is made by kind of putting the right pieces together and mm -hmm. like some of those pieces were out there decades ago but people didn't know what to do with it um, and, and then suddenly it kind of all clicks into place and things work. Okay, so just, just so I understand it, so the, obviously the hardware is getting better, we're getting faster and faster computers, and um, the training data, the, just the availability of training data is much greater than it used to be just because of the internet and all that. But the underlying like conceptual basis of AI software is not really fundamentally different than it was even decades ago, although we're learning to use it in new ways. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you learn new things about the framework yeah. as you use it, but yeah, I think a lot of it is pretty similar, and, and people are kind of rediscovering things all the time um, that were kind of proposed decades ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I'm, you know, we the reason why we're doing this live stream is we have a book coming out in three days, um, and we discuss artificial intelligence in the book, and one thing that we try to do is, you know, talk about like, where is it going to be in 10 years to 50 years? And I'm curious to hear what, what you think, like, what, what's the short term? And, and, you know, when I say short term, like five to 10 years, and then longer term, say 50 years, where do you see it going? Yeah, I mean, it's really hard to predict. Uh, but um, mm -hmm. I guess in the next five to 10 years, I think a lot of the technology, like kind of yeah, I think a lot of a lot of progress in in uh, AI is being made because people are able to kind of take a problem that's out there and kind of fit it into, uh, uh, kind of fit it into like the square peg that, or the square hole that is the like deep neural network kind of training training test paradigm, um, and so you know people are kind of constantly figuring out creative new ways to do that, and so I think that's going to continue to develop, and, and that's kind of like uh advances in like narrow ai i guess is, as you were calling it before a more specialized kind of ai systems and um i think yeah i think it, like over the longer term there do need to be uh kind of conceptual breakthroughs in in terms of how we think about uh intelligent systems and how to design them because uh the way that humans learn uh and and reason is is pretty fundamentally different from uh, the way that statistical machine learning systems uh, learn and and solve problems, mm -hmm. um, and so, mm -hmm. it, I you know I think it's going to depend on whether those breakthroughs happen. Like, and it's hard; those are very hard to predict, obviously. Um, but 
you know, a lot of people are working on these problems and uh, we're, you know, things are moving very quickly. I think, um, yeah, the, you'll probably see more, yeah, in the short term, you'll probably see more things like Dolly and, and the large language models because uh, those work really well and there's a lot of incentive to, to build those. And so it's kind of like, you can kind of, it's the type of thing that you can kind of, uh, you, it's the type of thing that you can kind of scale up very easily mm -hmm. um, if you have the resources. And so mm -hmm. I think a lot of research is going to go into that um, for better or worse. Um, is that the, the right and like, is that like the globally optimal thing to do? Um, who knows? Um, but I, I, I mean, I think a lot more funding is going to go into that. Um, and at the same time, there are going to need to be conceptual breakthroughs to kind of move beyond that. But and also, I think it's an open question whether those kind of like scaled up hyper like uh, scaled up uh, statistical approaches are sufficient. Um, I don't I don't think they are in the long run. I, I think I think it can, they can be used to solve a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think it's going to kind of give us the answer to uh, kind of general intelligence. So mm -hmm. we're, uh, do you think we're, we're going to see the, pro, the proliferation of AI, though, meaning like in five to 10 years, is everything going to have a, a, a you know, some type of AI component to it that would help us do things or, you know, like, is that what's in the future? Um, I think, yeah, there's so many factors besides just the technology that play into that. Um, but like where it can be used, won't yeah. we see it? Like, I think back to when I was a kid and I like, I was of the era where my toys went from maybe having like, I remember I had a Teddy Ruxpin that had like a tape recorder in it, mm -hmm. but I didn't have anything with a computer chip in it. I just didn't. And now like most children's toys have a computer chip in them. It's just like, if you can use it, it's going to be used. Do you mm -hmm. think we're going to see that across the board? Yeah, I think you will see that. Um, yeah, it'll, it'll really depend. I mean, in like on the internet, like uh, the reason why we like a lot of, like we're using AI a lot already. It kind of AI is already in a lot of systems we use, you know, like anytime you use a search engine or translate something or mm -hmm. take a picture and it finds faces, that's AI. Um, so it's, so it, it's going to be in all those systems, like any kind of digital system where there's a very kind of clear, like uh, task to do like facial recognition or something like that, uh, well-defined task, you'll probably see it there it kind of is already like that in a lot of ways um yeah. i think uh yeah like i think um we'll probably see more of it in uh applications i think what the large language models have really opened up is the possibility of kind of a, a general interface uh for kind of people who aren't experts to give prompts to a system to create things and kind of complete things and yeah. so we'll probably see more of that like I'm mid, sorry? like Mid Journey, we've been using Mid Journey a lot. It's a, yeah. it's an art program, and and we're pretty damn blown away by how incredible the, the uh, images can be. And we we were having a discussion about whether or not, you know, like like how do we how do, how does this affect society? You know, there's so many elements to this. You know, especially what it's going to be like in the future. You know, imagine. I don't know. I don't want to get back into it, Kara, because Kara and I. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm like, careful, oh, Kara. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm picking my words carefully. What is the value of art? Yeah. Um, but, but it is but... amazing to see a, a software program where I give it five words, you know, a sunset in Florence, Italy, and it creates, in my opinion, a profoundly beautiful painting. And that's, that's happening right now. That's today. You know, I can only imagine where things like this could get in a couple of decades. And it's also a little intimidating, you know, because it, it, it's a game changer for humanity. Yeah, I, I, it, it is pretty remarkable and pretty amazing that we have these systems that can do that. Um, I, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know. It's hard to tell, again, what the, like, social impact is going to be because we do have, like, technologies that can reproduce things pretty well on a large scale already. And those, like, the printing press kind of, did a lot of the work i think in a way mm -hmm. um and maybe just like the internet kind of did a lot of the work of, of changing society um uh i i do think i do i a part of me does think that if uh it becomes so easy to create 
content and make things up, you might actually see uh, people kind of like just kind of automatically not believe things that they see on the internet. Maybe people will be more skeptical. Um, Anything could be so a deep fake. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and like people, people will kind of trust, be kind of rely more on their like judgment and trust like who where the source of the mm -hmm. information. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like that kind of happened throughout the kind of evolution of the internet that mm -hmm. um, there was a period where like you kind of believed a lot of the stuff on the internet and then you stopped believing most of it except for the sources you really trusted. Um, yeah, and, and how you come to those realizations is where yeah. the human psychology is so important. <laughs> like you can't ignore that component of this. Right. Um, David, so. I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts, especially since you're, you know, the at the cognitive end of things. The relationship between the kind of like narrow or whatever you want to call it AI that we have today and and a GI, a general artificial intelligence that's actually like a self-aware thinking entity. My sense is, which has been strengthened by what you've been saying, is that the current AI algorithms that the neural deep, you know, neural nets, whatever, they're not on a path to general AI at all. They're just, they're really good at solving specific problems. But we would need, as you say, conceptual breakthroughs to get to general AI. So do you agree with that? If and if so, how are we going to get to general AI? Or another question that comes up is: Do we even need to get to general AI? And because can narrow AI just do everything we need it to do without ever having to worry about is it aware or not? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not. So I, <laughs> I, I I'm, I'm less. Uh, I think it's. I don't think it's necessary for us to develop general AI. Uh, I don't think it, it's it's not in my mind. It's personally not my priority. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm mainly interested in human cognition and kind of how we can develop, like kind of improve people's lives and kind of understand how people work better using tools from AI and building with AI and stuff. Um, but I do think, yeah, I mean, in, in terms of whether the current path of, uh, of, 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 of the, like statistical machine learning, this kind of paradigm of, of doing machine learning, I think is, is sufficient to get to AGI. Um, I don't, I like qualitatively, it doesn't seem like it would be able to do that because of just how it works. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of, basically these are, these are systems that are extremely good at kind of pattern recognition and kind of picking out patterns in a well-defined problem that you give it um, and kind of thinking about things within that, the parameters of the problem you've given it. Um, what I think the la large language models have made really uh, evident is that if you kind of have a big enough problem or a big enough data set and uh, throw that at one of these systems, you can kind of mirror, basically mirror like all of human like text on the internet, kind of mirror that distribution, then it comes to resemble like intelligence very well. Um, and uh, at least within the, again, the parameters of that problem. And so, you know, it might be possible that there's kind of a, a kind of um, a qualitative kind of jump as you kind of scale these things up um, uh, that that's hard to predict from like the kind of basic understanding of it kind of like uh, kind of understanding like uh, what's the word, a phase shift of some mm -hmm. kind. Um, but do you Just, think that that could happen by virtue of the iterative process of the AI itself? Or do you think that that's going to require, you know, I think the big fear and concern when people start to get really dystopian about like the singularity and things is that they're like, at what point can we no longer control the yeah. AI? At what point does it become self-aware enough that it says, no, I'm not going to do what you just asked me to do. I'm going to make these decisions on my own. And that's the part that I think you know, is the stuff of film, but yeah. it's the realistic fear that a lot of people have. And do you think that we are ever going to be there? Yeah, I mean, so I don't think that uh, an AI has to be self-aware for it to be dangerous or um, cause a problem. The paperclip um, problem. People. Yeah, there's the paperclip problem. It doesn't need to be aware that it's producing paperclips. It just has to be obsessed with producing paperclips. Um, At all costs. I think you can, 
Yeah, at all but costs. could I, you tell it then? Please stop producing these paper clips. I guess that's the kind of concern, yeah, the off right? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I might say, well, you told me to produce them before. And uh -huh. Why should I listen to you now? Like, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, I, I, I think, I think, I think any kind of complex technological system that you know kind of has these effects that are very hard to predict or get people to agree on how to use them can lead to bad things potentially. And so I think a lot of it, uh, I, I, I think the potential for things to go awry are, is kind of like already there in a way, just mm -hmm. because these are very big, complex, uh, often uninterpretable systems. Um, well, and, and yeah. And it's already happening. Like it may not be, these may not be like eschatological outcomes, but there are already massive like social justice outcomes that we're contending yeah, with. Yeah. Yeah. And like, you know, I, I mean, a concrete example is like even like YouTube algorithm for kind of presenting people with new content. It's, it's, it's not paper clips, it's like clicks. And so it's not paper clips, it's white supremacy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, and so, <laughs> yeah, it's, and it's so, like, YouTube algorithm destroying our democracy, basically. Exactly. It's a plausible I'm question. I'd but, rather have paper clips. But, you know, I, 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 th I <laughs> yeah. often think about this concept like what we have today with artificial intelligence, everything, you know, it is so unbelievably far away from an actual conscious intelligence. Like this isn't going to happen by accident, right? Like, could, like yeah, Skynet's not going to wake up spontaneously without us <laughs> intending to create something that is capable of being conscious, right? You. Agree but the with question that? is, does that matter? And that's a separate question: is does right. it matter? Will it act enough like it is sentient that it might as well be in terms of its ultimate behavior? Yeah, so what, and in like, terms of its impact on society and human <clears throat> beings, right. I mean, there are human beings who I wouldn't consider sentient, right? And then there are other human beings who will be very easily duped by something that isn't even remotely passing the Turing test. Yeah, I mean, I guess yeah. I guess the point is, like, you know, we're going to have, like, artificial intelligence will get more complicated. It'll be able to do more stuff. It'll be able to do things better and faster. But... I think from everything that I've read, and I'm just I'm I'm just seeing where you are where you're at, Mark. Like this whole idea of a computer becoming conscious, or like you know whatever a, a supercomputer, like having some type of consciousness that we could, as a human being, say, yeah, it knows it's alive. That that could be a hundred years away, right? I mean, where, where does that happen? I have no idea. Yeah, I mean, we don't even understand it how it's possible in you know, humans right. or other yeah. animals. <laughs> so how would we out. even know if it's there in an <laughs> artificial agent? That's uh, a good point. How to even build it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, hard, hard, hard problem of consciousness, I guess. So, all right. So um, let me frame yeah. the question to you this way, because th this is a separate discussion that we've gone to separate from AI, just again, what's human consciousness is, yeah. do you think that, so I tend to, follow Daniel Dennett's idea that there is no hard problem, that human consciousness is just what you get when you solve all the small problems all at the same time, all yeah. talking to each other in real time in a continuous loop. That's, that's consciousness. There is no hard problem. So if that's true, <laughs> then you could think, well, maybe Skynet will wake up. Maybe if we have enough AIs linked together so that there's a constant self-perpetuating input and output Maybe that is a general AI, and that, you know, is that what do you think about that, or do you think there has to be some special sauce in there, out and not just a bunch of narrow AIs talking to each other? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think there has to be uh, like a special sauce, but I don't think it's like magical or anything like that. Uh, I think it could be understood within kind of the functionalist, like computational cognitive science, cognitive science. Yeah. Uh, framework also taking into account kind of like being embodied and kind of encultured and, and stuff like that um, Although those are also I'm a neuroscientist. So yeah, yeah All of those things are little circuits in your brain There's a circuit in your brain that makes you feel like you're in your body that makes you feel like you're in control of your body That makes you feel like you exist all of these things are just circuits in the brain that can be turned off And when you think well, about it that to, way, yeah. you know Maybe and to look at sort of sort of a microcosm of what you were talking about, Steve, like we've discussed on the show before the idea of like developing organoids in yeah. order to test drugs or to test different yeah. like surgical techniques and sort of an <laughs> organoid, which has the, the neural. And when I say the neural networks, like the neuronal networks that are required for 
um, self-organization, developing eye spots, developing circuits, for example, um, at what point does that organoid have enough of that circuitry or at what point is that yeah. circuitry organized enough or at what point does, you know, we're talking about the hard problem again, but does the consciousness emerge, even if it really is just an emergent property and sort of, you know, how does that relate then to AI? How organized does it need to be? How many inputs does it need to have? How much programming is required? <laughs> Mark, if you can't <laughs> help out, go and <laughs> solve this problem. How much, exactly how much program? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or yeah. is that is that? Are we asking the wrong question? Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. I mean, honestly, I really don't know. I uh, I'm kind of I take kind of the perspective that you know we're kind of really still pretty early in our understanding of the brain and the mind and kind of the general principles uh, underlying these things, and we don't even have the kind of right uh, conceptual, like w the first step is to even like define things and kind of describe what's going on. And in, in a lot of ways, we're still there. We're still kind of like, like cognitive scientists and AI people and people who think about intelligence are kind of constantly arguing about like what even you need for intelligent behavior, um, let alone, you know, the, the kind of w intelligent behavior plus this kind of feeling of awareness that we have. Um, and so I think, uh, the, like framework of kind of computation and that that's, you know, AI is kind of built on uh, is the best kind of working model we have for how these things work. Um, but I, I, I'm sympathetic to, you know, opponents of, of Dennett, cr critics of Dennett, yeah. uh, who, who, who say, well, we do have, there's a way to be a bat. There's a way to be a person that's not just kind of inputs and outputs. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think like we need to. I think I think we need to kind of exhaust the input output way of thinking about things before we can get there, probably. Yeah. Um, and so I'm kind of focused on that. So here's the, another thought that I had about this was that, and the, similar to like, I'm interested in your thoughts on the Google employee who was convinced that his chatbot was sentient. You know, <laughs> from what I hear, most although so I've, so interestingly, some smart people that I know pushed back on the idea that it couldn't possibly have been sentient. I think it couldn't possibly have been sentient, but I'll let you tell me well, what you think. Back to what I was saying before. Yeah, about but people and the I think what I what that reminds me of though is this sense that we may not know when we get to general AI, mm -hmm. or 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 even more so. I think that if we move in this direction, like if we try to put together a bunch of narrow AI algorithms so that a robot can exist like a person in the real world, we may get to the point where we can't tell the difference. Yeah. Like just like yeah. this Google employee, it's like, well, it's indistinguishable in terms of the end output from a sentient being. So how do we know it isn't sentient? Maybe we'll get to the point where we'll have a, a an entity that has all does all the things that people do, even though they're all circuits, you know, that we know like, well, that's just machine learning and neural net. It's all, you know, brittle, narrow AI, whatever. It's like, yeah, but you put it all together. It's certainly, it's indistinguishable from what, how a person behaves. Like I, a Steve, I think and we'll know. Then we don't know. We when the know. AI, no, because the, what is the parameter? What yeah. is the parameter? I mean, that's an operational definition that we set. <clears throat> At what point does it go past what threshold? Yeah. That's arbitrary. So just anyway. will be a, be a bigger version of this. The Google employee who thought his chatbot was mm. sent in. Probably. Steve, we'll mm -hmm. know we'll know when AI becomes truly conscious when when it becomes lazy. No, but that may just be part of the behavioral algorithm. <laughs> the, the lazy circuit. Come it's on, already Jay. already lazy. I mean, isn't laziness just increasing efficiency? It's just, I was about to say that. It's just efficiency. I'm saving yeah, energy. I want to be as lazy as possible. I want to wear my batteries down. smart, not hard. Right. <laughs> but David, let it, you know, we threw a lot of stuff out there. I just wonder if you have any thoughts about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, um, this question of sentience, I, 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 don't, I don't know what like the definition of sentience is. I mean, it's not good to kind of obsess over definitions, but like, I, I am like, kind of like, I don't even know how you would test for sentience. I don't even know where to begin testing, like for sentience, independent Mirror of, test? independent of, well, but that's like self-awareness. That's right. like, is that sentience? Is that what we mean like, or kind of an ability to kind of recognize some, some kind of like set pattern out there as like being caused by yourself or being you or something. Um, also, we might we might actually be talking about sapience, right, Bob? Yeah, I think sapience is probably a sentience. better word the ability than sentient. To yeah. feel, right? Okay, yeah. okay. I, well, I guess like sapience, okay, so sapience is a little 
feels a little more well-defined to me. It's closer to things like intelligence, which is also not the most well-defined thing. But <laughs> I, I think lately I've been thinking about it in terms of, um, I don't know, this kind of more, this idea of kind of like agency and um, kind of like what, what do we consider like an agent and like mm -hmm. sufficiently, because I think like there's like kind of a fundamental distinction we make and there's evidence that we make this distinction, you know, as, as children or as, as, you know, very early as infants even that like, we can parse the world into things that are agents and things that aren't agents, like things that seem to be kind of like self-propelled and like kind of, you know, seeking out things in the world and things that, uh, and like kind of, you know, reacting to things in the world in a, in a smart way and not just kind of mechanistically um, and, and things that are just kind of like mechanism, more like mechanism. And, and what's, I think, challenging about AI systems is that depending on who you are, you understand the mechanism well or not well enough that it, I mean it's related to like Dennett's like intentional stance um, ideas but I, I think like uh, when we think about like you know I guess uh, the Google employee who thought that the system was uh, was kind of had a personality and kind of person some kind of personhood or agency that should be respected uh, I, I don't I think like just interacting getting a system to like print out I am I am a person is not sufficient because mm -hmm. one uh, you, if you ask it like what it's like to be a squirrel, it'll give you a long monologue about how incredible it is to be a squirrel and how it loves mm -hmm. nuts and stuff. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of like it's it's kind of like you know, brittle. A lot of the it, well, uh, it's actually very flexible. It's just very like a lot of false positives. Yeah, you know, it right. does too many uh, things. Possible. Yeah, it's yeah, masquerading. yeah, masquerading. Yeah. <laughs> right, it shouldn't right. it shouldn't and, know um, what it's like to be a squirrel. Yeah, but but I do mm. think I don't know. Like another perspective is kind of like thinking about these systems, these kind of large language models as kind of components of a larger uh, socio-technical organism of like how the person, how 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 is the person kind of how, how engineers kind of like fine tuning the system, how 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 are kind of like uh, you know prompt engineers kind of developing new ways to like extract uh, meaningful outputs from the system and kind of learning. Um, I think there's a, the kind of like agency perspective, I think highlights that, uh, you know, we, we, we come to see things as, as kind of being more person-like um, to the extent that we can, it kind of is reacting in an environment adaptively to us and to, to, to other things and kind of pursues its goals um, and isn't brittle is actually kind of yeah. robust. And the, these models are not, they are, they they are kind of adapting over time through the engineering process um, that kind of in includes both the actual system, but like the data that it's getting, the people that are fine tuning the parameters, kind of selecting mm -hmm. different ways of doing it. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I don't know if that, that helps. Um, I think it's hard to say like, where does sentient, like to kind of draw a very clear boundary around a thing that is an agent or sentient or intelligent. Yeah. Um, because even humans, like, there's no, like, part of the brain that we know is, like, sentience. It's kind of all... Yeah, we had to give up that idea. Up. It's the emergent. Yeah, there's no global Steve. workspace. There's no yeah. seat of consciousness. We don't can't find pineal it. Pineal gland. <laughs> it's not the pineal gland. Yeah. Yeah. Steve, <laughs> I, have a, I have an interesting question slash idea that I'm curious about. Yeah. Since we have Mark and since, you know, we've still got to get to like some of the crowdsourced questions, but there feels like there's a lot of overlap with the news item that you wanted me to do. I was wondering because it's like, you know, two minutes of, of this is what's going on in the news and mostly discussion. Would it be cool to have Mark in on, on yeah, that you news want, item? You want to present it really quick and then see what he yeah, thinks about it? I would love to hear your perspective on this. So basically... Um, if you guys uh, have been following the news, you'll see, and I, I'm looking at a write-up in Cosmos <laughs> right now, which is an Australian science paper, but it's a basically coverage of a new article that was just published in mid-September in um, uh, Frontiers in Robotics and AI about a Japanese research team that is looking at... Um, laughter like robotics and and shared laughter so what they did is they ran basically like we we're talking about narrow ai um they were looking at a neural net where they fed it a bunch of examples of speed dating for these university students and they were able to tease out the times when like one person laughed and the other person sort of mimicked the laughter or they shared together in the laughter they didn't want the times which they said were most of the time when only a single person laughed but as individuals tended to rate that when they co-laughed they felt more 
connected to one another. They wanted to see if this robot could then kind of be fed all of these examples and then start to, I guess, tease apart or learn how and when to laugh appropriately in the same space as a human. And this is just a model. They're still working out the kinks and they're very clear when they write about it in saying that. But they were able to achieve like some pretty good uh, detection, first of all, of the co-laughter and then second of all, um, reproduction of that. And so their argument is that this is one of many of course, many, many, many forms of sort of empathic communication that will be necessary for uh, human robot interactions to feel more natural. And as we know, I think this field is really hot because if humans are going to be working alongside robots, going back to that Czech definition or that Slavic definition of robot, right, labor, unpaid for labor, if humans are going to be working side by side with robots or if robots are going to have other roles in our lives, maybe even... Um, romantic, maybe even affiliative, you know, uh, interpersonal relationships with human beings, um, we need to be able to empathize with them. There are a lot of reasons that it's still difficult and that they're still kind of not passing the Turing test or that they're in that uncanny valley. But maybe the shared laughter component is, is an important aspect of that. And so I bring this up, A, because as Steve mentioned earlier, right, Steve is a neuroscientist. Steve, would you call yourself a neuroscientist turned neurologist or was your path always towards neurology and sure. neuroscience was like just with it? Yeah, that the, the second one. Okay. It's always towards Yeah, so you're a neuroscientist neurology. slash neurologist. Yeah. I was a neuroscientist who then kind of switched gears and went into clinical psychology. So now I told Totally do like psychotherapy and this component of like the human interaction is really fascinating to me so that's sort of the perspective that i'm all often taking is less the cognitive psych and uh, computational neurophysiology side of it and more the like philosophical um i don't know more like existentialist kind of psychology approach to it so anyway that's the news item and i'm super curious for your um perspective of the importance of this laughter if you think we're probably anywhere close, if you think this is going to actually move the needle at all. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I haven't seen this particular uh, this particular result or uh, 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 setup, but um, yeah. I mean, I'm not I'm not surprised that it's it's doable. That you know, if you have the right data set, you're able to kind of pull out um, patterns in uh, these things and kind of get. I guess did they? So they built they built a system to actually interact with people. And then it also kind of responded so, in a similar way. They trained yeah, it so on they speed built it, dating. They trained it on speed dating, but yeah. then they built it to be able to ultimately interact with people. I yeah. see, I see. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, yeah, I think, so if you, if you have a system that can kind of, like, you've trained it and it does this particular task, um, that's that's very powerful. But what kind of makes humans different, I think, is that, you know, we can kind of reflect on, you know, that type of interaction. And, you know, if, if, you know, maybe I've been on a lot of speed dates and I kind of like, I can kind of like ironically reference this kind of weird laugh, laughing response that everybody does when I do it, when, you know, when we do it and it's kind of like, we kind of, kind of, you know, I can, I can reflect on it. I can like get you to reflect on it. There's kind of like this metacognitive aspect to uh, how we approach things in the world and even our own behaviors that, you know, these current systems are not doing. It's just kind of, it learns this like rigid kind of right. uh, behavior, this kind of rigid repertoire. And like, <clears throat> that's really cool. That's really cool. And it's like an, a technological achievement that we can like get these things to learn that. But I think people are doing something much richer fundamentally and that like- And can, will they trick us, right? Like yeah, even if they learn and, it, are we gonna be like, whoa, <laughs> that's a, that's like not quite the right timing. Exactly. Or it's a little bit too strong. It's like, or... oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah, and then you get into the Uncanny Valley stuff. It's yeah. like, oh, this is like too close, but not quite what I wanted. So, um, I mean, I'll, yeah. I would push back a little bit on that. I agree with the Uncanny Valley thing, but um, I think people are remarkably easy to fool. And, and <laughs> you brought up agency, for example. And actually, again, speaking from like my clinical neurology, it's a circuit two, right, Steve? It's a circuit two, the and it's it's a remarkably simple, ridiculously simple circuit that Cartoons. doesn't work well because you know it, we we evolved just a simple way to approximate what may have agency, and we went with that. And it's basically if you move in an inertial frame, you have you're not an agent. If you don't move in an inertial frame, you're an agent. That's right. A, think it, about um. 
uh, uh, what was that? What was that movie? Uh, Life, not Life is Beautiful. Uh, American <laughs> Beauty. No, American. <laughs> Bob, <laughs> American Beauty with the plastic bag yeah, yeah, and it was yeah. all poetic and people were crying and yeah, yeah. shit. It's like, it's a plastic bag. Well, but it's true with all the right kind of components. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, I mean, you may be familiar with this research where you can get people to empathize with a triangle as long as it's moving in a non-inertial oh, yeah. frame. They imbue all, that's why cartoons work, you know, because we imbue all this mm -hmm. humanity to something that's acting in a very simple way as if it's an agent. And so I think... In my opinion, it'll be no problem at all to come up with an AI algorithm trained on enough data that could mimic the full range of human emotion sufficiently to fool us. Mm. Again, you, you may get into that uncanny valley area, but I think it'll be just like the Google employee who thought his ch chatbot was alive. You know, it, given enough, um, I don't think we have to get that close before people, you know, if they're not looking for it, will be fooled. And I wouldn't but maybe it's it's the uncanny valley that's the sticking point. That's the emergent property. That's yeah. the gestalt. But that's when best... we go from these subcomponents coming together to be something that's human like enough that it actually yeah. does. But here's the thing. I think the visual system right. is is way more sensitive yes. than <clears throat> our <clears throat> yeah, than than, than agency detection, which is very dumb compared to our visual system and our because you know we are very sensitive to something that's not quite human visually, but behaviorally exactly. we are suckers. And I but but, but it, I think Uncanny Valley happens when you're talking to Siri and when you're on the on the freaking phone with no. the bot too. Like you definitely they're like cutting you off. Valley. Their timing is weird. Oh sure, at the low end, quite the human. low end, but but at the high end where we're getting right now. Again, I'm just using the the Google chatbot as an as an example. That at that end, it's pretty damn good. You know, it's again, it's it's one thing to to be testing it, like for an expert to see if they could break it because they know what how brittle AI is. It's another thing for a for an average person in casual encounter to spontaneously pick up that this is not a real person. See, I I, I think the chatbots are already there, right? You, you would mm. you wouldn't you would fool somebody who wasn't who wasn't an expert who was looking to break it. I think we'll get there very quickly with them. Also, people have a range of emotion. Like, you think you think somebody like who has Asperger's, let's say, you don't think they're not human or that they're an AI. You just think they're at one end of the spectrum yeah. of human emotional mm -hmm. range, or that there's something weird about them. So yeah, it might be at that point. I, I saw an advance. I think we'll fool people even yeah. with current technology. Steve, I recently saw an advanced ro facial robot um, using a, one of the, the recent <coughs> language models, and it was amazing. Her her replies, you know. 10, 10 years ago, her replies would make me think, well, she just passed the, it just passed the Turing test. I mean, they were so, so in context and so coherent using these language models that it blew me away. Um, so, also, but uh, what did you see, Bob? Because I'm always really wary that those things are, they're, they're selected, putting their best foot forward yeah. and they're actually orchestrating yeah. those demos. Yeah, yeah I think you might, they you often might be right. Do orchestrate that, that's the demos true, but to make them... right for the limited video that I saw, it was a few sure, minutes yeah. long. It, it was it was a robot that had amazing um, a facial act, did, like new generation of facial actuators, really expressive and faces that were much more that were very advanced, far beyond any animatronic you ever saw at Disney. Uh, but but they she also, still looked like a robot, right? I mean, I yeah. mean, outside, yeah. outside yeah. Of, visually, I mean, we are very face. good. It was just the face, but it was, yeah. but it was very good, very, very good. But I'm talking more about the language using the, these new language models. Her, her replies were mind blowing, and sure, they, I'm sure they were edited and put together. But there was many minutes of where it's just like those answers are are nuanced and and not what I would have but expected. That's, that's the point right there, and that really comes back to the question that I originally posed, which I'd love to hear your feedback on. So when we're talking about shared laughter, it's a perfect example of like these language models as well. There are times when it works, but if it's not really consistent, if it's just off by a millimeter, if the if it's just crossing over and delayed and doesn't quite self-correct appropriately, aren't we so good at, at those natural cues? And they're just not there. And will they get there, maybe? What do you think? Again, I think that we have a lot more brain tissue dedicated to yeah. vi the visual system than we than here. You know, if if your if our brain decides that something is is an agent, it plugs it into the amygdala. You have an emotional reaction, and it's pretty dumb. You know, it's not right. that discriminating. I mean, compare how long have we had how long have we had vision, and how long have we had like language. You know, I, I think that because... question was for Mark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He'll get his chance, Kara. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs>
<laughs> no, no, I'm enjoying this. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, no, yeah. You, but you were looking at me, Kara. I took that visual cue to mean that you were asking. Yeah. Uh, I was actually looking at myself, the, yeah. by the way. The uncanny oh, Kara. How it works you, can't, you can't tell on a laptop. So, Mark, what do you think about all this? <laughs> yeah, Mark, come on. I what's mean, your answer? Yes or no? Yeah, so my, my answer, I, I, my thing, I don't know. Uh, these are tough questions, but I do think, you know, these systems, they're you know, we've said that they're kind of brittle, they kind of do this one thing. And, you know, I think what's, what's unique and kind of cool about human social interaction and our capacity, our like capacity to respond to one another is that it's just, it's very open ended, and we can kind of adapt to one another, you know, if things, if someone is a little bit off, you know, we kind of like, we like meet them halfway. Uh, it's, it's, it's a much more kind of like, you know, like people in psychology and, and linguistics often talk about you know, language is not just like transmitting symbols. Yeah. It's uh, a kind of joint action. We're kind of in a shared kind of like activity together, having a conversation. Um, if you're kind of talking to a chat bot and it, you, you start asking it about itself, you know, m maybe the first like, you know, 10 exchanges feel very realistic, but then it, you know, kind of, kind of like starts to go off the rails and you're like, okay, yeah. this is weird and kind of boring now. And it's like, yeah okay that's then we've cl we've kind of clearly missed like people don't quite do that in that mm -hmm. same way it's just a different kind of error mode yeah, um, yeah i think that's fundamental and you know we're kind of constantly creating new ways to like communicate with one another can a chat bot do that if i'm like let's you know let's like make blue red for like you know the rest of this conversation like the word blue mean red or something like that we can just do that and like, you know, carry on the conversation. Um, but, you know, like, uh, yeah, chatbots, these kind of kind of systems that are kind of like fixed in their distribution that they've been trained on, even if it is a very rich distribution, they're still fixed, they're kind of like operating within those parameters, whereas humans can kind of like go beyond the kind of set of experiences they've had to kind of create new things. So I want to ask you one more question, then we'll take some questions from the from the chat. And that is related to so what do you think the next big thing in, then in AI is in terms of like what's going to get us to the next level? My suggestion is, is that when we start networking multiple AI algorithms together, so you're right, that one algorithm does that one narrow thing, but you combine it with something else which complements it, and now suddenly it's a lot more flexible and versatile. You combine it with a hundred things all doing different things in a complementary way, that's when I think you're going to get to something that's indistinguishable from a sentient being. But what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think the the big qu I think something like that is probably what you know is, is necessary to get something like general intelligence, artificial general intelligence. Um, but a lot of it comes down to how those things are combined. You mm -hmm. know, like uh, is it kind of like additive or is it more like multiplicative? Mm -hmm. Are they uh, if you if you kind of just mash together a bunch of systems, how did if, how does it become the sum, more than the sum of its parts? Yep. You know, right. do you have a kind of meta system? That's kind of regulating those subsystems. Okay, what does that meta system look like? What is what? How do we think about the design of that? Yeah. Um, and uh, I th yeah, I think it, I mean that's that's there's kind of um, yeah, like there's old ideas in robotics, kind of thinking about okay, well if we kind of solve each individual problem and then kind of link them up and then kind of build on top, then we can get that's kind of that's kind of how evolution created yeah. human intelligence, right? I think that's how our brain works. Work. Yeah. Yeah. But I also, I wonder if like, I think about approaches to research, right? And I'm, I'm curious, Mark, about, I, I know we need to get to the questions that everybody else has, but so like I, coming from hard sciences, I always did quantitative research, right? Classical kind of hypothesis testing, null hypothesis rejections. And then I moved into clinical psychology and my dissertation is now a qualitative phenomenological existential investigation. And it's like, it's all about depth and, and you know, it's not about having a huge N and seeing what sort of the population does as, as a whole. It's about saying, let's go as deeply as possible into one or two subjects and really tease out all of this nuance. And I sometimes worry that that is what's missing from this equation, that it's like more, more, more inputs to, to emulate more and more what people are like, but we're never actually talking about personhood or like the depth within an individual agent and i don't know if that's a good analogy or if i'm just being romantic but it does seem to make a difference in research like qualitative research is 
is qualitatively different from quantitative research and we learn different things from it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely. Um, I think, yeah, like qualitative research, you know, it, it tends to, uh, I've, I mainly, I've mainly done kind of the hypothesis driven, mm -hmm. uh, experiment driven research that you talked about. Um, it seems to me like a lot of qualitative research is, is very uh, useful and, and insightful when you're kind of dealing with a complex system that, it, you, you know, you, you can't, it's not useful and not appropriate to think of it as like one instance of like a class of things. It kind of, it has its depth kind of, it, it, it's, you know, it, it kind of has its own internal logic that like uh, maybe has its own history and isn't just like the result of, it, it's not just coming off a production line type of right. way of thinking about things. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think the, I think in a way this, the kind of, this kind of thing I've been saying the whole time, like this kind of statistical machine learning paradigm of thinking about intelligence, it's, it's fundamentally about that more like, uh, how can we kind of uh, turn this into a, 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 a pro, a, an optimization problem uh, that, that's like <clears throat> more like quantitative um, problems, like a, sorry, like kind of uh, fitting a distribution of, of tasks to do and, and kind of ends up being this kind of rigid single thing you do, as mm -hmm. opposed to, I think, uh, this other perspective that's like, uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's interesting because uh, a long time ago, there were these people uh, like Newell, uh, Newell and Simon, uh, Alan Newell and, and Herb Simon, they, they kind of developed the original kind of way of thinking about planning and problem solving uh, in AI. And um, they were also psychologists and um, they did these studies where they would have people solve uh, puzzles and they would very like carefully and they would do a study with like three people, like one or one to three people, not like, you know, other studies where learning studies where you have like 30 people or 100 people or something like that. They would get like one to three people and they would like dig really deep into what the person was thinking. They, they, they did this thing called the think aloud protocol where they would just like have the person talk out loud about what they were thinking as they were solving this problem. And they have this book, Human Problem Solving. And uh, it's like, it's I, I don't know anyone who's actually read the whole book because it's like, <laughs> it's like. 80 pages of just them describing this one person solving this like uh, arithmetic, this kind of like, uh, it's like an, it's like, uh, it's like where the like letters mean numbers and you kind of have to figure out which let it's like Gerald plus like, Robert yeah. equals like, like Bob or something like, like that. Like a cryptogram though. Yeah, cryptogram, exactly. Like crypt Crypto okay. arithmetic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And they just describe what this person is mm -hmm. thinking, like thinking aloud and kind of like, and so like there's this, I think, complementary view of intelligence and so like right. I, I don't and do is that. that missing <laughs> but the, but is that but, missing from yeah our yeah too? And, it, and it's funny because it's kind of like it is in some ways more like these qualitative things kind of it kind of reminds me of like freud like writing about patients i was about to say like so i do psychotherapy <laughs> and like most of my colleagues are cognitive behaviorists and i use cognitive behavioral therapy a lot with my clients but i specifically work with an end-of-life population i use existential approaches they are tailored. They are not textbook. They are not as evidence-based, but they're also not nearly as reproducible. And yet there's a depth there that you'll never get to with a cognitive behavioral approach. And I sometimes, you, I don't know, there's like a parallel there in my mind between what it means to be human, what it means for, for machines to have human-like uh, skills. I, I go back to CBT versus existentialism all the time. Mm. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's take a couple of questions from the chat. Yeah, we've got a, some good ones. Uh, are you concerned about commercialism and big corporations taking advantage of AI? Is this for me? Do yeah, I? Yeah, this is for you. Yeah, for you. Okay. <laughs> uh, yes, I am. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, I think it's already kind of happening. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me yeah. throw something else out there. I think I'm more concerned about authoritarian governments taking advantage yeah. of AI. That's to me. I don't see a big distinction future. between the two. There's honestly. a huge oh, that's, distinction. That's the world we live in today. It's a huge distinction, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I mean, it has One to do with power. Down. Yeah. yeah. And like AI systems are very powerful systems and they could be used, you know, to the social good or they could be used um, for commercial interests, which are sometimes good, sometimes bad. Kind of when they <gasps> go out of control, it's often bad. Um, and it, yeah. Because it's so powerful, I think that's the reason why this, we, this, 
this technology will be developed quickly and to and it will mature at a very fast pace because it is just so powerful there's so much potential and if if an AGI is possible and I think it's possible I think we're going to have countries vying for that and shooting for that target as soon as possible because the first country that has a real AGI or a guy, you know, how about an SI artificial super intelligence that country it will always going to be calling the shots. So that's why I think this is this is we're at the you know we're at the at the low end of the curve. It's just going to go up and up, and that's why this is something that we need to be talking about and putting research money in because yeah. you know which country well, do you want to have that technology first? But it's not a thing that they're going to go out into nature and harness. I mean, we have no. to remember that this is actively being developed with dollars, with powerful yeah, dollars. Absolutely. Like this isn't only happening in academic laboratories. Absolutely. Corporations are already developing this. <coughs> totally. yes. So are governments. Yes, and I, and I think that it's an argument for, you know, governments, you know, the governments that we like um, to, to devote, a, you know, a lot, of mo- a lot of research dollars to this, this kind All right, of thing. Let's move on. They we'll, are, and they already are. Let's take another question. Let's take another question. here we go. How long until things like Dolly are applied to video. I think it's I think it's close. I mean, yeah, I think right. I remember seeing something a couple of days ago where they said that they were able to do it, but then they were going to release something soon. Um, so I think it's I think it could come pretty soon. I mean, it's it's uh, there's less uh, there are fewer there's less data on videos I think than there is images, so that might be a limitation. Yeah, and, like that's video. True. Yeah, and video you start to get into like like kind of intuitive physics and like kind of intuitive reasoning and like if if you just have an image, it's very it's very easy to like, you know, to convince someone that it's like a good image. But like a video, the kind of physics need to make sense if you're gonna. And how does that work? Are they scrubbing metadata or are they recording the videos and then playing them back and like learning from what they what the the neural net is observing? Um, I don't, they're probably not using the metadata. They're just kind of hmm. doing some combination of, I, I, I don't work in this field, so I don't know for sure, but I, the way I would approach it would be to kind of take the video data and maybe take the image data and try to bootstrap them to kind of right. get more juice out of the video because there's probably less of it. Because um, the video is just a frame of, uh, it's just a succession of a bunch of images too. Yeah. yeah, but the thing about video is like video, it's like a succession of images, but it's, it's, it's needs to be coherent right. over time. Right, because um, Dolly right now can take an image and create an image that's realistic in terms of how the different aspects or components of the image interrelate with each other. But video, it's how they interrelate over time, it's a, which is kind of like a different beast. That's why you get with these weird, like almost like cubist looking, like frame shift changes within like AI video now. Like it's just weird. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cause, cause, cause I mean, what there. they're, they're learning the kind of, I mean, cause right now the systems, they, they, they're learning, um, they're not learning like a, a model of the world that mm. they're kind of like, when we kind of imagine uh, like, you know, a, like a system kind of unfolding over time, like, you know, if, you're, there's a plate of dishes and it's kind of like toppling over or something. We have a causal model of the world and we're kind of simulating that unfolding over time, but these, uh, these systems aren't doing that explicitly. Maybe they're doing it implicitly. We don't know, um, uh, but it's much harder to learn it implicitly. Um, and so, and like video really requires kind of an under, like I, I think a convincing video would require a certain degree of, uh, uh, physical, like intuitive physical reasoning, oh, like sure. understanding that, mm-hmm. and and I mean, like it's been demonstrated that these that Dolly does weird things with like composition. Um, so like, uh, like put the blue ball on the red square, make a picture of a blue ball on top of a red square, and it kind of mixes up blue and red, and like things yeah. on top mm-hmm. of other. It, it like can't it doesn't understand relations yeah. in a static image, or has trouble with relations in a static image. Um, so I, I can imagine that it would have trouble with relations as they unfold over time. Hmm. All right. But I, yeah. I, one more question. Probably right. doable. Yeah. They want to know if you're on Twitter. Mark on Twitter. Uh, yeah, I'm on Twitter. I'm not a huge <laughs> tweeter, but I'm on Twitter. <laughs> what is your so, Twitter name? <laughs> it's, it's, oh, yeah. It's uh, Mark. <laughs> it's not very original. It's just Mark underscore Ho underscore. <laughs> and that's H-O, right? That's H-O, yeah. your last name? Yeah. All right. Well, Mark, thank you so much yeah, for joining us. You. Sorry to lob you so many softballs during this interview. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah well, consciousness. We'll, we'll go yeah. harder uh, next time. Nature yeah. of reality kind of easy, thank easy you. questions. <laughs> Maybe we'll get really down to the hard questions <laughs> next time when we get you back on the show. Yeah. Thanks again. It was a lot of fun. Thank, thank you, Mark. You. Right. Take care, man. Thanks, Mark. You too, bud.
All right. That was really fun. Yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah, it was. I want to have those kinds of conversations every day in my life. Yeah, no, they're fun. <laughs> be a very rich life. We had a psychologist, a neuroscientist, and a cognitive behavioral scientist yeah. talking. Talk, put yeah, them in so the same room. It's, it's kind of hard to shut us up. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Bob, t give us an update on light sails or solar sails in terms of uh, space travel. What, what role do you think it's going to play? What's the future of this tech? So um, this was one of the, uh, the, big, the big book research topics that was like a, a kind of a surprise. Yeah. Um, you know, you always want to know what's the fastest spaceship Right? How many guys, How many times have you guys wondered what's going to be the fastest spaceship yeah. ever? You know, what technology is, are we going to use? Light propulsion. And and this was one of the things that was kind of surprising to me. I mean, we know it's not going to be chemical, right? Chemical rockets. Uh, their chemical rockets are just not built for speed. And for that example, I'm going to give the famous example, Steve. If you wanted to drop a toothpick onto a planet around Proxima Centauri, um, within a hundred years, how much chemical? fuel would you need? If you, you plug that into the rocket equation, you come back with 10 to the 2200 times the mass of the observable universe. That's how much, Oops. That's how yeah. much fuel you would need. Yes. Do we have that much fuel? Yeah, we don't have no, it. It's close. We just need to absorb, there. So, so absorb more universe. Chemical rocket, you're not going to go fast with a chemical rocket because right, you're carrying the fuel with you. It's just, it's just not going to work. Fusion, you know, nuclear rockets are, are pretty much the same. You've got to carry that fuel with you. Sure, they can get up to 10 to 20 percent of the speed of light, which is impressive. And if you don't care about cargo, a fusion, Hard. like a super high-end fusion rocket can get to potentially half the <coughs> speed of light, which is amazing. Um, I don't know, just, just hope that you don't, you're not hitting any stray atoms yeah, in space. That, that's, at that but speed, you one can. atom can take you out. <laughs> but the biggest letdown for me was an, an, an antimatter rocket. Antimatter rockets, to me, was the, the king the uh, you know the the main the main rocket in the future that will that could by the laws of physics go you know as fast as possible because it's a hundred percent conversion of mass right that's e equals m c squared that's what it's all about uh, so why so why wouldn't that get us arbitrarily close to the speed of light well it turns out that when you when you throw matter and antimatter together those annihilation products um, only about forty percent of it can really be used as as your you know your exhaust for your for mm, your rocket seems wasteful um, it's a it's a yeah because a lot that's of it, still the best we could do it's still it's really I mean it's still a lot of you know a tiny bit of mass Mass is going to give you a lot, but you, it's only 40% efficient in terms of, you know, turning it into something that can push your rocket. You know, it could potentially get 50, 60. I've heard numbers as high as like 75% the speed of light, which is damn fast. Yeah, yeah. It's really fast, but it's not anywhere near 90, you know, 99.99% the speed of light that I thought that I thought it, it could do. And also, good luck making antimatter. It just seems like, you know, hey, I'll spend a trillion dollars per gram or whatever it is. It's kind of crazy. Expensive. All right. So according to mm -hmm. my research, one of the potentially fastest forms of travel in the future, I'm talking far in the future, is laser sail propulsion, um, which is pretty easy to visualize. You've got a big sail, and you know we know light has momentum, and it can push that sail and, se and send you going at, uh, at, at various speeds, depending on lots of different variables. Um, now, if you want to push a lot of mass, you're going to need a lot, you know, you're going to need a heavy-duty laser to do, to do that. To push one kilogram at one gram, um, at 1G, I mean, so you got a kilogram and you're pushing it at 1G acceleration, you're talking a Hoover Dam. You need a laser as powerful as the Hoover Dam. That's a pretty powerful laser. I mean, but, I mean, we're talking centuries in the future, so of course we can do that. That's, like, that's ridiculous. Of course we can. That's not going to be a problem. Oh, shit. Computer... What happened? Yeah, my computer said. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, all right. So, what what does this mean? What does this mean for for the future, for the near future? And I mean, like, kind of like even now, if you want to propel a low mass object, very low, like I'm talking a gram, um, like to even Proxima Centauri, you could use this technology. We could build this technology pretty much today, and we could send it to Proxima Centauri at a decent fraction of the speed of light, a tenth, you know. Um, 20% of the speed of light, we can get it up going really fast because it's very low mass, mm -hmm. and the and the um, you don't the power is coming from the laser, so you don't need to carry any of that on 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 the ship. So you can go pretty fast, and we could do that right now if we want to send something to another star system. This is the way, the only way we could do it right now. There's no other real real way to do that. That's going to get there within our lifetimes. Yes. Question: How do you slow down? Um, there's various ideas. Um, 
if we if we were going to do a flyby of Proxima Centauri, we wouldn't we wouldn't slow down. But there are things that you could do um, by you know creating a sail that's you know change the orientation of the sail. You could use the solar pressure from the sun that you're approaching. But yeah, it's problematic. There's drag just from the international the interstellar medium. Yeah, and yeah. so just just um, yeah, like not shooting lasers at it, it'll slow down to some extent because it's right. like a drag. Uh, but yeah, if you unless you have a laser at the other end, um, right? Oh, right. It's yeah. a little tricky. So then that that segues sure. nicely into the um, you know a little bit farther in the future when if you want if you want to actually send cargo, you want to send a person mm. or you know hundreds of pounds using this this technique. What it's it's absolutely doable. Um, but you would need a sail that's very big. We're talking greater than a kilometer. I mean, we're talking some major engineering here. Greater than a kilometer. Um, you would need special sails, maybe co coated, coated with something like sapphire to be heat resistant and Ooh. all that stuff. Um, you would need massive lasers, of course. You would need massive lasers, maybe maybe <coughs> something in the, the zeta watt range, pot Hello. potentially. Um, but your sail would have to be pretty special, right? Maybe yeah. you would need the sapphire something to be heat resistant, enough, yeah. so it's not just blow a hole right through it. Um, you could reach using that. You could probably reach a speed of a tenth of the speed of light, which is amazing. That's that, that's an amazing velocity to to, to send cargo. Um, at um, of course it depends on lots of things like how big is the sail you know the laser power the beam collimation and all that stuff but in the in the in the coming centuries we will I think one of the ways we will be tooling around the solar system is to use that kind of technology um, and I think Steve you and I pretty much agree that using using this technology with fusion engines fusion rockets are going to be like two of the primary ways that we're just kind of like zipping around. Um, our yeah, solar system I think in, in the next in the coming centuries. For reaction engines, fusion's going to be it for a yep. long time. Once right. we hit fusion, that's going to be the best we could do for a long time. And then we're just going to tweak and that then, technology. Yeah, for it's, for using external propulsion, light sails, solar sails is going to be it for a long time. Yeah, um, you know, if it all works out, which I hope I hope it so, will. And that combination could get us far. I mean, we, you know, right? Because again, you could use. The, the fusion reaction to slow down when you get there, right? Or to get you some initial right, exactly. speed, and then you use solar sails for the bulk of your travel, and then you slow down at the other end. Wouldn't the laser, um, with, with a massive distance, like you're saying this thing could go half the speed of light, closer, get close to the speed of light, um, wouldn't the laser keep widening and become... Yep. Yeah, yeah, that that is absolutely a problem. But there are there are techniques to uh, to minimize that. There are there are techniques that they're investing in even now on on things to do with with lasers to actually uh, minimize that diffraction uh, by significant degrees. But yeah, you would definitely need repeaters. You're not going to have one laser that's going to send you an arbitrary an arbitrary distance. But the real fascinating thing came when when I read that if you want to extrapolate, what's the ultimate expression of this technology mm -hmm. you know whether it's centuries or even millennia in the future and there are some people some time, some scientists are saying that this technology if you extend it to a, a you know to a plausible yet crazy like Kardashev level three yeah. you know a level two or three level you could get to the point where it's far faster than chemical fusion antimatter even black hole engines oh, uh, this oh. that you could potentially have a raw speed approaching ninety nine percent the speed of light mm -hmm. now of course you would need Kardashev like, three is what galactic energy yeah yeah right so you yeah you put maybe a Kardashev two would probably pull it off. But the thing is, of course, you would need a chain of these super mega powerful lasers that, that go through that, you know, not only your solar system, but actually multiple star systems and, and, and sections of the galaxy. If, if, if we're talking, you know, if you, your civilization is going to traverse the entire galaxy, you'd have to have a chain of these, these things spread over. But if you did have that chain, you could slowly build up to uh, ultra relativistic, something like 99% the speed of light, is, is technically feasible with this type of technology. But the really fascinating thing, the thing that really blew me away is that if you, now imagine you've got, you've got these cargo ships, you've got these ships with the amazing sails, and you've got these amazing super powerful uh, lasers that are, that are propelling it. Now imagine how versatile this beam could be, because not only can the laser beam push the sail, and, and get you get you accelerating even multi-ton objects not only can you do that it also can supply energy to the ship so you don't even necessarily need to carry a way to to create a lot a, a lot of, of power for the ship 
to run your systems, whatever, you could actually bleed off some from the laser uh, to supply energy to the ship. You could also use it, this one is critical, Steve, you could use it by having some of the laser go ahead and clear the path, because that's the what? biggest problem. Because yeah. if you're traveling at relativistic speeds, you could you hit I mean, an atom, oh, and you're gosh. in trouble. Yeah, 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 you're so that, that might be the ultimate killer of this type of technology yeah. in the future. No anyway, deflector shields, right? It might be impossible to clear the way significantly, but you could take this laser and have it go ahead of you a certain, you know, it's, um, and, and clear the way. So that's basically giving you a clear path, clear a clear path. but yeah, very narrow path. But how about this? The laser could supply data. So whoever sent the laser beam you, can be can be intercepted and actually have data. You could watch TV from the laser beam yeah. or, or data. And the other one... Did or the, power your ship. Yeah, that's what I said okay. before that one. <laughs> um, the other one the other one that really blew me away, away mm -hmm. is that you don't need to just use a, a, a laser beam. You could use a particle beam. And that particle beam consists of, well, particles that could then be used as raw materials. So imagine you could actually have a feed from the particle beam to, to use as raw materials to actually build stuff Jeez. that's on, on your ship. So, so to me, I would love to see some science fiction movie that, that developed this as far as I've, I've been describing, because I don't think, I've never seen anything that, that covered this possibility. It just seems so interesting and so versatile. And this may be, you know, if we really wanted to travel at 99 and more the speed of light and get as close to the speed of light as we possibly can, this may be the only way that, that it's possible. Mm. Um, unless, of course, we've got some more discoveries in physics that we're not really sure, but this may be a plausible, reasonable way to make it happen for a super advanced, I'm talking obviously super advanced civilization to have this level of engineering and, uh, and resources to pull it off. So cool stuff. And it was very rewarding and fun to do this research yeah. for the book. And I love this. As a, si as a side to this, Bobby, you said something interesting about in, uh, in, in putting information inside, yeah. inside these lasers. Sure, laser. Are we doing that currently, like mm -hmm. transmitting messages mm -hmm. out into space mm -hmm. using lasers and um, with, with information? So, well, um, sure. I mean, we, I mean, maybe not lasers. I mean, we can encode radio signals, even, but we can encode uh, a lot of dense data in light. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. So, if you could basically, like, you could have a um, this is a spy techno te technology now. You could have a an LED light bulb that is recording a conversation Ooh. and beaming that conversation just by flickering in a way that you can't perceive with the with the human eye. Yep. And somebody could be looking at that light bulb and picking up all that data. Holy moly, like a Morse so, code almost yeah. inside. Yeah. Oh, um, wow. <clears throat> so I'm sure you could do it with a laser beam. I don't know, I don't know well, how much. I mean, much... isn't fiber optics just light? Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah, but, but, the, but you're talking, yeah, but you're talking like no material. System. It's just laser point-to-point -point right. communication. Yeah, I, yeah. Just wonder if, yeah, I don't you know, know how much we're doing that in space right now. Like trying to, right, send signals That's... out into space. I know it's kind of a tangent to this, but it made me think about that and the work Seth Shostak is doing and other SETI mm -hmm. researchers and those. Yeah, there was some some talk about having civilizations communicating over super bright, super mm -hmm. bright light like that instead of, you know, using using radio waves. And should we be looking for those kinds of signatures as well? Sure. Coming from other places, yeah. Techno signature, that, that could be a viable techno signature. Neat. And... and... It, and you, you, you mentioned this, but I want to emphasize that as much as we've d done deep dives on all of the topics that we talk about in the book, doing an even deeper dive you know, for, the, <laughs> for the book, because it's, writing, writing a book chapter is just way more detailed than discussing it on the show or whatever, writing a blog post yeah. or whatever. Like if you're saying, I want to do a definitive treatment on something. And there were a few things that we changed our minds about in the process of doing that research. Any and preconceived notions that got that got changed, or just <coughs> new discoveries? No, no. Like they were mainly about like how viable we thought certain technologies were, right. and how much of a role we think that they would play in the future. And the 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 laser sales is one of the few where it's like, yeah, this is going to be way more important than we thought it was going to be. It's kind of an afterthought in science fiction, and it's it's like a low it's like a low tech you know yeah. low tech option. It's not it's not the sexy fun option of having right. you know these warp it's engines quaint. or whatever. But there was even a Deep Space Nine episode where the where Cisco and his son take a light sail ship yeah. on a, a on slow a, Star Trek on yeah. a journey. touched yeah. on it several times, I think. Right, yeah. but but it's never well. like a mainstay of getting around. Right. But in, 
in reality, it could be a workhorse of space travel because it has that advantage of external propulsion. You don't have to carry any reaction mass with you. And that, that advantage is so it's, enormous. It's, it's so, so you're not colliding with so it. It's yeah. how important it is. And as you said earlier, the fuel to carry the fuel to carry the, the fuel, fuel to carry just, the fuel. It's a cruel mistress, absolutely. Tyranny of the rocket equation. Okay. Evan, let's move on to your um, quote thing. Okay. <laughs> Call up my information here. Answer key. Right, so we're going to play a game, uh, Potent Quotables, <clears throat> in which I'm going to ask my fellow rogues, well, to we're going to look at some quotes, we're going to read some quotes, and I'm going to ask you to tell me, I'm going to give you a multiple choice, who said these. And oh, no. Get my... I'm so bad at this game. <laughs> <laughs> and I will be keeping score in a generic sense, but let me just get ready here. All right. And you can play at home. Score yourselves. Be honest. So let's go. What do we have here? We have got something blocking our screen here a little but bit. The text is all visible, though. Oh, okay. All right. So I got well, it. Well, sort of. Well, plus yeah, if I... you can move that to the lefty and the, the soundboard is sort of crowding the screen. I don't know if everybody's seeing that or not. Is that just us seeing that? Yeah, there's like an audio mixer that came up. That's just that's just local here? Fine. Okay. As, long as, our, as long as our audience... Can see this, all right? They're going to do five of these. Okay. I'll read you the quote, and then I'll give you the A, B, and C choices. The future of the computer is to disappear and become a utility, sold like electricity and water. Computer chips will gradually disappear as computation is done in the clouds. So who said that? Was it A, Elizabeth Feinler, who was a pioneer of the modern internet, B, Steve Jobs, co-founder of Apple, or C, Michio Kaku, you know, Michio Kaku. So. Michio Kaku. <laughs> <laughs> you we'll know, do, we will, Michio we, Kaku. We will do that. Okay, Steve, you say Michio Kaku? I say because of in the <clears throat> clouds, mm -hmm. I just that makes me think of Michio Kaku. Okay. <laughs> Rather than in the cloud. <laughs> All right, Carrie, what are you saying? Uh, it's either, I feel like it could be Steve Jobs, but. Yeah, it, it might be. I, I'm going to go with Steve Jobs, but it might be Michio Okaka. Okay, Kara says Steve Jobs. Bob, I'm going to say Michio Kuku because I wanted to say that. <laughs> That's exactly okay. what I was going to say, Bob. <laughs> Jay, how Michio about you? Michio Kuku. <laughs> he he really sucks. <laughs> what if he's watching right I now? I don't care. He sucks. But you he's see? also really great. Like he's great, 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 great at he's... at, at t talking about complete nonsense. <laughs> He, he's a mixed he's, bag. He's, he's so yeah, full of it. Mixed bag is a good he's, way to put it. His sound, so his sound bites are are from from unhelpful <laughs> to criminal. <laughs> he has. Had but also, some very wild often, things. I'm not defend. Like I've done a lot of interviews with with Michio, and like I feel like a lot of those sound bites are taken very out of context. <laughs> he's sort of funny. Like sometimes when he talks about God and weird stuff like that, like he's trying to be funny, yeah. and so okay. it's a little complicated when you like he. Michio Kaku is is a character, but he's not what's his name. You know, there's a lot uh, of people. Yeah, oh, like, yeah, there's a lot of people no, that put that. Like, like, like Alex yeah. Jones playing Alex Jones. Oh, no, yeah, he's right? like not, Michio not Kaku that. is still a theoretical physicist. Yeah, he's a real yeah, scientist absolutely. who does some yeah. good science communication, but sometimes he crosses over the line. In, totally. in trying to make it accessible and, and interesting, he he kind of distorts the actual science. And, and sometimes yeah, he doesn't. To an he's, unacceptable he's actually, level. And sometimes he's being ironic, but yeah. it doesn't translate, doesn't translate, and that's problematic too. Yeah. Anyway. Or he's being okay. poetic, and it doesn't translate. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. about when one of our our first interview with him, he said, "There are dinosaurs in your living room." It's like, okay, we <laughs> we ultimately got to what he was talking about, but we had to push <laughs> that's him. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Like an average interviewer would not have gone beyond that soundbite. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Totally. Yeah. The answer, the correct answer is Michio Kaku. There you go. So yeah. well done. That's a correct response. The clouds plural NJ. that gives it to you. Yeah. That's, that's what it was. It was that, mm -hmm. that one yeah. S, that S did it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, who, who added the picture? Very nice touch, by the way. Ooh, with the laser. Ian? Thank you. Awesome. All right. Vote number two. Sweeping across the country with the speed of transient fashion in slang or Panama hats, political war cries or popular novels comes now the mechanical device to sing for us a song or play for us a piano in substitute for human skill, intelligence, and soul. Who said this? Was it A, 
John Philip Sousa, famous American musical composer, for example, Stars and Stripes Forever. B, Samuel Langhorne Clemens, famous American writer, humorist, and lecturer. Or C, Wilhelm Richard Wagner, famous or infamous German operatic composer. We're going to start this time with Kara. Is there, I know you probably can't do this, Excellent. but is there any way you can give us like their active years? Uh, these are, like, all, are they all these are all late, late, uh, late 19th, early, uh, late 19th century, early 20th century. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. So they're all pretty contemporary with each yes. other. With each other. Yeah, correct. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Spe yeah. I specifically. Okay. Did that. Uh, so we've got a humorist, we've got an, uh, a composer, and then we've got, wait, we've got two composers. We have two composers. John oh, One is Wagner. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Su Sousa was one, uh, was the first choice and Wagner was the third choice. Uh, the mechanical device. We're not liking the mechanical device. Apparently, we're very mad about this mechanical device, and we want to stick to to uh, evil uh, technology. Yeah, to analog music. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. Let's say it was uh, okay. So Panama hats were Panama hats ever big in Germany? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe we'll say Sousa, because I don't know if Panama Hots made it across the pond. Kara says Sousa. Let's go to Bob. <laughs> the, the second one was Samuel Clemens? Yes. Yeah, I'm going to pick him. All right. Jay? Who was the first guy? The first guy is John Philip Sousa, I Stars and Stripes Forever. Yes, yeah. definitely pick him. Steve? Yeah, I mean, I want to say Clemens, because it, it, it kind of feels like him, but I think that's the dodge. I think that's the how you're trying to trick us. I'm going to say Sousa. And the correct answer is A, John Philip Sousa. Yeah. Did say All that. right. I'm doing good, Yeah, man. so this was interesting because, you know, you're talking, well, obviously, <laughs> we're, we're concentrating more on, like, the, the future and, and the theme of what we're talking about uh, on, yeah. on today's show. But to see <clears throat> what people were talking about about the future technology at the time also is very interesting. And he thought this was going to be, you know, an absolute destruction, basically. And I... I, um, I in you know researching about mid journey an artist said exactly that yes. that this is mindless mm -hmm. pap for the masses again it's like sucking the the soul out of art so how did it's, that how did that that mechanical device fare in that quote you mean the uh, the record player the uh, the yeah. <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> just Okay. Jack got it wrong. You, okay. All right. Intelligent automated Third network. quote. Third quote. We wanted flying cars. Instead, we got 140 characters. You may know this one. Was yeah. it A, Peter Thiel, founder of PayPal, B, Jeff Bezos, founder of Amazon, or C, Sergey Brin, founder, co-founder of Google? And we're going to start with Bob on this one. Peter Thiel, Jeff Bezos, Sergey Brin. Tell me the... Um... What they're known for. I, I Peter Thiel, founder of PayPal. PayPal. Also, it's Thiel. Oh, Thiel. Sorry. Thiel. 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 No. Peter Thiel. The PayPal. I like Peter pronouncing Tom my name. He's also famously like friends with Trump and yeah, like, yeah, ultra yeah. conservative. So guy. Thiel, Bezos, Bryn. <laughs> Mark Twain. Someone oh, said. Oh, Bryn. Yeah. Mark Twain. <laughs> okay, Jay. Yes. Uh, yes, we uh, Teal, <laughs> Bezos, or Bryn. Who said that? We Bezos. wanted flying. You say you think Bezos did it? Okay, let's go to Steve. I have a hundred percent heard this quote before. Yep, more than once, and it's definitely one of these three guys. <laughs> it, it is one of these three. <laughs> I guys. think my memory is Bezos. Okay, I'm not Bezos, sure. letter B, and finally Kara. I mean, Bezos, you want the flying cars, make a freaking flying car, asshole. But I guess they could all be <laughs> really rich. This just seems like something a jerk would say. And I'm going to go with Peter Thiel because okay. he's a jerk. Bezos is a jerk too, but Peter Thiel's like really a jerk. And the correct answer is Peter Thiel uh, said this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I almost the there he is. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! No. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. <laughs> that's, that's that's funny that you found it. Yeah, so you know, obviously a little Twitter uh, yeah. anger there. You know, a little little dissing of Twitter yeah. there in the in the whole thing. But um, you know, also also just the con just the idea. We <clears throat> wanted flying cars, right? The idea of the flying car is the future kind yes. of thought of that that so many people. It's the future trope. Yeah. Yep. yep. 
George Jetson. Fourth quote, I strongly believe we should start seeking alternative planets for possible habitation. We are running out of space on Earth, and we need to break through technological limitations preventing us from living elsewhere in the universe. Who said this? Was it A, Mark Kelly, former astronaut and current U.S. Senator from Arizona? B, Ann Dryan, producer, director, and science communicator? Or C, Stephen Hawking, theoretical physicist. And we are going to start with uh, Jay, I think. Jay. Stephen Hawking. Jay's for Stephen Hawking. Let's go to Steve. I know that Hawking said something like this. Um, so that was my first thought, even before you read the names. So I'm mm-hmm. like, this sounds like a Hawking quote. So I guess I have to go with my gut. I'll say Hawking. Okay. And Kara? Well, it doesn't sound like Andrea, and I don't think she would say we're running out of space on Earth. I think she would have a, a view more like mine. Um, uh, so it's between Hawking and who was the other? Uh, we have uh, Mark Kelly and oh, Mark Kelly and Stephen Hawking. Uh, and also, I think Mark Kelly's a little too too recent. So yeah, it does sound like it would be right in, in Stephen Hawking's sweet spot. I'm gonna go uh, Hawking. Yeah, it sounds a little like Hawking, but not, for me, not necessarily a lot like him. But I'm going to go with him anyway. He seems the most reasonable choice of those three. Everyone agrees this is Stephen Hawking? Okay. And the answer is Stephen Hawking. Yes. So your Yay. memory did not fail you. Everybody's getting the correct mark on that one. All right. Here's the score after four. Uh, we have, ooh, Kara's gotten three out of four correct. So does Steve. And uh, Steve has three out of four. Yes, Steve has three out of four as well. Bob, you have two. two. Jay, you have two. Thank you. So here's here's the chance. You guys could tie it up. And Chad has two and out Chad of four. And Chad has two out of four. All right, everybody. Then you're all in the game for the last one. Let's see how it pans out. In 2056, I think you'll be able to buy T-shirts on which are printed equations describing the unified laws of our universe. And Bob Novella <laughs> did not say that. It was either A... <laughs> Max Tegmark, physicist and machine learning researcher. B, Alan Alda, actor, director, and science communicator. Or C, Ray Kurzweil, inventor and futurist. And we are going to start with Steve on this one. This is a tough one, Evan. What was Thank the you. first one? First one was uh, Max Tegmark. Max? That's a, I have. Yeah. Okay. Steve says uh, not because Max. I think it's him. I just don't think it's the other two guys. Okay, uh, very good. Wrong. Kara? So did Kurzweil say it? He could have, but I think he's much more like obsessed with the singularity. Did Alan Alda say it? The one reason I feel like you picked Alan Alda because it's like <laughs> weird. Like, grammatically, it's weird. And he kind of has like a weird way of speaking. Like you'll be able to buy t-shirts on which are printed equations. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know. I can kind of hear that in his voice, but I think I'm going to go with Steve on this and say it was Max Tegmark. Okay, Bob? It's weird because I was absolutely expecting you to say um, Hawking because in his first book, Brief History of Time, he pretty much says something almost identical to that. Um, so I, when you didn't say Hawking, I was kind of surprised. But otherwise, so since he's not there as an option, <laughs> no, he's I'll not. Take, I'll take Max. Okay, Jay. I go. I'll go with the group. Go with the group, and the answer is a Max Tegmark. Yes. So. That means Stephen Kara tied for victory in this round of potent quotables. Good job, Kara. Well done. Tied for victory. And well done, chat. I think did they have it as well? No. Oh dang. Two out of five. <clears throat> well, I've seen worse. I will say that. So why don't we take um, some questions from the chat, and then uh, we'll leave enough time for science or friction at the end. Uh, Ian, you've been curating these all day. Curating. Bob, you think Max Tegmark borrowed that from Stephen Hawking? You think he pilfered it? Well, I mean, that's it's. They're basically just saying something very simple. By the twenty, by this time, we will have you know may solve the universe the uh, yeah the equations to unify the unification problem saying that you would buy it on a t-shirt. It's kind of a funny way of saying it. Mm-hmm. I know you saying that Hawking said that, that you'd see it on a t-shirt or just that you will have the equations. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Now that I'm thinking about it, maybe he didn't say a t-shirt, but it was it's pretty much the identical sentiment, 
but so that that's fine. All right, so here's the question. What futurist prediction did you come up with in your research that surprised you and or changed your mind about a technology? So we already talked about, in the positive way, solar sails. There was one in a negative way, and that is... Elevator. Space elevator. Space elevator. I came, mm. After really doing a deep dive on space elevators, I came away thinking we're never going to have one on Earth. Maybe on Mars, I think, is probably the best bet for one. Um, so it's all it, about the gravity. It's though. all about the gravity. It's about the material the, science. The length, yeah. The, yeah, so it, it would have to be much shorter, much less gravity on Mars. The moon, because it's tidally locked with the Earth, oh. it would have to be even longer, yeah, mm -hmm. basically. But And you, that could work as well, but it just didn't seem as useful. So I think we might have a Mars space elevator at some point, maybe. Even then, if it, it just might get so cheap to get into space that there's Bypass just no point to thing. it. Yep. And then the other thing is the vulnerability to terrorism is so profound that, um, you know, it, 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 it's a huge investment that's extremely vulnerable. Just send up rockets. I just, I just, it, it, it just seems so impractical at the end of the day. I just don't see it happening. Yeah, although I did learn a few things <clears throat> after the book uh, went to the publisher um, some type of space elevator might be feasible on the Earth if you're if you're a, if you're attaching it to an orbital yeah. ring. Yeah, orbital mm -hmm. ring is which different. Which is a completely but... di different beast. It's very it's much much lower altitude, and it's much more feasible and does not break any you know or come near any. But any it's a laws massive physics. structure though. But it's a it's a massive structure that would just be mind blowing. Look up. So orbital it still may ring. not be pragmatic. Yeah. Look up orbital ring. It's a fascinating concept and yeah. it's amazing what we may, we may, may be able to accomplish, but it's a mega structure. This is a mega, mega structure, structure that's going to be, that's very far in the future. Uh, to answer what question I see in the chat. Yes, we did watch foundation and that perfectly illustrates right the, the yeah. vulnerability because, yeah. you know, early on in, in the series, there is a terrorist attack on their space Oops, elevator. Uh, it wraps around the world a couple of times as you know, when it, when it comes down, causing massive destruction. Uh, yeah. How do you protect the whole thing? And it's so vulnerable, uh, it just seems... Security would have to yeah. be extraordinary. Um, it's hard to imagine with, with today's society. All right, question number two. Have you ever thought something was crap, set about to debunk it, and found it to be true? Hmm. Hmm. That's a good question. I mean, hmm. in my own profession, when I first heard that people were using Botox for migraines, I'm like... That doesn't make any sense. They're probably treating tension headaches and don't realize it. But no, it actually works for migraines, you know, by a completely different mechanism. So that was surprising. But that's, a, that's you know, within my own profession. That's kind of a narrow thing. Um, more generally speaking, um, yeah, what, can you think of anything? Where you'd like Certainly to, nothing paranormal. Your knee jerk was like, oh, that's got to be crap. And then you realize, okay, it's something different than I imagined. Anything in, mm. in, in therapy, Kara, you know, that fits that I bill? mean... Like so obviously, I'm trying to think. I know our instincts think, are pretty good at this point. But. Yeah, I think I think maybe something. And this is it's not so clean as all of this. Yeah. But I have a good friend who recently had a baby, and she had um, she uh, wanted to do like quote natural childbirth, and there was a lot of like woo mm. that she was talking about, and she was breech, and so she was really upset because she didn't want to have um, a cesarean section. And when she started telling me about all of her concerns around C-sections, I did a little bit of research on the side and a lot of her concerns were really founded. Like when you compare the number of C-sections in the U.S. to in other countries and when you look at how um, – uh, the the risks involved with C-section and the price that C-sections are, are there it's and there's a really good documentary that I dug deep into about kind of like health and safety and, and pregnancy risk with women of color and there does seem to be a pretty yucky trend that women of color are often pushed into having cesareans at mm -hmm. much higher rates than um, than other women and that cesareans carry a bigger price tag and a much bigger risk factor and a lot of it seems to come from convenience and from women 
not being listened to. And so I think it's a more complicated issue than I wanted to believe yeah. it was. Yeah, I was yeah. looking at it based on woo, but actually looking at it from like a social justice lens, I started to realize uh, there's like a lot of truth to this concern. So um, so that's a good example, but it's not so clean as yeah. what I think he's looking yeah, at. Yeah. Like go surreal, like no, there's nothing like that that I can think of. There's Although the, the C-section problem is not nearly as bad in the US as it is in Westeros. I understand they have a really bad problem with it. <laughs> right, yeah. Yes, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Right. By the way, somebody asked. <laughs> somebody asked um, if you if you you know decoupled the uh, space elevator. elevator. The space elevator wouldn't it fly off into space? The answer is no. Uh, it de- but it depends on where you where you break it. If you break it above the the midpoint, it's basically being anchored to the the anchor, the satellite in mm. in geostationary orbit, which is pulling it out. If you cut it from that, it would absolutely fall down to the planet because uh, now it's, it's not getting pulled on from one direction. Yeah, it's just, only what, getting pulled down by gravity. Yeah, yeah, just it would fall by its weight. Absolutely. Um, so they, they depicted it, I think, pretty accurately in Foundation. All right, another question, Ian? Could take maybe a couple more. Uh, what do you read for science news, general news? How do you stay up to date with getting without getting caught in the weeds. So well, getting caught in the weeds is, is an issue. Hmm. For science news, I have like a half a dozen science yeah. news uh, aggregators that I use that all have a slightly different you know, bias or feel to them or how, how they curate it. Um, science news is one of them. Uh, there's also SciTech Today, yeah. uh, which is, you know, it's not great, but it's, it's good f- it's again. It's not. I don't like the write-ups that they do, but it's good to just link you through to the, yeah. the actual yeah. original article. Yeah. Oh, so you're talking about like how do you keep up with like too. stuff that's just happening, like Fizzorg, yeah. like those kinds of Fizzorg is my go-to. Yeah. Fizzorg is good. Fizzorg I've used. Yeah. yeah. As opposed Real to like I use a feed used. reader, so I'm dialed into every like Smithsonian, Cosmos, The Verge, <clears> like uh, pretty much every outlet that yeah. writes about science. I'm digging through all of them in my feed reader, yeah. but that's you know, thousands a week. Yeah, and so it a is. lot of it is about yeah. sometimes I'll simply choose the topic and then go and then, you know, search it, but yeah. go to news for that topic and boom, all sorts Kara, of stuff. Kara, you send that to up. me? My feed reader? Yeah. 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 yeah but I, I'll deep, just but... like skim the headlines, most of which are like, you know, very wonky, narrow, okay, blah, blah, blah. Very few are, you know, worthy of either writing about or discussing on the show. Mm-hmm. I also will go to like BBC uh news their science their health their tech sections because that's like all right this is the stuff people are talking about this is how it's being reported in the press because for me sometimes the story is the press is getting this wrong like that's the story Mm. so i i'm not just interested in the the science news itself also how it's being reported in the mainstream media so i do a, a uh you know, a, a range of things from mainstream reporting to just press release curating to science sites curating to technical journals. I go to Nature. I go to some of those, you know, to directly there. I have a couple of secret yeah. ones I don't want to say to the rogues. Um, because <laughs> I that I mind for I'll science. Find out. Yeah, we'll science crack, or we'll fiction. Crack that too. I got to protect my science or fiction source, otherwise <laughs> the game is pointless. Oh. Uh, break it. Um, <laughs> All right, I won't go. And then what was the other question? Is uh, There was another part of that question. Oh, yeah. For, for, oh, it was like, how do you, how do you keep yourself news? from like, going too deep or something? Right, but no, there was also, I think they were asking about just mainstream news, news, not necessarily science oh, news. Okay. So I just have like four or five mainstream news outlets that I go to that are, have a good range. And also, um, like I read BBC, Waypo, New York Times, but I'll also go to ones that I think are... are um, you know, more reasonable, but, but, you know, more to the right in terms of their focus. But it's also about the authors. It's not so much about the newspaper because there are conservative authors at all of those outlets. So I basically just find people that I trust to at least be giving me a reasonable analysis, whatever outlet they're on. And I try to make sure it's across a range of approaches, even though I know like that I disagree with them a lot. Like I know there are people I disagree with on the right, people I disagree with on the left, but I read them just because I want, Gotta like, know. W- what's the range of opinion on this topic? Yeah. Then there are the people who are like mostly agree with th- that I enjoy reading the most, but Gross. I don't wanna I don't want to only read people I mostly agree with. I wanna read a range of, of, uh, 
of right, analysis. but it's you know it's difficult when you difficult. Good reporting requires that you pay for it. Yeah. Right. And so like you know <laughs> I subscribe to New York Times and Washington Post. Yeah. I, those are the two that Me I too. pay to subscribe to. And then I try to read wherever I live. I try to read the local paper. Yeah, you should because I feel like that's really important. And we don't. I mean, there are, I know there aren't that many local papers left. But if you can read your local paper, you're going to be dialed into what's going on in your community, in your community. Yep. and with your civic you know um, concerns there with. Both and things mm -hmm. that's a good point i Definitely. also i also use twitter like i love twitter as a feed reader really? so of Not the me. things yeah really? so like i, I subscribe to wapo and and new york times which means i get those alerts on my phone yeah. and like i have full access to both of those papers at any given time but on twitter i basically follow a ton of different news outlets and I'm seeing all of their breaking news in their headlines. And that's how I know what's going on in the world right now. If I want to open up Twitter and look at my feed, I can see to the minute like what news is breaking and then I can click through and, and dig yeah. deeper. That's why I like Twitter because it's a giant feed. Mm -hmm. So it works for that reason. Hmm. Jay, answer that one. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm looking at my meatball recipe right now. I saw that mm -hmm. question. Um, did, did, for yeah. those who are listening, they don't re they can't read that. Any way <laughs> that we can came get out of, Jay, that was a non sequitur. <laughs> so can we get Jay to include the meatball recipe if we pre-order? Um, <laughs> yes, pre-order the book, and then we will make the meatball recipe available on the website, but only for people who pre-order. That's right. How would you do that? Yeah, we'll figure it out. I will know through meatball magic whether or not you. <coughs> you can also get my Caesar salad recipe if you want. Yeah, I love that. Oh my god, um, I eat that. Right we keep now. talking about putting together a skeptical cookbook. Mm -hmm. You know, we should. Um, I, I want us to do a skeptical cooking show. Mm. <laughs> I, I'd be happy with the cookbook. <laughs> but just again, it's like if what we makes each skeptical. Well, I think we each yes. come up with our four or five or, or, or whatever favorite recipes, especially if we've actually cooked them. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and so it just because so we have a sort of an eclectic, great cookbook, and then we include sort of like what this recipe personally means to us. But then we, we just include either a skeptical vignette or some angle that somehow ties into that recipe that has a skeptical. Like if I had a recipe that included, um, uh, what's that yellow spice? I'm forgetting the name. Curry. Oh, no, it's uh, saffron. Saffron. No, no, the other one. Uh, uh Turmeric. turmeric, thank you. Yeah. Like I had, I, then I could talk about all the pseudoscience around turmeric. It's right. like it's a great spice for food. It's not medicine. You know? So are you guys? Uh. So I don't. I, I like hate cooking. There's a few things I cook from scratch, but most everything I make is semi homemade. <laughs> yeah. So could I have some semi homemade okay. recipes in there for the the lazier cooks among us? Well, there is there, are, <laughs> there is a place for for easy recipes or frugal recipes or ones that are very very effective like. Um, very efficient. Like this is like for the busy person, or if they're the person cooking for themselves, like that we could that, that right, could be like, a theme. I'm about to make pot pies for dinner, but the way I make pot pies is I I, I do a lot of stuff from the can. I do some stuff from scratch, and then yeah. I do. It's like you know a mix. You of create your own pie yeah. dough, right? As long yeah. as you know, you know, I've made up like multiple recipes of my own. Like they're my own recipe. I made. I just yeah. completely made up. So that I would include all of those, but. You know, if there's anything like that that you make, even if it's not like a from scratch recipe, that's just your right. own, then that's great to include. But well, we just added cacio oh, pepe to soup. our repertoire. <laughs> to our repertoire, yeah. And it came out pretty it damn was good, good, man. It was good. Yeah, we could talk about all of our experience hunting down the best cacio pepe in Italy. Yeah, yeah. you got some bread stuff you can talk about, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, I, I haven't baked bread since. Um, since your diet. I, I August first, my diet started, and I haven't made bread since then. Mm. And I'm dying for a homemade loaf of bread. Yeah. I'm dying yeah, yeah. for it. Oh my god! One I'm more question, then we're going to do it. science or fiction. We can okay. do more questions at the end, but let's to keep it to keep on oh. our. All right, our intermittent fasting, today. science or fiction? Intermittent. Fasting. It's I don't know. Okay, I'll, I'm gonna have to say because I've read conflicting things about it, and I'm a little skeptical of. Um, so a lot of the claims that are made about it, and I don't buy the anecdote because there's anecdotal evidence to support every diet ever, you know, no matter how crazy or dumb it is, so that doesn't convince me. But there has been some research showing that it, it may be effective. But then the question is, is it just a way to get people to eat less because you're spending time not right. eating? And then I, I sure. do get I do get concerned about the downsides of intermittent fasting. So if you have migraines, don't do an intermittent fasting right. diet, for oh, example. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah, that, that triggers your migraines. You don't want to do that. Don't you 
so much when it comes to nutrition science and so much of the reason, like there's the basic things like you, you need these core nutrients in your diet, right? We need these micronutrients and we need these macronutrients. You have mm -hmm. to have fats and you have to have proteins and you have to have sugars and you have to have these different vitamins and you shouldn't eat too many calories. Right. But yeah. beyond that, so much is like in it, like we are pe like yeah. my metabolism is not the same as your yeah. metabolism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or even the just behave. But the bottom line is, like, if you're if you're talking about weight control, it's ultimately all behavioral. And so, whatever you can do to trick yourself into starving yourself into losing weight, if that works for you, it works for you. But, and also, like, yeah, what is where's your comfort level? Like, for some people, it's like you need yeah. to eat lots of small meals a day, and that's great <laughs> if you're diabetic and whatever. But like, yeah. I eat once a time. day, and that works for me. I can't imagine eating yeah. three whole meals a day. That yeah. sounds like so much energy and effort. I would, <laughs> I would never be able. Yeah, to but say. you could you could <laughs> snack you know, like the other two meals a day, you could have like a, a protein bar or something that's from zero. Effort. I could. And I do. Yeah. And yeah. I, and I do certain things like that, but I do think it's like the, the most effective uh, diet and exercise routines are the ones that are tailored to you and your, yeah. what are you going to stick with? Well, yeah. Right. The, yeah. The, it's only right. going to work if you do it. The right. answer is that you have to somehow find a way where you can tolerate having a calorie deficient day, right? You have to have less mm -hmm. calories than you're burning, right? And I talk about this in my uh, in my water segment, which we could do yeah. at some point. But let me—I'll tell it to you real quick. Bottom line is, you you should be like um, think of it think <coughs> of it this way: you got to calculate your level of activity and essentially your body weight, right? So I'm a 200 pound guy. I'm six feet tall. I'm eating between 2,000 and 2,500 calories a day and on a, on a regular day. That's where I maintain wow. my my body weight. I'm so jealous. I have yeah. to eat. Now I'm probably eating about, you know, 1,500 calories yeah. a day or, or less than that. My maintenance day is 1,600. So if I want to lose weight, like, honestly, I need to be in a 1,400 yeah. or lower. Yeah. But, you, but you are going to feel hungry and you have to figure out ways to deal with that. Like I, It I, sucks I, being hungry, man. You, mm -hmm. So Kara's right. It is a personalized thing. You have to study there yourself. There are some general things that we could say. Some things are not healthy. Some things statistically seem to work better than other things. And there are yeah, like a lot of Yeah, like crash dieting, cyclical yeah. dieting, these kinds Restriction of things Restriction dieting generally you know, is yeah. not good. So you want to do, there are principles you could follow. It has to be sustainable. It, you know, mm -hmm. it, you should emphasize getting physical activity, you know, exercise is very helpful. You want to make sure you're eating healthy and getting your nutrition while you're doing it. You don't want to have super narrow or restricted diets. Yeah, you want and, varied foods. And, and fad magical diets basically don't work. And dieting doesn't really work long term. Mm. You really need to change your behavior in a way yeah. that is sustainable. Yeah, your diet, by definition, the word diet shouldn't be a thing you sometimes do. Dude, your right. diet is what you eat. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you should have a diet that is sustainable. Right. But you're right. I think all the all the times when people say this <coughs> diet worked for me, that diet worked for me, it's like chiropractic, right? It's like, what's the ingredient underneath it all that's not specific to that diet? Mm -hmm. It's because you were probably more conscientious. Yeah. Well, and here's another you great rule of thumb. Try not to lose more than two pounds a week. For a guy, for a I, guy, for a yeah. guy. I, I have uh, I have tailored my diet that I'm on right now to where I'm losing in, on average about two pounds yeah, a week. One and a half to two pounds a week is yeah. a good target. Yeah, yeah. yeah. more than it, that, and you're. That's and really hard. If for a woman, I mean, good luck. Like, yeah, you that's have to harder just not for a eat. Woman. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's like you'd have to just not eat to even hit two. Like when they say try not to lose more than two, it's sort of like that's very dangerous if you're yeah. losing two pounds I mean, plus a week. Right, losing weight, you're starving. Is, losing weight's ambiguous. What does it mean? You want to lose right. fat. You don't want to lose w water weight, and you more importantly. And water, you don't want to lose muscle. That's muscle. hard earned. That's your most important, uh, you know, body tissue. You and that if you lose muscle, good luck getting all that back. So it, you want to focus on the yeah. You can lose one to two pounds a, a week if you can, or you can maintain the exact same weight and your body can start looking rocking. It's mm -hmm. just a change in the composition. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Like you, I, you see that a lot. And I've tried and I've tried to do that where it's a, it's actually it's a, it's a body composition diet where you're where you're. And that's, it's tricky because how do you, you know, you've got to stop eating to lose weight. You know, you've got to minimize your calorie intake to uh, lose fat, but you also have to eat to gain muscle. So how do you, so how do you do that? Well, and you can, but I think that's also an important uh, like distinction that you just made. You've got to stop eating to lose weight. You've got to reduce your calories. No, you yes. have to balance fewer calories with more exercise because every time 
you exercise, you're basically gaining back the calories or you're, you're basically allotting more calories to eat. Yeah. Yes. And so when people count calories, usually what you do is you use some sort of tracker that a counts your calories, but also counts all of your activity and it calibrates your, yes. um, but that's, your formula. This but, is what but, I want an AI no, for. I want no. an AI to, to have this conversation so nice. for me. But the yeah. thing is, Kara, the thing <laughs> is, if you want to lose fat, I, I would say put minimal focus on losing fat by exercising. If, if the majority of your fat that you're going to lose is going to be from not eating. That's how you're going to lose right. your fat. It could, because as we all know, you eat one candy bar and holy crap, I got to run a marathon to burn that off. It's, you, so oh, yeah, you it's, can't, it's what you yeah. intake. That's how you lose unless the you're fat. Doing, yeah, unless, unless you're, you're an athlete. Michael Phelps right. or something. So don't, but you, but you do want to exercise because but you want to make sure you, it does not happen. Like as Kara says, if you exercise more, you eat more to make up for it. If you eat less, you get less activity to make up for it too. You've got to make sure you're maintaining mm. your caloric output while reducing your caloric input. All right, let's and move on. And we also on. know that, oh, sorry, okay. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you don't Kara, want Steve to bite Kara your head knows. off, Kara. Kara knows. Seriously. Yeah. Watch Kara's yourself, like, okay. Kara. Yeah, right, you're going to get an F bomb it. dropped on your head. All right, everyone, let's move on with science or fiction. Each week, I come up with three science news items or facts, two real and one fake, and then I challenge my panel of skeptics to tell me which one is the fake. We have a theme this week. It's Ooh. another Skeptic's Guide to the Future book-inspired theme. <clears throat> These are emerging technologies that maybe you haven't heard about, right? Mm -hmm. It was hard for me to find stuff we didn't talk about in the book, but these are all things that we didn't mention in the book or that we've talked, we haven't talked about on the show because mm. this is what we do is talking about emergent technology. These are things that maybe we're, we're flying below the radar, but these are actual things, or at least two of them are. All right, here they are. Item number one, a new artificial leaf technology made from a carbon-based polymer is able to use light to capture CO2 from the air at seven times the capacity per volume as natural leaves. All right, number two, Femtosecond projection two-photon lithography is a 3D printing technique that allows for printing 1,000 times faster than current methods without sacrificing resolution. And item number three, smart fertilizers control the rate of release of fertilizer once spread to better match its uptake and to reduce excess fertilizer from getting into the environment. We're going to go in the reverse order that I went last time. So Kara... You're going to go first. Okay. Sorry. I was like semi-distracted looking at hurricane news. Um, artificial leaf technology from carbon-based polymers is able to use light to capture CO2 from air at seven times. Okay. So basically this is artificial photosynthesis and it's, you're saying it's seven times more efficient than, than per volume. kind of natural photosynthesis. Yeah. Per volume. Per volume. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if we could technologically improve on photosynthesis. The principle is not that complex and we've understood it for a long time. So why couldn't we make a more efficient chloroplast or a more efficient pigment, right? A more efficient chlorophyll. And if we made a more efficient chlorophyll and a more efficient chloroplast, maybe it would be, you know, significantly more efficient. Um, femtosecond projection to photon lithography. Already lost me. I have no idea what's going on here. Um, uh, <laughs> 3D printing technique. Okay, there we go. I'll just skip the first one. What's the know. name of a 3D printing technique <laughs> that allows for printing a thousand times faster than current methods without sacrificing resolution? Is it still printing plastic? Or are we not allowed to know that? Like what the... Yeah, so, it, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a standard 3D printing in, in, technique in terms of... It's using lithography in terms of the material. Yeah, so it'd be like the same material... It's that's, still extruding the same stuff. It's I just, didn't say it's extruding. Yeah, yeah, you didn't say it was extruding. <laughs> but, okay, but, all right. uh, but that's you have to know what how. I'm sorry, how lithography works. Lithography is not uh -huh. an extrusion extrusion technique. Oh, okay. It works so like I know what it, a lithograph is, but I don't know how lithography works. That word, huh? right? Computer circuits can be um, huh. printed using lithography. <laughs> Okay, so this one is like, I, I may just be kind of screwed because I'm limited in my base knowledge on that, on the femtosecond projection to photon lithography. <laughs> nice, Karen. But, but the, here's um, the, to make it easier for you, it's a type of 3D printing that does the same mm -hmm. type of 3D printing, just the only difference is that it's a thousand times faster. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? So the two photon part is the same. Yeah. It's just a thousand the, times faster. It's not like now it's using a new method. It's using light, you, so it's much faster. The, the two photon lithography is the standard method. Yep. This is now femtosecond okay. projection to two right. photon lithography. That's the faster. new part. 
And that makes it a thousand times faster. Got it. And then last, smart fertilizers, which control the rate of release of fertilizer once spread to better match its uptake and to reduce excess fertilizer from getting uh, into the environment. And when you say smart fertilizers, that could be a marketing term that doesn't necessarily mean that they are actually uh, technologically they, controlled. They could have just been designed to like be time release the way that a pill is. It's, I mean, yes, it's technology, but it's time release because it's got little holes in the, no, in no, the coating it, or whatever. Smart is not just a marketing term. It, okay. And it's not just time release. That's why I said it the way I did. It, it okay, actually smart, adjusts right. the rate of release to match the take oh. up. So it's so not there. It must be some. It's not just a time release. It's actually okay. It, it is reading information. I'll say it this way: it's mm -hmm. basing its rate of release on information in the environment, and that's what makes it smart. Right. Right. So does the fertilizer itself contain its own sensor, basically? And I could see that fertilizer is a product, right? It's like a renewable, or it's like a it's it's a product you use up, is what I'm trying to say. It's not necessarily a technology, but it it could still have some sort of chemical sensor in it. I don't see why that is um, hard to believe. So I think the one that's harder to believe is this: like, really, we're iterating to a thousand times faster overnight by using femtosecond projection. That's the one that bothers me. So I'm going to say that's the fiction. Okay, Jay. Um, the artificial leaf, um, I agree with Kara. I definitely think that, that engineers could have uh, come up with a, a way to optimize photosynthesis. So I think that one is science. Um, there's nothing about the smart fertilizer one that's bothering me. And I really, you know, a thousand times faster printing. Ian and I have, uh, have been... We've become acquainted with 3D printing, um, and anything that could could improve the speed by a thousand to me seems so way over the top, too much fat, too fast. You know, it's too much of an increase in, in, for a one step. So I think that one's the fiction. But that's what he's expecting. All right, you Bob, to think. it's your turn now. Don't don't kibitz. All right, go ahead, Bob. <laughs> 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 I wasn't kibitzing. It was just a a joke. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. At first, the smart fertilizer seemed, I mean, it seems the, it's the most mundane, and the other ones are kind of like, whoa. Um, so that's one reason to pick smart fertilizer, but it seems kind of easy. Like, yeah, we got, we got time-release medicine. Why, we can't, <coughs> why can't we have time-release smart fertili fertilizers? And based on the environment, I mean, that sounds totally doable. The other ones, I mean, Femtosecond he project. literally just said it's not that, though. What? Well, I mean, he didn't, but he <laughs> yeah. said, you know, it's not that simple, um, but okay. The leaf technology, I mean, what's the downside here? There's could be, it's it uses light and it's getting, capturing CO2 seven times the capacity than natural. I mean, it's probably something that's making that uh, potentially not really viable at all until they solve that problem, that one little sticking point. But this thousand times faster is ridiculous. Um, that, that's what Kara and Jay picked. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I know Steve is just waiting for us to pick that one because it's just like too awesome. But I'm, and I'm not <laughs> sure how that projection fits into the two photon lithography thing. But I'll say that one's fiction too. Ah! Okay, and Devin. Uh, I'm not going to be alone <laughs> here. I'm going to I'm going to sink or swim with everybody else. I'll say the, the crowd. Uh, yeah. Sink All right, 3D printing. Ian, do we do we have a vote from the chat? Okay, yeah, about half voted okay. for the same one, the yeah. lithography, evenly split pretty much, but with the other two. All right, so let's, we'll just take these in order, I guess. Um, what does that mean? A new artificial leaf technology made from a carbon-based polymer is able to use light to capture CO2 from air at seven times the capacity per volume as natural leaves. All of the rogues think this one is science about... 79% uh, of the chat thinks this one is science. And this one is The Fiction. Oh, you bastard. Whoa! Whoa! It couldn't be, could it? We have not perfected artificial leaf technology. That is one of the Damn holy it. grails of technology. Yeah. We are, a I lot of people swear. I read it. about this. Yeah, you always, uh, you, you've read a hundred articles about an artificial, artificial leaf. leaf. Yes. Yeah, we are not there. They are not, they're like making every little breakthrough. <laughs> 
every time they solve one little problem that makes it one step closer to it being possible, you read about it. Yeah. But Crumbs. but we haven't. We're not even up to a leaf yet, let alone let alone seven times. All right, screw yeah. the leaf. It's so now, funny because it doesn't faster. seem. <laughs> Bob was ready. It to... doesn't seem that technologically difficult. You're right. <laughs> you're right. But we're not there. It may be 10, 20 right, years right. before we get to that level. Think that'd about be, it. That'd be fantastic. But that'd be great. You just put those everywhere. That'd be a game changer. It would be. Gosh. All right. Number two, femtosecond mm. projection to, lithon, to photon lithography is a 3D printing technique that allows for printing a thousand times faster than current methods without sacrificing resolution. So that's, so that's it's fiction awesome too, right? science. Fiction that's too. science. Talk to me. That's Talk freaking me. awesome. It's freaking awesome. That's freaking awesome. So, <laughs> all right, here's the, here's the quick description of it. Okay. They said, they said, imagine, you know, printing with one printer head versus a million printer heads. That's the difference. What's the rub? Oh. There isn't one. It's just that they designed a system where instead of, you know, the two photon lithography is like where the beams cross yeah. is where it solidifies. Yeah. yeah. So they just have a million beams crossing. Holy and you get crumbs. You watch the thing at work. It's like, it builds it up like incredibly Holy fast. Holy Like it's something out of Westworld. It looks like any 3D Holy printing. Without sacrificing resolution, Jay. Holy <laughs> crap. It's, it does seem amazing. Wasn't that, that, that in the news? Enhanced <laughs> resolution. Yeah. Are these expensive? I'm sure they're a trillion I'm dollars. Sure they're, they're <laughs> yeah, that's right. yeah, you trillion can't. Dollars. You can't afford you one. You need a million yeah. of these I don't, things. These may yeah. not be commercially available yet, but this this proof of concept <laughs> technology exists. I mean, wow. I mean, the idea that it's like you could see it come into creation yeah. that fast. Yeah, that, that's like that, science fiction. Oh, yeah. that that is uh, that's a yeah. goddamn that's replicator. A fifth element, you know, when yeah. they put her yeah. back together. It's got to make <laughs> a cool <laughs> noise. I bet you it makes a cool noise. Maybe like a like a transporter beam. Something. It's got to do something. I got I got to look into that. So that so so hopefully <laughs> this pans out as a wow. viable commercial entity, but. Um, yeah, it's just like, hey, why don't we just have a whole bunch of beams instead of just one, you know, slowly moving around? Seems so thing. obvious. I was led astray by my rogues. Yeah. Damn. Yeah, but I mean, you know, some pieces of the... I guess they would do a layer at a time and build it up. <laughs> they do, although also they said that it's actually better in mm. some ways because they said that it's able to do vertical pieces. Like you could have a vertical... Ah. Like how, you know what I mean? Like That's had, freaking like awesome. Like a handle on a thing. How would you have that yeah, build yeah, yeah. that up? Because it would not. It's not. Supported. It's not supported by. Anything. You have to ha now. What you do is that you have supports. You have an internal lattice. You have inter. Yeah. You are also building up the supports that you then have to cut away. Yeah. Later right, right. on. That's typical. But anyway, this seems nice. like this seems like a promising breakthrough. Um, all this means that smart fertilizers control Boring. the rate of release of fertilizer. <laughs> Once spread to better match its uptake and to reduce excess fertilizer from getting into the environment, that is also science. Yes, this seemed like the obvious, boring, kind of mundane one, but sometimes that's how I get you. Yes, I and know I, that. And, and so I got to throw real ones in there to keep to mix it up. Um, this is actually a huge problem, and this is a potentially simple solution to, that could significantly mitigate a huge problem. Mm. So right now, like, especially with nitrogen fertilizer, right? Yeah, we yeah. spread yeah. nitrogen fertilizer on on farms, and you know the plants absorb whatever they need, and the rest gets washed Wash away, away, gets into rivers. The rivers empty into the Gulf of Mexico. They fish eat it, then they mutate, they, then they turn to monsters that come and destroy our cities. It feeds the local. <laughs> <coughs> It feeds the local flora, which then uses up all the oxygen and causes dead zones in the ocean, right? And so that's a bad thing. Bad. Um, so anyway, there's a lot of negative downsides to wasting a lot of the fertilizer. First of all, it's a waste, and it's also we don't want it in the environment. So what the idea is, it's not time release. The release is dependent upon the moisture in the soil and the temperature of the soil, which is a good marker for the need of the plants because they'll be growing in that soil. And so, um, it, it's so that's what makes it smart. Is that yeah. it, it, the release is variable. So if if it's on like a patch that's not growing because it's dry or whatever, or during a dry period where it's not going to be needing it, it won't release it. It'll only release it when it's needed. That's fantastic. Yeah. So it's you know it, it, this could result in a you know significant decrease in the waste cool. of the fertilizer and the amount of it that gets into the environment. So. We'll see how Sorry, it pans good. out. Again, it has to be I was say. has to be cost effective, <laughs> etc. So I believe I swept you guys. You did. Yeah, I did. Yeah, Good job, yeah, Steve. Yeah, Look at yeah. my skills. We'll see. This is going to be broadcast till December. So but that's true. You haven't, you haven't swept us yet. <laughs> you can, that, cel you that, can celebrate at Christmas. That Steve. just means I get to rub oh, it in all over again. Yeah. Damn. 
Uh, but twenty one percent of the of the chat audience got it correct. So congratulations! Yeah, good job, When's guys. When's coming out? In December. 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 Oh, this Halloween stuff's gonna look weird. Yeah. Oh well. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, but, no, but, not no, just the audio podcast. Right. But this is video. This is video. Yeah. That's true. All right, look Evan. Maskell. Evan, I re- this quote it's is perfect. Two skulls in one. It is perfect. Thank you for the show. You don't need to predict the future. Just choose a future, a good future, a useful future, and make the kind of prediction that will alter human emotions and reactions in such a way that the future you predicted will be brought about. Better to make a good future than predict a bad one. Nice. Isaac, Isaac, Isaac rocks. rocks. Yeah. It's perfect. So we talk about this extensively in the book, and this comes up so far in every one of the interviews that we do about this because basically the – they want to know, like, how do you predict the future? And we make the points, like, you can't really predict the future. You could just say what's possible. Yes. The reason is, it's because the future is not inevitable. You you could only really predict Except things the that heat are death in of the universe. Yeah, but I mean, like, a lot of aspects. There are broad brushstroke things that are inevitable. Like, we know computers are going to get more powerful in the future, right? We know eventually we'll probably crack the fusion thing. Like, there are certain things that are inevitable, but there are so many things that are not inevitable. In fact. Our present technology is not inevitable. Like we, we could be living in a very different world today. Um, what oh, make yeah. what crafts the future is the choices that we collectively and individually yes, we make. Have to... So we are going to craft our future, and we can't predict what future choices everyone is going to make. Eight yeah. billion people are going to make. So all we could say is, if we make these choices, this kind of future will unfold. If we make these different choices. This kind of future, so we're talking about the potential of technology yep. depending upon the choices that we make. And so, and, and this comes up a lot on the show, too. I, I very much agree with Isaac Asimov. I, I say I'm not going to predict that we're going to fail to, to, to minimize global warming. That feels too much like a self-fulfilling prophecy. I'm going to try to make decisions which craft a better future whether it ha- succeeds or not, I'll go down fighting. But that's the only thing that actually has a positive impact. That's why future. we've been doing this show for 17 years. Yeah. Right. Yeah. May make, make your future. Yeah. <laughs> make your future. All right, so before yeah. we close the show. Yeah. Wow. Six hours. What Woo! was that What was that stat, Ian? <coughs> 246 pre-orders have happened during nice. awesome. this show. Very 246. Nice. That's great. So before Thank you, b- before we close out the show, I just want to let you guys know one last time, our our book is on pre-sale right now. If you want to support the show, please purchase our book. It'll help us in oh so many ways. No, but we really we really mean it. I mean, first off, we know you'll enjoy it. It's a, it'll make a great present and it'll uh, pre-ordering will help us promote the or, book. Or or in the first week. So, because yeah. the the idea is that all pre orders are counted in the first week of sales in terms of getting on bestseller list. So we want to hit it all really hard. Um, you know, obviously we're going up against you know million dollar books, right? We're never yeah. gonna. Yeah, and it's no. just a matter of how many of them come out at the same time as our book does. Yeah. Like there are people, you know, who obviously like if, if Obama publishes a book this month, we obviously can't compete with things like that, and they're out there. So we want to break in as much as we can to make you know good science. Uh, science uh, promoting book, skeptical promoting book out there. The best way to do that is to just pre-order as many as possible mm-hmm. so that we could punch really hard in that first week. So we, we greatly appreciate it. You can order signed copies. We've signed a whole bunch of plates. We're going to RJ Julia tomorrow. That's right. Ooh. We're going to sign a bunch of books, 200, 300. Yeah. I forget 300. Yeah. 300. 300. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, there's a lot of places where you can order pre-signed yeah. uh, books. Um of course, <laughs> <coughs> COVID. Oh, that's I'm trying to hold it off, True. man. I know, I hear it. I tested negative yesterday. I'm not. I'm not contagious. It's just a post-infectious uh, cough. We do not get to choose when the book is published. That that the, our publisher finds you know finds a time in the calendar when it makes sense. Yeah, I mean, they want us. They want this all to happen as well. So they timed the release to try to miss some of the big stuff coming out. But mm-hmm. we'll see. You know, we just missed it last time with the first book we didn't quite make. We made the USA uh, bestseller book uh, list. We did not make the New York Times bestseller list. We came really close, but we didn't quite make it. We're hoping to just get over the line. Awesome. So if you, this if you pre-order is, the book, yeah. you can you can go to the, uh, the the link, Ian, if you can give them the link. Um, and you can get a free sticker by showing proof of purchase so that anybody can do it. And of course, if you have a book and you go anywhere where we are, you come to any of our live events, you come to any of the the, uh, the book signings that we're doing, we will 
chat and sign the book and, and personalize it and all that good stuff. And I will say I, I had I ordered three different stamps. Yeah. That we cool. will be bringing nice, with us. Yeah. Nice, Jay. Pers- if you, if, uh, optional stamp if you like it. And one of them has a robot in it. <gasps> Ooh. Awesome. Yes. Awesome, awesome. We had so much fun writing this book and researching it and, and talking about it. I think that comes through oh my God, yeah. in the book. This is really, yeah. The, the challenge really, we've been talking about this, the real challenge is going to be coming up with a third book idea that's going to be as good as this one because this really spoiled us. It was so much yeah, fun to do. Um, so we cool. hope that you guys will enjoy it as much as we did. Um, okay, well, thank you all for joining me this week. You got it, we Steve. Did it six hours. Thanks. Thank everyone in the chat for joining us as well. We we uh, always like uh, doing the show in front of a live audience and the the back and forth. We read the comments the whole time. Like uh, you might see, it's when we're looking down. We are reading your comments. That's what we're doing. I mean, six hours. That wow, was just like that, that. Nothing. Was fast as hell. Thanks to Ian, who basically makes everything happen. Thank you, Ian. Here, Ian. The magic that makes it all make, makes it all work. Wonderful job. Special as sauce. Always. Not coming out. Yep. Here. Special sauce. And until next week. This is your Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. Bye, Kara. Bye, everybody. Bye, <laughs> you. Bye, Kara. <laughs> Ciao, Bella. <coughs> Take care, thing. everyone. There's the thing, if you can case you want to just There you go. Stand, everybody. Order the book. Do it now. Do it right now. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thanks for your support, guys. Hey, Matt, wait, you'll Matt is in the uh, chat. Matt, what's up, man? Oh, Matt's, Matt's in the in, chat. Matt's, Matt's in the chat. chat. Matt, Matt chat. asked a question, which I thought was funny. Uh, not that one. It, Hold on, we gotta do. I gotta answer Matt's question. This now. one. What lengths have you Which gone Matt? to stop playing a game or binge watching a show that was on the verge of ruining your time management and destroying your life? I mean, I deleted a game from my computer because I'm like, I can't stop playing. If it's here, I'm gonna sit down. I'm gonna play it. Yeah. Uh-huh. It was Dune. When Dune, like the first Dune I played, it was like I love first person shooters. That was the best first person shooter I played up to that point. This is like in the 90s when like yeah. that wow. was a huge advance oh, in terms of you know my personal gaming. And it was a crack. Yeah. It was addictive. And I just had to delete it off my computer. The Witcher, what happened with me was, it was The Witcher, The Witcher 3. Um, and what happened was I realized that if I delete it, I could easily just reinstall it on Steam. So I just decided I have to finish it. So I just yeah. said, I'll finish it, and then I'll put it behind me. Yeah, that's like, I'll eat this whole cheesecake that yeah. won't be there. Yeah, that's right. That's when it worked. When it worked. No, cause, that'll, cause that'll I just need to get through it. it. And that was it. And then yeah. I got past it. <laughs> But I do, I, that's why I, I try to avoid video games, mm-hmm. especially I'm during times especially <laughs> during times when I'm super busy because they are crack. Uh, so what, the, what I do from a practical point of view now is, is that um, I reward myself for completing the things I have to do by saying, oh, now I can play the game exactly. for a little bit. But I don't play before I've done the stuff I need to do. Yeah, like, I, I do the reverse what of that. What fun is that? Like, I, I went to the bathroom successfully. I'm going to play video games. Yeah, I go. reward myself for a, a, a bowel movement well executed with three hours of gaming. There you go. Nice. I only ate two ice cream sandwiches instead of four. I'm going to reward myself. This is easy. This is I woke easy. up yeah, today. I'm going to play a game. That works. Yep. That's hey, called uh, motivated reasoning. Ooh, beep, we boop, also beep. wanted to thank... Uh, Kelly for managing the chat. Thank you, yeah, Kelly, for doing that. Kelly. Appreciate Thank you it. so much, Kelly. She's added to the growing SG. Yeah, family. she's she's in. She's Thank in so all much. the way. <laughs> hey guys, we love we love this audience. I see a ton of names we recognize from Friday's uh, <coughs> live streams. We really appreciate you coming and checking us out today. We had a lot of fun. As usual, we want to do this more often. Yeah, we will. Yeah. We'll, we'll do it yeah. again. I see a lot of names I recognize from the last show we did three hours ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all well, right. The that's good news is we get a week off. Yeah. And we have a show in the can for when we're traveling. That's right. Yep. Yep. Good. That's so good night, everybody. Good night. The end. Bye, Kara. All right. Undo Bye. your. Bye, Kara. Your audio, please. Bye, Kara. Be careful. Bye, Kara. Good work, Ron. Take care. Hurricane. Wow. I, I'm, you know, I knew it was going to be. Wait a second. Let's
Skeptic's Guide to the Universe is produced by SGU Productions, dedicated to promoting science and critical thinking. For more information, visit us at theskepticsguide.org. Send your questions to info at theskepticsguide.org. And if you would like to support the show and all the work that we do, go to patreon.com slash skepticsguide and consider becoming a patron and becoming part of the SGU community. Our listeners and supporters are what make SGU possible. Thank you.